moving it a few feet at a time, but most of Bertha's weight was at one end, making it difficult for the three of them to get proper leverage to lift and move it. After they had finished disconnecting the security devices from Bertha, David and Rachel worked with Marcus for a few more hours to successfully shift Bertha off of its pedestal and into the hall outside the room that still housed the mysterious woman. Since Rachel and David had ceased their questioning, she kept still on the floor, seemingly content to lie there, staring at the ceiling with her eyeless gaze. Weary from their exertion, the trio had agreed that they each needed to get some sleep. With one person keeping watch, the other two slept for a few hours. Being underground for so long had disrupted their sleep cycle, but that fact paled in comparison to the exhaustion they all felt physically, mentally, and emotionally. In addition to keeping watch for any signs of nanobot swarms or creatures, the person on watch also tended to the strange woman, making sure that she was kept covered and comfortable. A few times each hour, Marcus, Rachel, or David would offer food or water to her, only to be turned away by the same phrase she had used almost exclusively since Marcus found her. At one point, Rachel had tried to pour a bit of water into her mouth, only to have the woman sit up, violently spit it out, and then lie back down as though nothing had happened. Despite the lack of food and water in the woman's body, she was still functioning as she had when she was found, a fact that Rachel and David chalked up to the effects of the nanobots still inside her system. After Marcus's revelation about how the nanobots on the woman's arm had reacted negatively to his touch, Rachel took the risk of touching the woman's arm as well, shocked to see the reaction firsthand. Though Marcus briefly took Rachel's shocked reaction as one of negativity, he was quickly ushered away by David, who explained that it was quite a good sign, but that they couldn't risk saying anything about it while within earshot of the woman. If the nanobots inside her body were ever able to transmit data back to Mr. Doe, it would be a disaster if he learned that the DNA whitelisting code was still contained within the nanobots' operating system. Instead of operating through third parties that he had infected, he might grow bolder and try to either kill them again or worse. Though no more attacks from or sightings of the creatures had taken place, aside from the strange woman, there was still the problem of how to get Bertha from the heart of the laboratory complex up to street level, where it could be loaded into the back of the APC for transport. Rachel and Marcus had discussed this very fact with David on more than one occasion, but his response was the same each time. Get Bertha into the hall, and the hard part will be over. With Bertha sitting in the hallway and a few hours of sleep under the trio's belts, they stood around the device, holding a whispered conversation on how to get it out to the surface. Okay, David, it's out here. Now, how are we supposed to get it out of here? All the stairways up are blocked, and there's no way we could carry it up a flight of stairs even if they were clear. David reached into his pocket and retrieved his handheld computer that he had saved from the EMP discharge. He powered on the screen and opened a blue and white building schematic that showed an overhead view of the laboratory facility. Zooming in on an edge of the complex, Rachel and Marcus could see a pair of parallel lines extending out from the facility and banking to the left, stopping at a road. Okay, see this? It's an old service tunnel that starts on the next level down and runs to the street just outside. Taking the handheld from David, Rachel zoomed out and tapped on a small icon. David, this tunnel was decommissioned years ago. It says so right here. David shook his head as he took back the computer, broadening the zoom level and navigating to the area in the building where they were standing. I know it says that, but I have it on good source that the tunnel's not decommissioned. It was turned into some kind of evacuation route for a few of the top brass that like to come through here. If they were ever here and an attack occurred, it would be a fast way out. In fact, this tunnel was linked to a few others running under the city. So, theoretically, if we had a way to get past the security, we could get out of here completely underground, assuming we had a need to. For now, though, we just need to get down one floor and then find the door to the tunnel and get it open so we can get out of here. Rachel took back the handheld, staring in silence at Bertha's chamber that was centered on the screen. She was too exhausted with being underground and wanted nothing more than to make a run for the surface, but without a way to get Bertha through the collapsed areas, there was no point. Uh, how do you know the exit of this tunnel hasn't collapsed too? 
Marcus looked at the screen as he spoke, sensing this was Rachel's next inevitable question. David spoke patiently, explaining his reasoning with the attitude of someone who had spent a long time trying to devise the perfect method for getting out of the building, even while he was still trapped in his office. There's no way to be sure, of course. There are no cameras in the tunnel, and no official information on the type of reinforcement it had. However, if it was truly turned into an emergency escape route, as I believe, I have to think that it would have been sufficiently reinforced to stand up to a localized bombardment. There's still one problem. Rachel looked up from the screen, testing David's plan with one final query. How do you propose moving this thing down a flight of stairs and through an underground tunnel? We can't exactly do it by hand. David grinned sheepishly and motioned for Rachel and Marcus to follow him. A short walk down the corridor led to a large set of double doors that David swung open, revealing a supply closet. Inside the closet sat a massive dolly with large oversized rubber wheels and handles for both pushing and pulling whatever load was sitting on its large frame. Rachel slapped David's arm as she saw the contraption, grinning as she playfully tore into him for making them move Bertha out into the hall by hand. <laughs> you asshole! Why the hell didn't you tell us about this earlier? David shrugged and pointed at the wheels. Uh, no sense in risking Doe finding out we have a way to transport Bertha any sooner than necessary, especially since it wouldn't have fit into the room anyway. Rachel clapped her arms around David in a hug, elated by his revelation. Marcus grinned along with them, feeling no small sense of relief about the fact that they were one step closer to getting Bertha out of the complex. A nagging feeling in the back of his head warned him to use caution, though, since the strange woman was still around. She didn't seem to pose any threat to the group, but Marcus knew full well that situations in this new world were completely fluid, and anything that could happen likely would. Chapter 15 10.57 a.m., April 13th, 2038 Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims Despite Leonard's intense driving, he and Nancy were still several miles out from Bismarck when the storm clouds enveloped the sky above them, plunging the area into darkness. Switching the headlights on to illuminate their path, Leonard slowed the APC down, not wanting to collide with any of the cars that were growing more numerous as they got closer to the city. Being unable to see much of the city with the clouds overhead, Leonard and Nancy both decided that they needed to try for it anyway hoping that there would be enough of it intact to salvage more supplies. Driving so slowly in the darkness, Leonard hoped that their pursuer had been thrown off their trail by the abrupt course correction, but only time would tell if this was true or not. Driving past freeway off-ramps, Leonard nearly missed the office buildings to either side of the road, slamming on the brakes to bring the APC to a halt just before they flew past the last exit into the city. He maneuvered the APC in a slow circle on the road, using its bright lights to examine the surroundings in hopes of finding any intact structures. After two complete circles, he stopped and pointed to the north. Well, looks like there's some destruction up there, but back to our left it looks clear. I guess we should try for the south exit, eh? I guess so. Worst case, we'll just drive around till we find some places that weren't completely destroyed. I just hope there aren't any swarms of muties that are coming along with the storm. Leonard looked up at the lightning flashing overhead and quickly put the APC into motion, driving up a slight hill bordering the southern end of the highway. Nancy's reminder of the potential for there to be creatures moving under the cover of the storm spurred Leonard onward, and he soon had the APC moving down the tightly packed streets of the city. Unlike the relatively open atmosphere of the small Iowan town, the city had been densely populated and the buildings were teetering on the brink of collapse. The streets of the southern area of the city had been torn apart in the same circular patterns that Leonard and Nancy had come to expect, though their main problem turned out to be the sheer number of overturned vehicles blocking their path. Even with the APC's powerful engine helping to push them through, Leonard soon found that they were getting bogged down with the armored vehicle threatening to become inexorably lodged amongst the debris. Backing up a few blocks, he and Nancy sat still, listening to the storm outside while they tried to decide what to do. Well, it looks like it clears up just ahead, and we're getting into more commercial areas. 
so I'm sure we'll at least find some clothing stores. Maybe I should take the rifle and try to scavenge what I can on foot while you wait at the APC. Fat chance, Leonard. I'm not staying here unarmed, and you're not going off in the storm on your own. We stick together. End of discussion. Leonard sighed and put his head back on the seat, closing his eyes. Unless you have any better suggestions, I don't think we have much of a choice at this point. Someone's got to stay with the APC in case we need a quick getaway. And we don't have enough guns or bullets for both of us to defend ourselves against any creatures lurking around. Nancy refused to budge against Leonard's argument, and after a few minutes of back and forth, he relented. <sighs> Fine. Let's just get as close as we can, turn the APC around so we're pointed out of here, and see what we can scrounge up. But this is still a terrible idea, though. I hope you realize that. Nancy shrugged. I don't care. You're not going out there alone, and you're not leaving me here by myself. Ah, oh, fucking hell. Leonard pulled the APC around in a small parking lot and revved the engine, sending it flying backward along a street headlong into a stack of cars and building debris. Broken glass and bricks flew everywhere as the armored car plowed through the pile, getting closer to the section of the city that Leonard and Nancy wanted to explore. Before it became completely trapped, though, Leonard cut off the engine, ensuring that their vehicle would be as close to them as possible while they were away from it. Leonard hopped out of the driver's seat, followed by Nancy, though instead of closing the door all the way, he left it cracked a few inches for a faster ingress. Cradling the rifle in his arms, Leonard shivered involuntarily at the cold temperatures brought on both by their location and the storm ahead. It had been quite a while since they had stepped out of the car, and they had forgotten how much the heat inside had been buffering them from the worsening weather. Hurry! Nancy ran ahead of Leonard, taking the initiative, and he quickly followed, hoping that running and climbing through the collapsed buildings would heat his body enough so that he could hold the rifle without shaking. On the other side of a collapsed office building, Leonard and Nancy spotted their goal. Several blocks worth of stores were virtually untouched, and contained every amenity offered in a large city. Clothing, food, sporting goods, and more were all before them, just a few moments from being in their grasp. Nancy was about to run down the opposite side of the debris pile when Leonard grabbed her shirt, forcing her into a small alcove and throwing her to the ground. He landed half on top of her and muffled her surprise shout with one hand while he held a finger to his mouth. Pointing at the direction they were about to go, Leonard slowly crawled to the side, letting Nancy raise her head to peek out. Ahead of them, starting at the bottom of the collapsed structure and extending as far as Nancy could see, was another swarm of creatures walking slowly through the city. At first they only saw a few, but it quickly turned into a larger and larger group, soon numbering in the thousands. Showing no aggression to each other or to their surroundings, they moved at a walking pace, clearly in no hurry to pass through the city. Rolling back into cover, Nancy and Leonard leaned close, barely daring to whisper to each other for fear of alerting the creatures to their presence. What the hell are we supposed to do now? Leonard didn't answer, but crawled backward, looking in the direction of the APC to see if they could escape back to the vehicle. Unfortunately, they appeared to have arrived in the city at the worst possible moment, since there were similar numbers of creatures to the north. Leonard was grateful to see that they were leaving the APC alone, despite the fact that the door was open, but with their only shelter and sustenance fatally out of reach, he wasn't sure what they could do. Each passing moment seemed to bring the temperature down by a few more degrees, and Leonard began to wonder if their death would come not at the hands of the creatures, or Samuel, but from Mother Nature herself. Leonard nudged Nancy forward to go deeper into the rubble of the building, hoping that they could get out of the wind. Huddled together on the broken brick and concrete, Leonard and Nancy waited, listening to the shrieks of the wind and the footsteps of the thousands of creatures plodding by. Chapter 16, 11.02 a.m., April 13th, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. Standing in front of a massive reinforced steel door, Marcus leaned against Bertha, arching his back and groaning from the strain of moving the heavy device. Though it was just a move down one flight of stairs, 
Doing so had required several hours' worth of work to achieve, and they were all exhausted by the end of it. Normally, when heavy machinery had to be moved, a freight elevator was employed, but due to the lack of power in the building, there had been no way to reroute any of it to the elevator system. Thankfully, though, the dolly David brought to their attention was equipped to travel downstairs with its variable height wheel system that helped the trio get Bertha down without dropping it or hurting themselves too severely. With the device sitting in front of the tunnel doorway, the two most pressing questions were how to open the door and what to do with the strange woman still lying upstairs. Let's just leave her. She's clearly being sustained by the nanobots, and she might relay information back to Doe, so there's no point in bringing her along. Marcus and Rachel glanced at each other upon hearing David's proclamation, both of them unsure whether the other agreed with David or not. While that might be a valid point, David, if what you're saying is true, couldn't that leave us open to more danger if we leave her to her own devices? Rachel was careful to avoid agreeing or disagreeing with David, as she was still having doubts about the woman herself. Not waiting for David to answer, Marcus inserted himself into the conversation. Just so we're clear, we're talking about leaving a person here, alone, in the bowels of a collapsed building, just because we're scared of what the nanobots have done to her. Marcus, Rachel said, I'm surprised to hear you come to her defense, given your personal encounters with the muties. Marcus shook his head. No, she's not a mutie. She looks like one, but she hasn't been consumed by the nanobots. There's still a person in there, somewhere underneath the machines. Doesn't that count for anything? David looked at the computer in his pocket, shifting nervously from foot to foot. We really don't have a lot of time to stand here and argue. Let's not forget that we have to get Bertha to the coast as quickly as possible, before the AI has an opportunity to learn that it needs to defend itself against us. We'll bring it to a vote. I say we leave the thing here. She's not human anymore, despite her lack of aggression. And she'll just be a liability to us. David looked at Rachel, his eyes lit by the pale glow of the EL light looped around her belt. Are you with me? Rachel hesitated in answering and glanced at Marcus again, who shook his head angrily. She looked at the ground and closed her eyes, preparing to speak when a noise behind her startled the three of them. Please, don't leave me. Rachel whirled around, instinctively bringing her rifle up, but lowering it immediately upon seeing that the voice belonged to the strange woman. She shuffled forward quietly, reaching her arms out to feel in front of her as she approached the group. Marcus felt Sam press in against his leg as the woman approached, the hairs on his neck raised, but still not growling. David tried to stutter a response, feeling mortified at being caught saying what he had, but before he could stammer out a complete sentence, Marcus stepped forward and took the woman's hand, watching as the blue glow of the nanobots retreated up her arm. Of course we're not going to leave you. Some of us are just frightened and unsure, but we won't leave you here. I promise. I guess that settles it then. Rachel stepped up next to Marcus and helped him guide the woman up close to the steel door, ignoring David's quiet grumbling from behind her. Just stay over here out of the way for a bit, please. We're trying to figure out how to get through this door. The woman cocked her head to the side and Marcus watched, fascinated. Her empty eye sockets traced the outline of the doorway exactly, and though Marcus knew she was blind, he couldn't help but wonder if she had some type of new sense gifted to her by the nanobots that had taken over her body. After a moment of looking over the door, the woman turned back toward Marcus and spoke. There appears to be a weakness on the right-hand side of this barrier, approximately four feet up from the ground and six inches out from it. A directed energy pulse of the correct frequency would exploit this weakness, most likely resulting in the removal of the barrier. Marcus, Rachel, David, and Sam all stepped back as the woman strode to the location that she spoke of, placing her hand on a small access panel next to the door. The panel was dark, devoid of the electricity needed to make it operate, until the woman's hand connected with it. A burst of white energy arced through the panel, quickly followed by the loud clanks of massive bolts being retracted into the door. Stepping back from the panel, the woman grasped the door and pulled on it, 
effortlessly swinging it open to reveal a dark tunnel beyond. While there was no need for words to express the astonishment on all their faces, Marcus couldn't help himself. Holy shit! How did you do that? The determined expression on the woman's face melted away upon hearing Marcus's query. How did I do what? Rachel took the woman by the arm and guided her back near the dolly holding Bertha. Never mind. It's fine. Just rest. Everything will be all right. Shaking her head in awe, Rachel whispered to David, concerned again about the possible implications of bringing the woman with them. You're still scanning for transmissions, right? David nodded, patting the handheld computer in his pocket as he whispered in response. And the second this thing picks up on anything, it'll alert us. For the record, though, I still think it's a terrible idea to take her with us. The instant she looks like she's a danger, we'll put her down. Rachel looked at Marcus and David, who both nodded in agreement. For now, though, we keep her with us and take care of her. Not just because she's an asset, but because as far as I'm concerned, she's still at least part human. Chapter 17, 3 p.m., April 13th, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. Shivering and aching, Leonard and Nancy struggled to stay awake. They had crawled as far into a narrow cranny in the collapsed building as they felt safe doing and were lying on their sides, huddled together to try and keep as warm as possible. It was a losing battle, though, as the cold bricks and occasional crosswinds leached away heat through their thin clothing. Every fifteen minutes, like clockwork, Leonard crawled out into the open and peeked down at the streets below them, hoping each time that he would see nothing but emptiness again. Instead, all he saw were the endless forms of the creatures still making their way through the city. The behavior of the creatures was curious to Leonard. Instead of searching through buildings and rubble as he would have expected them to do, they acted like they were out for a stroll instead. They paid no attention to their surroundings except to clamber over obstacles, and they hadn't touched the APC, which Leonard could still see, just barely, thanks to the tiny bit of light filtering down through the clouds. Bright bursts of lightning provided most of the illumination, and Leonard had almost gotten used to it after enduring hours of the storm. Protected as they were, Leonard didn't expect that they would be struck by lightning or found by the creatures, but those were not Leonard and Nancy's primary enemies at the moment. With the winds as strong as they were and the lack of sunlight, Leonard estimated that the temperature was in the low 50s, with the wind chill taking off several degrees more. While he and Nancy had the advantage of pooling their limited warmth and were relatively well protected from the wind, if they didn't get moving soon, hypothermia could set in. Without so much as a piece of cardboard to insulate them against the cold of the collapsed building, Leonard fretted over their situation, hoping that the creatures would soon be done with their seemingly endless march. Leonard crawled back next to Nancy and shook his head, seeing the disappointment in her eyes. She sighed and muttered under her breath, barely loud enough for Leonard to hear. At least if Samuel is still around, he's probably freezing out here too. There's no way that asshole could get through this city with all the muties around, even if he wanted to. Leonard snorted, amused by Nancy's morbidly humorous outlook. On more than one occasion, he had considered making a run for the APC, thinking that if they could just get inside, they would be able to wait out the creatures in warmth and safety. Each time he had checked on the situation below, though, he was discouraged from even making an attempt on the APC by the quantity of creatures flooding the streets. Even at the village he hadn't seen so many creatures, and to see thousands of them all traveling together was enough to make him frightfully nervous. Clasping his hands together, Leonard started to put his head down on them to rest for a few moments when loud snarls from the street below caught his attention. The creatures hadn't made any aggressive movements or sounds so far, and he began to worry that he and Nancy had somehow been discovered. Crawling back to the edge of the alcove, Leonard peeked down the street and watched as several creatures broke from their slow walk and started to run. Thankfully, they weren't running toward the building, but away from it, focused on something in the distance. Leonard wasn't sure what they were chasing and initially thought it might be another survivor, but a few moments after hearing the first snarl, he realized what they were pursuing. 
Through the noise of thunder and heavy footsteps from the creatures, an engine noise suddenly drew closer. In a flash of lightning, Leonard saw a strange vehicle tear past the street, weaving in and out between the creatures and rubble. The driver was rain-soaked, and Leonard strained to get a look at him, but his vehicle vanished behind a building seconds after it had appeared. In the brief time that the vehicle was visible, Leonard saw that it was designed in a way that made it easier to drive through the crowded streets than the APC, but it still had to travel relatively slowly, especially in the dark conditions. Several creatures were pursuing the vehicle, not close enough that they were at risk of catching it, but close enough that the man had to maintain his speed or risk being overtaken. As Leonard continued to watch the creatures, he noticed that while there were many pursuing the vehicle, not enough were doing so to offer a clear path for him and Nancy to get back to the APC. Even though Leonard was certain he could take out the few that were currently blocking the path, the hundreds of other creatures within earshot would surely descend upon them faster than they could get into the vehicle. Nancy slowly crawled out next to Leonard and watched the running creatures, curious about the engine noise. What's going on? Leonard pointed in the direction the vehicle had disappeared in. Speak of the devil. Looks like our little friend managed to find his way here. He's being chased, though, so I don't think he'll give us any trouble. Rubbing her arms, Nancy looked around at the wave of creatures still marching along, discouraged by how long it had been since they had first appeared. Unless he finds a place to hide, like us, and waits the creatures out. That possibility hadn't occurred to Leonard, but he supposed that it could happen. Well then, I guess we'll just have to get our supplies and be gone before he comes out. Pointing east, in the direction that both the creatures and the man had headed, Leonard continued. We'll be out of the thick of these things first, though, since they're moving west to east. I think we'll be able to get a few things and then get out of here before he comes back. Nancy nodded slowly and crawled back into the alcove to take shelter from a sudden gust of wind. I'm so sick of being in these cities. Every time we go through one, it seems like we end up worse off than we would have been if we had just skipped the damned thing. Leonard sighed in agreement, exasperated with the constant challenges brought on by the cities they had visited. If we can get some coats, hats, and gloves, and maybe a few more guns, we can just skip any future cities and head straight for Alaska. No more stops. What about refueling? Leonard crawled back next to Nancy, keeping his head tilted to listen for the silence he hoped would arrive soon when the last creature walked past them down below. Well, I've been refueling in the cities just because we've been stopping there, but every semi that we pass is a potential fuel source. We've been seeing those all the time, so, you know, we should be good as long as we can keep finding them. Thinking ahead, Leonard didn't know what they would do once they crossed the border and started getting into the more isolated areas, where other vehicles, including tractor trailers, would become much rarer. The APC was built for long journeys and had a large fuel capacity, but not knowing the exact distance they'd have to travel, Leonard wasn't sure what they would do about that particular problem. Chapter 18. Somewhere in South Dakota. Standing at a crossroads, the man scans the horizon for the sixth time, using a pair of binoculars to look from north to south as he tries to decide where the intruders would have gone. Traveling west as they were, he knows that they will eventually have to cross the Missouri River. The problem, though, is that there are so many crossings, he is unsure which one they would head to. Reaching into his pocket, he picks up a dented piece of lead, the remnant of the bullet that impacted on the APC, falling to the road in the shape of a pancake. The man sneers, wishing that he had used the armor-piercing rounds that he brought with him, but he pushes the negative thought from his mind. The Lord works in mysterious ways, he thinks. Settling on that is the reason why he has not yet stopped the intruders. The man walks to the south along the crossroads several hundred feet, looking at the ground as he goes. Finding nothing, he circles to the west and walks back to his vehicle, searching for any signs that a vehicle passed through the area. Finding nothing, he grows impatient and hurries to the north, quickly scanning back and forth along the ground for any signs of the intruders. What's this? The man bends down and looks at the road. A small patch of rubber is lying in the road just a few dozen feet after a large pile of cars. 
Stepping back, the man envisions what happened. In a hurry to escape his vengeance, the intruders went off-road, forced to take their military vehicle into the grass before steering it back onto the highway. In their haste, they lost traction, and their tire slipped on the roadway, leaving the small patch of rubber in its wake. The man hurries into the grass at the side of the road and crouches down, peeling back the blades. Hidden under the taller, more springy grass lay patches of bruised and broken blades, along with patches of dirt thrown up by the armored vehicle's knobby tires. The man has seen enough, and he hurries back to his vehicle, starts the engine, and then races to the north along the highway. There's only one place they might be headed that has enough supplies to outfit them for wherever they're traveling. The man has a long drive ahead of him, but he is still in familiar country. Using a compass, he cuts through large swaths of land, leaving highways far behind, and joining up with new ones as he works to shave off as much time as possible. The man glances to the west, seeing a black cloud rolling across the horizon. Another test. Already? Have I not endured enough? No answer comes to the man. Hours later, in the afternoon, the man arrives at the city where he is certain he will find the intruders. For the first time since setting off from the village, though, he is not concerned solely with the intruders. Black clouds float overhead, with lightning chaining amongst them, setting off great thunderclaps that distract him from the road. Worse yet, the man sees another horde of demons, seemingly endless as they pour from the city, walking on an inexorable march to the east. The man feels fear grip his heart, but he fights against it, forcing it down as he drives through the army of creatures, swerving around them to try and find the intruders. Several times along the way to the city, he stopped, examining fresh evidence of the intruder's vehicle, confident that he was on the trail. Here in the city, though, surrounded by the demon cohorts of the intruders, the man isn't sure how he can track them down. The demons snap and claw at him as he passes by, but he resists firing upon them. His vehicle is loud enough, and there is no sense in drawing more attention to himself before he has located his prey. Chapter 19 314 p.m. April 13th, 2038 Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry After opening the thick steel door that looked more like the door to a bank vault than an old transportation tunnel, Rachel, Marcus, David, Sam, and the strange woman descended down the steep slope. They traveled several floors downward before the tunnel leveled off. Though it had been refitted with carpeting and recessed lighting along the ceiling, it was still obvious that it had been no more than a service tunnel, used for transporting heavy machinery, supplies, and whatever the laboratory workers needed from the outside world. The tunnel was markedly colder than the laboratory complex had been, and the slow dripping of water indicated that some type of water reserve or piping had broken during the building collapse. The air was stale but breathable, though it was hard to see very well thanks to the low power of the light sources employed by the group. Rachel and David kept their flashlights off, using the EL lights in order to conserve the flashlight's limited battery life. The strange woman was still glowing blue, and she sat atop Bertha, which was balanced on the dolly, acting as an odd sort of lighthouse and sentinel as they slowly walked down the tunnel. Multiple access tunnels, like the one they were in, existed, scattered around at strategic points that had made it easy for each department to get items in and out of the building as quickly as possible. Some of the service tunnels weren't on any official records, and David considered himself lucky that theirs was still listed, especially after its main use had been changed. Unfortunately, the age of the tunnel combined with the fact that its latest use was for clandestine activities meant that certain aspects of it weren't as described in the building blueprints. The group learned this fact the hard way as they stood at an intersection in the tunnel with five separate branches leading off in different directions from the way they came. David? Rachel stared at him, her tone a mix of worry and frustration. Where are we supposed to go? David frantically searched through the blueprints on his handheld computer, trying to find any information that might explain what they were seeing. Frustrated, he threw the device to Rachel to look through, and after a few moments, she handed it back, confirming that there was no more data to be found about the area. 
Marcus took a flashlight and turned it on, lighting up each of the five branches in succession. All five continued on at an even angle for as far as Marcus could see, and they were virtually identical in decor and appearance. The only major differences between the branches were some painted letters and numbers a few feet inside on each wall. C01, C02, C03, C04, and C05. With no other hints left to go on, Marcus went to David and pointed at the handheld computer. Uh, can you bring up an overview of the tunnel we're in right now? David obliged, and the blue and white image was quickly back on the screen. Marcus took the computer and held it in front of him, looking at the angles on the blueprint compared to that of the tunnel they were in. Now, none of the branches looks like the turn you see here on the blueprint. Oh, so either they completely changed the tunnel layout, or the blueprints were altered. Or both. I guess this means there's only one way to find out where these things go. Marcus pulled his backpack tight on his shoulders and double-checked his pistol. He looked at Rachel and David, who had already started to argue with him, knowing exactly what he meant. Cutting them off harshly, he glared at them, nearly shouting. Shut the hell up, both of you! We don't have time to sit around or play guessing games, and there aren't enough guns for more than one of us to figure out where we should go. The way I see it, we can delay for a day, maybe two at most, to figure out where to go. If I'm lucky, I find the right passage in the first 20 minutes, and if not, it might be a good 24 hours or more. Based on those blueprints from David and the depth that we're at, these tunnels could go on for miles before they hit the surface. One way or another, we need to get this thing up to the surface, and this is the only viable way out. Marcus kicked the dolly in frustration, then slowly sat down on the floor, staring at the glowing woman still perched on top of Bertha. Looking back at David and Rachel, he spoke more calmly, nearly pleading with them. Unless you two have a better idea, I can't think of any safe way for us to try and figure out how to get out of here. I'm open to any suggestions, though. I really don't want to head off by myself. Rachel closed her eyes and lowered her head. Marcus's idea was maddening, to be sure, but there was only one other way around it. With David not knowing how to use a gun, Either she or Marcus had to stay with him and Bertha to defend against any creatures. That left either her or Marcus to discern where they needed to go, and since Rachel had more experience with the laboratory complex, she knew that she'd have to venture out on her own. Getting Marcus to let her go willingly wouldn't work, though. He was too stubborn and overprotective for that. Fine. Here, I, I think I have a couple of extra mags for you. Rachel made a show of fishing around in her backpack, waiting for Marcus to walk over. Taking out a few packets of food and bottles of water, Rachel laid her rifle down on the ground next to her backpack as Marcus approached. He dropped his backpack on the ground and knelt down next to her, intent on helping her find the extra ammunition. She pointed down into the bag and stood up, circling around behind him as he dug through the bag, looking for the pistol magazines. I saw one down in there. Can you see it? I don't see... Uh, Marcus stood up to question Rachel about the magazines and instantly felt her arm around his neck. With her elbow directly in front of his chin, she squeezed her arm together like a vice, applying pressure to his carotid arteries in the form of a rear naked choke. The flow of blood to Marcus's head was immediately restricted, and he tried to struggle, but fell unconscious in just a few seconds, suffering from a lack of oxygen in his brain. Rachel held on for a bit longer before gently releasing Marcus, letting him tumble gently to the ground. Distracted by looking at his computer, David didn't notice Rachel's attack until he heard Marcus's body hit the floor. Not wasting an instant, Rachel snatched Marcus's pistol and magazines, along with the food and water she had set aside, and stuffed them into Marcus's backpack on the ground. David stared down at her in shock, his eyes wide and his mouth open as he struggled to comprehend what had just taken place. What the hell are you doing, Rachel? Rachel glanced back up at him as she finished quickly stuffing the supplies into Marcus's backpack and threw it on her back. He'll be awake in less than a minute with a headache at worst. Keep him restrained and don't let him try to go after me. He's not going to abandon you once he realizes what happened, so just keep a tight grip on him for the first few minutes. David raised his hands, gesticulating wildly at Rachel and Marcus, his mouth opening and closing like a fish, unable to form any type of rational response to Rachel's actions. 
Rachel called to Sam, and they both ran down the rightmost corridor, traveling as fast as Rachel's legs could carry her. Without her rifle, she was more vulnerable, but she was also more nimble, carrying less weight and able to move faster than she otherwise could. Counting on David to keep Marcus from following her, she struggled to move fast, sprinting down the dark corridor with only her EL light to guide the way. Sam's panting was a comfort to hear behind her, and she was glad that she would have him nearby. Marcus will protect them. I'm not letting him take on this task, especially when he's done so much already. Rachel used her guilt to her advantage, pouring it into her running to propel her down the corridor and to where she hoped the exit would be. With so many different tunnels under the city, taking the wrong path could lead to wandering in circles for days at a time, a situation Rachel hoped she didn't find herself in. Ah, <sighs> one out of five. I guess those aren't terrible odds, assuming one of the muties doesn't catch me down here. Chapter 20 5.38 p.m., April 13th, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. Leonard and Nancy's wait for the creatures to finish filtering through their part of the city didn't last long. As the sounds of the creatures' footsteps started to wane, they left their alcove, crawling out to look at the last few creatures wandering through the city. The creatures at the tail end of the horde were frailer looking and they walked slower too, their bodies bruised and nearly broken. On more than one occasion, Nancy swore she could see small figures in the distance, obscured by the darkness, but she dismissed the sight, not wanting to think about children being turned into the hideous beasts. Should we go now? Nancy whispered to Leonard, who was crouching with the rifle across his legs. He shook his head slowly. Not yet, but, uh, almost. Maybe another ten minutes or so. You should probably stretch your legs out in case we have to run from any of these things. Nancy eased herself up, turned over, and sat back down, rubbing her aching calves. They don't look like they could do much to us even if they did notice us. It's not them that I'm worried about. If they start making noise, they might attract the attention of our little shadow, and that would be very bad indeed. Scarcely 15 minutes later, the last of the creatures that Leonard and Nancy could see passed by. Leonard cautioned that they should wait a few more minutes, which took place in agonizing slowness. Finally, after the area had been clear for a full 10 minutes, and no more creatures appeared by the flare of the lightning flashes, Leonard started to make his move with Nancy following behind. Half sliding, half climbing down the opposite side of the collapsed building, Leonard felt blood rush back into his legs. In the back of his mind, he hoped that a blood clot hadn't formed, though if it had, there wasn't anything he could do about it. At street level, Leonard scanned the area, with the only sign of creatures being down the road to the east, well out of earshot. Leonard motioned at Nancy to follow him, not wanting to risk speaking in case there were any other creatures nearby that they couldn't see. He ran down the street to the south, heading for the stores he and Nancy had spotted earlier. After passing several office buildings, more consumer-oriented buildings appeared. A high-end men's clothing store was on the right, then a lingerie shop on the left, followed by a toy shop and a sporting goods store. In here! Leonard ran to the front of the sporting goods store, pushing gently on the door. It opened easily, and he ducked inside, holding the door open for Nancy as she followed him in. Look for anything usable, and hurry! Nancy ran to the back of the store, pausing in between the frequent flashes of lightning to wait for their illumination. Clothing left over from the winter months was spread out on clearance racks, and she grabbed as much as she could, ignoring individual sizes in favor of the largest coats, gloves, jackets, and hats that she could carry. Up front, Leonard pulled two hiking backpacks from a wall display and opened them, pulling out the thick newspaper that had been wadded inside to give them a fuller appearance. Stacks of batteries and flashlights lined the checkout display, and Leonard threw them into the first backpack, along with knives, first aid kits, multi-tools, and anything else that looked useful. The second backpack held more clothing and survival gear that he found up front, divided roughly equally between men's and women's fits. Nancy ran up behind him, depositing the load of clothing on the floor and kneeling down to look in the backpacks, checking to see what they had retrieved. What do you think? Is there enough here? 
I'm afraid that no amount of wares you steal from here will be enough to save the two of you from the vengeance of the Lord, O oh, consorters of demons. A bright light accompanied the voice from outside the sporting goods store, blinding Leonard and Nancy. Leonard dove to the floor behind the checkout counter, pulling Nancy along with him as they sought refuge from the voice that they had come to know well during their forced stay in Iowa. It's him! Nancy's statement of the obvious was accompanied by a powerful gunshot, louder than Leonard had heard before. The wood and glass of the display case split open as Samuel fired his fifty caliber rifle from behind his vehicle, which he had parked out in front of the store. Blocking the only visible exit, he was in a perfect position to fire upon Nancy and Leonard, and the spotlight mounted on the vehicle lit up the entire shop, making a discreet exit impossible. Leonard suspected that the only reason Samuel hadn't hit them directly was because he didn't know exactly where they were behind the counter. It would only be a matter of time before he found out, either by chance or by coming in to finish them off. In his haste, Leonard had dropped his rifle, and it sat on the ground, half behind the cover of the checkout counter and half exposed, though he dared not reach for it for fear of giving away his position. What do you want from us, you asshole? Leonard bellowed from behind the counter, wincing as another round came through, sending a shockwave through his head from the concussive force of the rifle rounds escaping gases. The second shot was closer to Leonard and Nancy than the first, though still several feet away. To bring justice, my child! To bring down the cleansing justice and retribution of the Lord upon your shoulders. That is what I am here for. Glass from the shattered front windows of the storefront crunched under Samuel's bootsteps as he slowly entered, armed with a smaller but no less deadly rifle. His finger hovering over the trigger, he walked closer to the checkout counter, preparing to dispatch the intruders. Nancy closed her eyes and squeezed Leonard's hand as he eyed his rifle, preparing to make a desperate attempt to retrieve it. And now, my children, prepare yourselves. Your end is at hand. Chapter 21 5.30 p.m. April 13th, 2038 Rachel Walsh Two hours after leaving the group behind, Rachel finally sat down for a short rest. After alternating between running and jogging for most of the time, she was starting to think that the tunnel she had chosen wasn't the correct one. The journey had been level for most of the way, with a few twists and turns, but Rachel hadn't found anything particularly interesting, except for a few pieces of machinery scattered around. Multiple bolted and locked doors had shown up along her path, and while Rachel had tried her best to open them, there were no visible mechanisms for her to do so. After taking a few drinks from a water bottle and giving the same to Sam, Rachel stood back up and continued down the tunnel, walking this time instead of running or jogging. Expecting the tunnel to continue going for quite a distance further, Rachel was shocked when it opened into a room so large that her flashlight couldn't penetrate to its depths. What the hell? Rachel had never heard of a place like this near the laboratory complex, but she had been traveling for so long that she had no idea where under the city she was. Starting on the right wall, Rachel followed the outline of the room, walking the perimeter to find out how many possible exits there were, as well as to see what the room might have been used for. A few hundred feet from the tunnel, Rachel began to pass machinery, pallets full of miscellaneous industrial supplies, and something else that lit up her face with a large grin. Slightly wider and longer than a golf cart, without the roof overhead, a squat transport cart sat along the wall. On the back of it was a trailer hitch and receiver, though there was no trailer in sight. Hardly daring to hope that her luck would continue, Rachel stepped toward the driver's side of the cart and pressed the ignition button near the steering wheel. Although the cart had plenty of computer components in it, the room it was in was apparently shielded from EMPs, since the small electric motor immediately began to hum. A few lights on the dashboard began to glow green as well, and Rachel slowly sat down behind the wheel, trying to decide what to do with the vehicle. Having gone so far down the tunnel, Rachel was positive that it wasn't going to get them back to street level anywhere near the APC. Even if the tunnel did eventually dump out to the surface, 
getting Bertha back to the laboratory complex through the ruined surface streets would be next to impossible, even if they used the dolly or the electric cart. Come on, Sam. Rachel patted the seat next to her, coaxing Sam onto the vehicle. Let's see what else we can find in here. Then we'll get back to the others. With one tunnel down and four left to go, Rachel was hopeful that they would be able to find the exit soon, especially with the faster speed of the transport cart. Used for hauling machinery through the tunnels, the cart was packed to the brim with batteries, which were over 90% charged, according to its diagnostics. 148 miles glowed in the corner of the dashboard display, and Rachel took that to be the estimate of how much farther the cart could travel before it would have to be recharged. Rachel flicked a switch labeled lights near the ignition button, and two bright LED headlamps sprung to life, cutting through the darkness and illuminating the majority of the room she was in. Up ahead, in the opposite direction of the tunnel she'd come from, Rachel could see large sets of elevator doors, tall and wide enough to bring down massive equipment and replacement parts for whatever was being built or installed in the area. Several more transport carts were also scattered around the room, though none looked to be in as good of a shape as the one she was in. Rachel pressed down lightly on the cart's accelerator and was jolted back in her seat, overwhelmed by how powerful the small vehicle was. A speedometer in the vehicle went from zero to 50 miles an hour, though Rachel didn't feel like testing the upper limits of the electric motor any time in the near future. After a quick examination of the elevators, and finding them to be without power, and thus utterly useless, Rachel turned the car around to go back through the tunnel to where Marcus and David were waiting with Bertha and the strange woman. With this vehicle, the group would be able to make fast time through the rest of the tunnels, and Rachel had no doubt that they'd be able to find their way out to the surface relatively quickly. Turning back toward the tunnel to rejoin her friends, Rachel wasn't paying very close attention to where she was going and accidentally sent the transport cart over a pile of copper tubing. Banging loudly in the quiet room, the tubing flew everywhere, sending a loud clanging sound echoing far into the distance. From behind her, Rachel heard the sound of the tubing turn into a different noise, lower and more guttural in the darkness. She turned her head and slowed the electric cart down, getting her flashlight out to see what the noise was. As she looked behind her, Rachel suddenly realized that she had no need for the flashlight, as the back of the room was suddenly illuminated with a pale blue glow. Coming from two separate creatures, the glow grew stronger as more creatures climbed out of the open elevator doors, their numbers reaching six as the last one joined its brethren. Armed with only her pistol, Rachel abandoned the room as fast as she could, gripping Sam's body tightly as she accelerated the cart forward into the hall. Though the cart's electric whine was quiet enough to not have attracted the creature's attention when she first turned it on, they were well aware of her presence now and sought her out. Taking long strides as they ran, the creatures did their best to keep up with her, but the faster speed of the cart won out over the creatures as she quickly left them behind in the tunnel. Traveling at over 30 miles an hour, the walls of the tunnel passed by in a blur. Rachel concentrated on her driving, keeping the cart steady and only slowing down for the occasional turn. With the creatures far behind her, she didn't let up, as each moment she gained over the creatures was another moment that the group would have to prepare for their imminent arrival. The question now wasn't if they would encounter the creatures again, but when. Chapter 22, 5.39 p.m., April 13th, 2038. Marcus Warden, David Landry. Marcus sat cross-legged on the floor in front of the dolly, glowering as he held Rachel's rifle in his arms. Staring off down the corridor she had run down after ambushing him, he considered running after her for the hundredth time since he woke up. He restrained himself, though, knowing that protecting David... Bertha, and even the strange woman, was what he had to do. Lost in self-pity and anger, Marcus didn't notice when David sat down next to him, holding a bottle of juice out as a peace offering of sorts. Since David had told Marcus what Rachel did to him, Marcus hadn't spoken a single word to David. Marcus blamed David for not stopping Rachel, and he was far too upset to want to talk to anyone. He glanced at the juice as he pushed it away, not bothering to look at David or even acknowledge his presence. Marcus, again, I I'm sorry. I would have stopped her if I could have, but she was so fast. 
I, I didn't even know what was going on until she was running off with Sam. Marcus closed his eyes and sighed, leaning his head against the cold tunnel wall. Lit by the blue glow from the woman sitting a few feet above them, the tunnel was quiet except for David's talking. The silence and cold temperature gave the tunnel a spooky air, particularly since Rachel and Sam had left. Rubbing his neck where Rachel had grabbed him, Marcus decided that it was time to break his silence. It's fine, David. I know it's not your fault. <sighs> She's a bitch for doing that, though. It should be me out there, not her. David shifted nervously and coughed before replying. <clears throat> um, not to be argumentative, but you're actually the worst person for the job, Marcus. Oh, yeah? Marcus was too tired to be annoyed with David, and the monotony in his voice showed it. How do you figure that? I'm sure that Rachel disabled you because she knew you wouldn't let her go, but she knows this building and you don't. She's far better equipped to handle any problems along the way than you are, Marcus. It's a fact. Marcus sighed again and turned to face David, leaning his whole back against the tunnel wall. The cold burned through his clothing, giving a refreshing tingle to his sore muscles. I know, David. I know. Marcus laid the rifle down next to him and closed his eyes as he spoke. But we've been working together since Richmond, Rachel and Sam and I. We haven't always seen eye to eye, but we've worked well together, and we've gotten shit done. It feels like a stab in the back for her to run off like this, especially with Sam. I know why she did it, and that it was for all the right reasons, and that it makes the most sense, and all of that nonsense. I know all of that. But knowing that doesn't change the fact that I don't like it. You know, what am I supposed to do if she gets hurt or trapped by those things out there? Or what if Doe decides to pop up again with, you know, some new scheme? David patted Marcus's arm sympathetically, realizing the connection that had formed between Marcus and Rachel through their shared adversity. I get it, Marcus. You probably know Rachel better than I do, and I worked with her for years. And if there's anything I know about her, it's that she can get things done. Period. Marcus gave David a half smile and nodded his head in the direction of David's coat pocket. What time is it? David pulled out his pocket computer and turned it on, verifying the time. Almost six. Settling into position, Marcus rocked his shoulders back and forth on the wall, trying to work out the tension that had built up in them. She'd better find the way out soon. Otherwise, we're going to have to start trying the tunnels ourselves. That is, if we want to get out of here in time to, you know, stop the end of the world. This has been Final Dawn, Episode 8. Written by Mike Kraus. Narrated by Mike Kraus. Final Dawn, Episode 9. Written by Mike Kraus. Narrated by Mike Krause. Chapter 1, 6, 10 p.m., April 13th, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. Sliding along the floor, Leonard shuffled his way toward his rifle, while Samuel continued his nonsensical shouting from the front of the store. Every few seconds, Samuel fired another round through the front counter sending shards of glass and wood showering over Leonard and Nancy. As Leonard finally got within reach of his rifle, the stock exploded, sending Leonard scurrying back as Samuel continued to fire at it. I'm sorry, children, but there will be no salvation for you today. You shall not escape the... Samuel's voice abruptly trailed off, and Leonard heard him turn around at the same time as a high-pitched growl came from outside the store. Peeking around the corner, Leonard saw Samuel facing out the front of the store, looking beyond the vehicle's bright floodlights at something moving in the shadows. Caught in a flash of lightning, Leonard spotted what had distracted Samuel and grabbed his attention. A small creature, barely three feet tall, was crawling on all fours over Samuel's vehicle, a miniature version of the larger adult creatures, this small one acted as aggressive as its larger compatriots. Its clothing was virtually gone, its eyes had been replaced by hollow silver indentations, 
and its entire body was covered with the telltale signs of a nanobot infection. For the first few seconds that Leonard watched the creature, he didn't quite understand what he was looking at, though once the creature crossed over the vehicle and came in front of the floodlights, Leonard recoiled in horror. The possibility, and likelihood, of children being mutated by the nanobots was always a remote thought, but Leonard had never really considered it. Seeing the small child approaching Samuel was more disturbing to Leonard than just about everything else he had witnessed. No older than two, and crawling on all fours, the small creature's mouth was wide, revealing rows of metal-infused teeth. Samuel stepped back a pace toward the front desk, getting closer to Leonard and Nancy at the same time, as he had seemingly forgotten their presence. What witchcraft is this? Though Leonard and Nancy couldn't see it, Samuel's face had turned white at the sight of the creature, and though his gun was still raised, he hesitated, his finger hovering over the trigger. Sensing Samuel's uncertainty, the small creature lunged forward as Samuel fired the rifle, sending several shots bouncing wildly through the front door and off his vehicle. The creature's aim wasn't as fine-tuned as its older brethren, as it only caught Samuel's shoulder, throwing him off balance, as the creature crashed through the checkout desk and landed at Leonard and Nancy's feet. Its back turned to Nancy, she felt immediate pity at the sight of the young child helpless at her feet. She started to reach out toward it, but Leonard pulled her arm back and pushed her to the side, seeking to put as much distance between the pair of them and the creature as possible. Regaining his balance, Samuel swung around the checkout counter just as Nancy and Leonard had exited through the other side, scrambling to the back of the store. After firing a few shots in their general direction, Samuel redirected his attention back to the small creature that was starting to move once again. Picking itself up off the ground, it lunged at Samuel, this time landing squarely on his chest, knocking him backwards to the ground. Leonard pulled on Nancy's arm as Samuel began to scream in pain as the creature tore at him with its sharpened nails and teeth. Let's move fast before one of them decides to come after us. Running through the back half of the store, Leonard came to a sudden halt as he saw flashes of movement in the dim light from Samuel's floodlights. He slowly backed up and Nancy looked over his shoulder, wondering why he had stopped. What's going on? Leonard pointed ahead at the movement and Nancy squinted, trying to get a closer look. She gasped as she saw a dozen more of the small creatures slowly making their way toward the front of the store. Originally headed for Samuel, the creatures noticed Leonard's and Nancy's movements and began to change their direction, half of them splitting off toward Leonard and Nancy while half of them continued on toward Samuel. A burst of gunfire from the front of the store accompanied by a triumphant shout from Samuel momentarily distracted the creatures, giving Leonard the opportunity he was looking for. Get going and grab the bags on the way out. He and Nancy ran full tilt for the front of the store, heading for the backpacks they had prepared, which were thankfully on the opposite side of the room from where Samuel was still lying on his back. Their movements caused him to turn toward them, but the chorus of snarls from the back of the store made him turn back once again. The pack of small creatures was moving faster, not at their full speed, but aggressively enough that Samuel knew he had no chance against them. His skirmish with the first one had cost him dearly enough, and his chest and arms ached from the severe lacerations inflicted upon him by the first small creature. Facing a pack of them would be suicide, even if he did manage to take a few of them down before they reached him. Disregarding Leonard and Nancy, who had already left the building and were running down the street, Samuel pushed himself to his feet and hobbled to his vehicle. The creatures behind him came clearly into view as they drew closer to the vehicle's floodlights, which he abruptly shut off after he climbed in the driver's seat. The engine was still warm and easy to start up, and Samuel was quickly back on his way, cradling his chest with one arm while he fought to stay on the road with the other. Fighting the urge to curse out loud, Samuel focused on slowing his breathing as he tried to get his rage under control. Not only had he been wounded at the hands of one of the demons, but Leonard and Nancy, the ones who bred, the ones who had brought the demons upon Samuel's village, had escaped with nary a scratch. Twice Samuel had engaged them, and twice he had failed to do more than frighten them, making him wondering what was preventing him from harming them. 
Settling on the conclusion that it just wasn't their time to die, Samuel set about leaving the city as quickly as possible, hoping to get ahead of Leonard and Nancy before they crossed the bridge located several miles down the road. Samuel doubted that the small creatures would follow him that far, giving him time to bandage his wounds and form a plan for his next attack. One way or another, I'll get you both, no matter how many of your minions you send at me. Chapter 2 6.30 p.m., April 13th, 2038 Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry the sound of heavy breathing, accompanied with soft beeps, were the only sounds that echoed gently into the tunnels where David, Marcus, and the mutated woman sat. Still astride Bertha, the strange woman's chest rose and fell laboriously, and she occasionally wheezed for breath, her partially mutated body neither fully empowered by the nanobots nor still fully human. Sitting nearby, cross-legged on the floor, David sat with his handheld computer just a few inches from his face. With the brightness turned to its lowest setting to conserve battery life, David struggled with the device as he tried to find some new scrap of information about their current location. Pacing back and forth nearby, Marcus walked in front of the split where the main tunnel branched off into five separate directions. He was still fuming about Rachel's actions, but the feeling of frustration and resentment was slowly being replaced by concern. Where the hell is she? Just settle down, Marcus. David pleaded with Marcus without looking up from his screen. Marcus had spent no more than ten minutes seated during the time Rachel was gone. The rest of his time was spent pacing so repeatedly that David idly wondered if Marcus was going to wear a path on the floor. She'll be back soon, I'm sure. If that tunnel goes nowhere, she'll have to come back to check the others. If she comes back, you mean? David raised an eyebrow, genuinely concerned by Marcus's words and tone. You're being quite pessimistic. Marcus's sigh made it clear that he didn't mean what he said. Frustration and an overwhelming restlessness were gnawing at him. Though Marcus had no romantic feelings toward Rachel, he cared about her greatly, despite the times they spent rubbing each other the wrong way. Aside from his parents, he hadn't been so trusting and dependent on another person in a very long time. Rachel's long absence made him nervous, but every time he worked himself up enough to take off down the tunnel after her, he remembered that he had no choice but to sit and wait. David was helpless against any creatures, and though Marcus wasn't sure about the strange woman, he knew that Bertha was the most important thing to keep safe. Distant barks echoed through the tunnel as Marcus continued to pace. He froze in place, looking down the tunnels, having difficulty determining where it was coming from. David had told Marcus that the tunnel system was likely extremely complex, given that it was used not only for transport, but also for getting VIPs to and from destinations in a safe and direct route. The five tunnels that branched off from their current location could all lead to separate destinations, or they might loop around and branch off for miles in all directions before ending at the same location. It was impossible to tell without a map or blueprint. Pinpoints of light bloomed rapidly into view, drawing closer at a rapid pace. Just a few minutes after initially hearing Sam's barks, Rachel skidded the cart to a stop. The squeal of rubber against the tunnel floor stood in stark contrast to the nearly silent electric motor of the cart. Before David or Marcus could say anything, Rachel hopped out of the cart and stood behind them, pointing down the tunnel where she had come from. Get ready to shoot. I found our other friends down there. Instantly forgetting about his anger at Rachel, as well as his relief at seeing her again, Marcus dropped to one knee and held his rifle up, aiming it down the center of the tunnel. The trio stood in silence for several moments, watching for any signs of a blue glow that would betray the presence of more creatures. After nothing surfaced, Marcus slowly lowered the rifle and glanced at Rachel. Are you sure they were following you? Of course I'm sure. I must have lost them, though. This, this little cart's got quite the top speed. The initial rush caused by Rachel's reappearance was fading, and Marcus felt his anger return in full force. Well, they're obviously not here, are they, Rachel? 
Marcus's voice was full of sarcasm. Rachel looked at him and shook her head as a frown formed. What are you on about? Lifting his head, Marcus pointed at his neck. Does this ring any bells? Maybe I just don't trust someone who cold cocks me and runs off. Maybe you made up the creatures to cover your ass when you got back. Undeterred by Marcus's shouting, Rachel matched his volume, stepping forward until she was just inches from his face. Fuck off, Marcus! I got us a vehicle, didn't I? Marcus didn't back down from Rachel's intimidating stance as she shouted back. The next time you pull a stunt like that, I swear it'll be the last time. I don't care what's going on. You'd better never jump me like that again. Rachel and Marcus stood silent for several seconds, staring unblinking into each other's eyes. Rachel made the first move to back down, taking a half step back and turning her head away. Fine. Her voice was quiet, though still prideful, with the slightest trace of regret. Stepping forward, David moved between Rachel and Marcus, pushing them gently apart as he went to examine the vehicle Rachel had brought. This? This looks like one of those old transport carts. Workers use them to haul machinery around through the tunnels, but... David reached under the seat of the transport cart and felt around, giving a quiet shout as he pulled out a small plastic container. Yes! It's still here! A final glance was exchanged between Marcus and Rachel before they moved up to see what David had found. Their expressions were equal parts anger and regret, with neither of them feeling completely comfortable with the other. Chapter 3 7.19 p.m., April 13th, 2038 Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims Leonard? They're gaining on us! Nancy tried to keep her voice calm, but the sight of several creatures chasing behind the APC caused her voice to rise in pitch. After their narrow escape from Samuel, Nancy and Leonard got turned around in the city as they tried to find their way west toward the Missouri River. The dark night, the confusing layout of the city, and the fact that they were both still chilled to the core had led them down more than one wrong turn. The APC was faster than the creatures, but the narrow city streets slowed the vehicle to a crawl. For a short while, Leonard had driven them east, only to quickly turn around at the first sight of glistening silver from the bodies of creatures ahead of them. Their about face wasn't fast enough to avoid detection, though, and they quickly picked up a dozen or so creatures, all of which were relentlessly pursuing the noisy vehicle. As one narrow street led into another, Leonard kept glancing to the left and right, hoping to spot a break in the buildings that would lead them back onto the main highway that they had used to originally enter the city. Seeing a chance, he braked hard, turning the wheel to the right before gunning the engine again. A collapsed building revealed that the highway Leonard and Nancy sought was merely a block away, with the most direct route being over and through the rubble in front of them. The impact of two creatures on the back of the APC sent the vehicle sliding several inches to the side and jostled Leonard and Nancy in their seats. Go, Leonard, go! Nancy screamed, partially out of surprise and partially out of fear of the creatures. The APC was well-armored enough that the creatures would have a tough time getting in, but hearing them claw and scrape at the vehicle was terrifying despite that fact. Leonard pushed the APC up and over the rubble, a smaller pile than the one he and Nancy had hidden in previously, but large enough that the APC struggled. The knobby tires bit into the chunks of brick and concrete, sending them flying back as the vehicle bounced back and forth, struggling to overcome the obstacle. Finally, after a few breathless moments, the APC tilted forward and slid down the other side of the collapsed building, knocking two cars off of the road along its way. Bouncing along a small service road where the collapsed building ended, the APC continued down a dirt slope, finally thudding to a halt in the middle of the highway that Leonard and Nancy had been searching for. As the rocking of the APC died down, Leonard and Nancy sat frozen in place, then slowly turned to look at each other. Huh. I guess that's one way to get down, eh? Nancy nodded, her eyes wide. Then she pointed back up the slope. You might want to get us moving again. 
The creatures that had been pursuing them were momentarily delayed by the rapid descent of the APC, but were already on the dirt slope themselves, running toward Leonard and Nancy. Gunning the engine, Leonard plowed through the center median and headed toward a clear stretch of road that was devoid of any obstacles. Now that they were back on a proper road, the creatures pursuing them quickly fell behind, giving up the chase and returning to their march to the east. Already near the western side of the city, it only took Leonard and Nancy a few minutes to reach the bridge. Leonard slowed the APC to a crawl before they reached the bridge proper, trying to judge whether or not it was safe to cross. The structure of the suspension bridge was still intact. It had been far enough away from the closest blast that it had received a minimum amount of damage, unlike other portions of the city. A few of its cables had snapped, and sections of the roadway had fallen into the river below, but it was the only choice Leonard and Nancy had for getting across the river without driving even farther off course. Ah, keep an eye out on your side and warn me if you see anything I need to avoid. We'll just take this nice and easy, and we'll be on the other side before you know it. Nancy's tight grip on the dashboard in front of her matched the panic in her voice as she stared over the side, watching reflections of lightning in the dark, distant waters below. Ah, uh, this is probably a bad time to tell you this, but I'm not all that great with heights. Leonard's bemused snort from the driver's seat went unnoticed by Nancy, and he chuckled softly. <laughs> a crazed cultist chasing us, an insane storm above, and mutated creatures roaming around, and you're worried about the bridge? Ignoring Leonard's comment, Nancy focused on the bridge and pavement, trying her best to keep her eyes off the waters below. Though the river wasn't very wide at the point where the bridge was located, sporadic and dramatic flooding had drastically eroded the banks over the last several years in many of the rivers in the region. Coupled with an increase in traffic, the state had paid for a series of suspension bridges to be built over the river that stretched far beyond the erosion. In the lighting provided by the storm overhead, Nancy could see that the water level was low in the river, far below any point it had been before. A sudden jostle from the APC pushed her face closer to the window, and she stifled a scream as a large chunk of asphalt dropped out from under the front right tire, plummeting down into the water. Leonard pulled the vehicle hard to the left, keeping the back tire from passing through the hole that was now in the bridge that increased their speed. Okay, so maybe this wasn't the best idea. Leonard expertly played with the steering wheel, avoiding downed suspension cables, missing pieces of road, and vehicles that were stuck in their path. A rumble from behind them made Nancy crane her head to see what was going on. As they were already more than halfway across the suspension bridge, Nancy could see quite clearly that a large piece of the central support of the bridge was unstable, and that the vibrations from the APC had dislodged it from its precarious position. Crashing downward and cutting through cables and asphalt like they were butter, the collapse of the support spilled doom for the bridge as a whole. Move, Leonard! Nancy grabbed Leonard's arm and squeezed tightly, looking ahead of them on both sides to watch the previously taut cables begin to snap. Flailing about like worms on the end of a hook, the cables carved through every obstacle in their path as their built-up tension was loosed in a fraction of a second. The road under the APC lurched and tilted to one side as Leonard struggled to keep the vehicle from sliding off what small section of the bridge remained. With a final push on the gas pedal, Leonard pushed the APC forward on the bridge just far enough that there was land below them instead of water. A steep slope rapidly approached as the bridge collapsed, carrying them down with it. Instead of landing in the river, though, the section of the bridge holding the APC landed neatly on the slope. Though Leonard couldn't see anything in front of him due to a large plume of dirt kicked up by the collapsing bridge, he kept the accelerator pinned to the floor. The slope was steep, but the APC's tires effortlessly gripped the cracked asphalt. Lit by lightning flashes as it slowly climbed to the top of the riverbank, the APC resembled a primordial creature rising from a swamp more than it did a vehicle. From across the river, on the east side to the north of the city, a man stood atop a smaller vehicle, his arms and chest wrapped in bandages and a pair of binoculars at his eyes. He saw the APC rise from the destruction of the bridge with a grim look on his face, watching it drive down the highway. 
visible for only a moment before it vanished into the darkness. Chapter 4 April 14th, 2038 Bering Strait Sitting in his room, Pavel Krylov slowly turns a tumbler on the table in front of him, watching the amber-colored liquid swirl inside. The smell of peat and oak fills the air of the small chamber, permeating into his clothing and bedding from the endless nights spent nursing glass after glass of the vintage liquor. Day after day of sitting at the bottom of the ocean without outside contact has worn on the acting commander of the Archangelisk, though his crew is suffering more than he. Rumors of an imminent mutiny have trickled down to Pavel, though nothing concrete has solidified yet. A man with little command experience, he knows that he has to make a move before his crew reaches a breaking point, but he is unsure what the move is to be. Final swirl of the glass comes before he tilts his head back, throwing the last of the amber liquid over his tongue. It coats his throat, burning the entire way down, leaving the taste of grass, dirt, peat, antiseptic, and oak lingering in his mouth and lungs. Exiting his room, Pavel begins his slow walk to the bridge. He taps on doors as he goes, motioning for his crew members to follow him. Those that are working at their stations are summoned by their comrades, curious about their leader's abrupt change of habit. For a full week, Pavel has barely left his room, exiting only to retrieve paperwork or visit the head. His uniform is disheveled and sweat-stained from hours of sitting in the same position. His short hair is curled and greasy at the ends. The Archangelisk's skeleton crew easily fits onto the spacious bridge of the vessel with more than enough room for everyone to spread out. Clusters of two and three men group together, whispering to each other to avoid being heard by the man seated in his chair before them. He looks each of them in the eyes, noting with some disappointment that few meet his gaze. Most turn away, looking instead at the floor or at their neighbors. The moments pass in agonizingly slow silence before Pavel speaks. His voice is clear, despite his drinking, and he speaks loudly. I am no fool, my brothers. I know what many of you are planning. A shuffle of feet comes from the groups around the bridge. Truth be told, I do not blame you. For weeks we have sat here under the ice, waiting to make our move, hoping that we would receive word from our superiors about what has happened to the world outside. Were I in your position, I think that I would not hesitate to rebel against the commander. Endless days of hopeless waiting have taken their toll on all of us. But I urge you to restrain yourselves. More shuffling of feet is accompanied by murmurs as Pavel continues. Our shipmates were taken from us by something unknown. Those who we knew well and those who we barely knew at all have all been stripped from us. Our constant line to our country, the lifeline that instructs us and keeps us whole, that is gone as well. Brothers, at this moment, the only things we have left are ourselves and our self-imposed order. If you... No, if we allow ourselves to have this last remnant of ourselves stripped away, it will surely be our undoing. A shout goes up from the opposite side of the room. Pavel cranes his head to see the speaker, but his view is blocked by monitors hanging from the ceiling. Me, what would you have us do? We've been sitting on the floor of this damned street for nearly two weeks, Commander. Pavel nods slowly waiting for the grumbles of agreement to subside in the men surrounding him. My comrades and my brothers, we must hold our course. Uh, but that does not mean that we shall not ready ourselves for whatever is out there. Pavel stands, slowly circling the room as he continues. Starting tomorrow morning, we will begin limited surface runs. We will maintain position within one kilometer inside the strait. Our goal will be to bring the Archangelisk back up to full operating power in preparation for a fast run back to our home. Excitement ripples through the men as they stand taller, 
invigorated by Pavel's speech. We will make this fast run only when I have deemed it safe, which will not be for some time. Our standing orders are still to hold position, and I will not break those orders, especially under these unusual circumstances. Pavel quickly cuts off the groans of disappointment from his men. However, as part of our preparations, I am authorizing limited target practice on the deck to be conducted in short intervals until we can determine the safety of our immediate surroundings. If we, comrades and brothers, are not prepared, then our ship is not prepared. We still know nothing of what has happened in the world, but it is time that we begin to search for the answers and prepare ourselves for whatever we find. Chapter 5, 8 p.m., April 13th, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. David clawed at the lid of the white plastic container, snapping it open and revealing the contents inside. A small device with an LCD screen sat in the center of the container along with two memory chips and a power cord that was tightly bundled up in one corner. Ignoring the device and its power cord, David removed the memory chips from the container and inserted them into his handheld computer. What are those, David? Rachel was intrigued by the contents of the container, which she had never seen before. David smiled broadly as he held up the computer showing Rachel and Marcus the progress bar as the computer read the data on the chips. Okay, <laughs> back when these tunnels were used for maintenance, the transport cars had tracking systems on them. And it gave the supervisors the ability to see where all the carts were at the same time. Holding up the small device from the plastic container with the screen on it, David continued. Fortunately for us, the tracking systems also had a dual purpose, providing workers with maps of the tunnels. Over time, as the tunnels were used less and less, the tracking systems and maps weren't needed, so they were stored on the carts in case of emergencies. David, why didn't you tell us about this before? David turned to Marcus, still smiling as he shrugged. <laughs> Sorry, but we didn't have a cart, and I didn't think about this until I saw Rachel driving it. It was a retiring worker who told me about them one day over lunch, and I forgot about it until now. So you're saying that this little device has maps of the entire tunnel system on it? Marcus held the small device in his hand. It was twice the size of a credit card, three times as thick, and only weighed a few ounces. David turned to the screen of his computer for Rachel and Marcus to see. Actually, the maps are here. Copied onto the device from the memory chips inside of the plastic container, the blueprints on David's computer now showed dozens of tunnels sneaking out from the laboratory complex. Tapping on a section at the bottom of the screen, David explained what they were looking at. Oh, we're here in this plant, and these are the five tunnels you see here. Uh, the three on the right go a long ways out under the city, including the one that Rachel went through. Uh, the two on the left, though, joined together in a quarter mile before sloping up toward the surface a few miles on. Looking up from the computer, David turned and faced the two tunnels he was talking about. These, then, are the way out. Rachel shifted nervously on her feet, keeping an eye on the tunnel she came from. Okay, let's uh, get moving, then. Those things were on me pretty close for a while, and they could be here any minute. Working in silence, Marcus and Rachel aligned the dolly in the transport cart, connecting them with several thick wires Marcus found coiled up under the passenger seat of the cart. Still sitting on top of Bertha, the strange woman didn't utter a sound except for the occasional wheezing breath as her seat was jostled around. Checking the status of Bertha and the charge on the electric cart, David climbed into the back seat, satisfied that everything was ready to go. Uh, we've got several more miles left on this charge, uh, more than enough to get us to the surface, I would think. Sitting in the driver's seat, Rachel waited until Marcus and Sam were positioned next to her before she flipped the cart's lights back on and slowly accelerated toward the leftmost tunnel. Which of these will get us there the fastest, David? Consulting the blueprints on his computer, David shook his head back and forth. Eh, it's hard to tell. They look to be about the same distance, roughly. Either one should be good. Why would they go in two separate directions just to join back together so quickly? 
Marcus turned in his seat to look at David, who zoomed out on his view of the blueprints. Uh, who knows? One of these tunnels might have been the original one I saw in the old set of blueprints, and maybe it wasn't structurally sound enough to bring equipment through. Uh, they look to be the same size from what I can tell, though, so we shouldn't have a problem either way. Between the headlights of the transport cart and the blue glow provided by the woman sitting atop Bertha, the tunnel was well lit, though the silence was eerie. A faint whine from the electric motor, Sam's panting, and the occasional squeak or thump from the dolly behind the cart were the only audible sounds in the tunnel. Rachel felt nervous at the silence, but with no sign of the creatures ahead or behind them, she started to slowly relax. Even with the large device pulled behind the cart, they could still drive fast enough to outrun the creatures, though moving faster would put a large amount of strain on the wires holding the dolly to the cart. The tunnel they were driving through was similar to the one Rachel had initially explored, with a few exceptions. The current tunnel was somewhat smaller and more dingy, having been built years before the other passageways. After passing by the intersection, the tunnel grew wider and taller, expanding out to the sides at regular intervals. In these expansions stood piles of old machinery, discarded years prior for more modern equipment. Skeletons of the ages past made the tunnel several times eerier, and in the sharp shadows cast by the cart's lights, Marcus could swear he saw movement shifting and jumping between and behind the equipment. Whispering to Rachel, he momentarily forgot about his anger at her as he tried to keep his voice calm. Are you seeing this stuff? Rachel glanced at him and nodded. It's nothing, though. Just a trick of the light. Rachel didn't sound too confident in her assessment of the shadows, but Marcus sat back in his seat, hugging Sam tightly as he tried to focus on the path ahead. The cart was moving fast enough that even if there was anything lurking in the tunnels, it wouldn't be able to catch them. Uh, we'll be to the surface exit soon, from the looks of it, David announced as they continued forward. Of course, Marcus thought, once we stop, that'll become a whole other matter. Chapter 6, 9.18 p.m., April 13th, 2038. Somewhere in North Dakota. Stuck on the opposite side of the river from his prey, Samuel spent a few minutes grinding his teeth in frustration before pulling out a map to examine his options. Forty miles upriver, far from most large cities, was another suspension bridge, along with a railroad bridge he could use to cross if the suspension bridge was unstable or completely out. Though the delay would cost him several hours in catching up with the intruders, Samuel forced himself to remain calm. Through nothing short of miracles, he had managed to keep track of the man and woman in their military vehicle, despite being far behind them for most of the pursuit. Any doubts that crept into his mind were immediately banished, replaced with the forced self-assurance that he would, without a doubt, catch his prey eventually. A few hours later, as Samuel approached the crossing he was looking for, a glimmer of light appeared on the horizon directly ahead. Breaking through the darkness and the cloud cover above, it grew larger as he drew closer, coalescing into a series of several lights. The lights glowed and flickered, betraying their sources as campfires and lanterns hung from posts driven into the ground. Near each post stood a house, most of which were untouched, though a few were missing shingles and had broken windows covered with boards. The lights in front of and inside the homes were bright enough to make out details even from a fair distance away, and Samuel slowed his vehicle to a crawl, analyzing the situation to decide what his next move would be. Having help to pursue the intruders would almost be too much to ask for, but when presented with an opportunity such as the one in front of him, Samuel wasn't the type to pass it up. Though it was late at night, the activity inside the houses was nearly instantaneous as Samuel laid on the horn of his vehicle. Shutters and doors flew open as men and women of all ages ran from their homes. Some clutched onto lanterns, holding them high as if that would somehow make the source of the noise visible. Others held brooms, baseball bats, and Samuel even spotted a few shotguns in the mix. With his engine off and his vehicle hidden near a convenient collection of bushes, Samuel walked forward toward the people collected in front of their homes. After a final check of the pistols tucked in holsters under his jacket, Samuel raised his hands halfway into the air as he walked forward into the light, 
smiling broadly at the people in front of him. Simpletons. Look at them all, standing there with their mouths open like they've never seen another person before. This will be far easier than I had hoped. Hello. Please don't hurt me. I really need help. Samuel tapped into the distant feelings of grief for his children as he spoke, giving his voice a soft and appealing tone. A practice speaker, Samuel was a master of manipulation, and the individuals gathered around their houses instantly lowered their makeshift weapons. Stepping forward, an older man greeted Samuel, putting his hand out. Oh, thank God, another survivor. Uh, we're sorry, we thought you were one of those things out there. Samuel took the man's hand and shook it firmly, noting with satisfaction that the man's voice trembled slightly when he spoke of the things out there. Oh, heavens no, those things, they're horrible. A few of the women in the group crowded around Samuel as he spoke, helping him to the nearest porch where he sat down, surrounded by everyone who had come outside. Samuel made a show of looking around at the people and their houses before continuing. Where, where am I? What is this place? The man who spoke to Samuel originally nodded proudly as he answered, Well, this good sir, uh, by the way, what is your name? Oh, I'm so sorry, uh, I'm Samuel. Well, Samuel, I'm Jonathan, and this is our home. We're a small community, one of the new seed communities started a few years back, and uh, I guess we got lucky, if you could call it that, when all of that nastiness went down a while back. You live here? Samuel exaggerated his incredulity, knowing full well that pockets of survivors could be nestled into small communities throughout the world. How have you survived? And what about those, uh, those things? Jonathan shook his head and sat down next to Samuel, speaking to the newly arrived stranger as he would a friend. It hasn't been easy, but we've made do, living off of our supplies and scrounging for what we can. Samuel saw an opening for him to start introducing the topic he wanted to discuss, and he jumped on it. Oh, well, gosh, if you need supplies, I can help you. My vehicle back there's got some stuff in it I took off those bandits that blew through my village a few days ago. A few gasps came from the men and women surrounding Samuel, and Jonathan put a hand on Samuel's back, raising an eye in concern. Bandits? You mean that people are out there raiding? Samuel said nothing, only nodding slowly for dramatic effect. Well, damn. As if we didn't have enough to worry about. I know. It's terrible. We have enough problems, and then people like that have to go and make things worse. I was actually chasing them down when my vehicle broke down just down the road there. Maybe if you can help me get it fixed, a couple of you folks can ride on it with me to hunt down these bandits and bring them to justice. Murmurs passed through the crowd, with the collective feeling being one of cautious negativity for the idea. Jonathan waited for the others to quiet down before he spoke. Well, Mr. Samuel, I'm sure we'd love to help, but if those bandits aren't on their way here, I'm not sure we can spare the men to help you. We can sure take a look at your vehicle and see about getting it fixed up, though. Bobby here has some parts left over from when he fixed up one of our cars to work. Maybe that'll get you on the road again. Samuel nodded and smiled while seething inwardly. He was wasting valuable time bantering with these people, and all the while Leonard and Nancy were getting farther and farther away. It was obvious from how the group was acting that they weren't interested in helping him on his mission, but they also weren't about to just let him go on his way. Each moment that Samuel spent off the road was another moment that the trail of his prey grew colder. Chapter 7 9.05 p.m., April 13th, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. The slope up to the surface turned out to be a steeper grade than Rachel had anticipated. It slowed the cart down to a crawl, forcing Marcus, David, and Sam to get out and walk to lessen the strain on the motor. The electric whine grew more high-pitched as the cart crept up the slope, the wheels slipping from time to time on the worn portions of the floor. Ahead of them, though, a few hundred feet away, stood another large metal door like the one they had to break through to get into the tunnel system in the first place. 
At the top of the slope, just in front of the door, was a flat spot no more than 15 feet long, barely enough room to park the cart in front of the door. Rachel had to force the cart into a corner at an angle to keep the heavy dolly from sliding backwards down the slope. A set of double doors were near the steel door, leading into a small storage room off of the tunnel, though the transport cart was too wide to fit through them. Jumping out of the cart, Rachel stepped next to Marcus and David, who were already examining the steel door. What's it look like? Same as the other one? Yep, same mechanism and everything. David looked back to the woman who was still atop Bertha. She hadn't moved or said anything in hours, and aside from the blue glow she gave off, it was easy to forget that she was even there. Marcus and Rachel followed David's gaze, watching the woman who stared straight ahead with empty eyes. Can she do it again? Marcus whispered to David and Rachel, though they were close enough to the woman that she could hear them quite clearly. If she did hear Marcus's question, she didn't respond. Uh, ex excuse me? Rachel stepped forward, speaking louder and directing her voice toward the woman. Uh, can you get this door open, like you did before? Rachel, no! Her memory! Marcus grabbed Rachel's arm to stop her, but he was too late. The woman looked down at them, tilting her head slightly as she replied. Did what before? Shit! Rachel hissed spinning around and beating her fist against the steel door in frustration. Asking the woman to recall something she had done before was, as they had learned, a trigger for her memory of the event to vanish. Whether the memory would come back on its own was up for debate, but for the moment, the woman couldn't help them with their dilemma. Marcus leaned back against the door. Oh, now what? The answer to Marcus's question came from an unexpected location and unwelcome form. A loud snarl filtered down from the tunnel behind the group, bouncing off of the hard walls and floors. Rachel immediately snatched up her rifle from the electric cart and took up a position next to Bertha, aiming her sights down the length of the sloping tunnel. With only a flashlight to pierce the darkness, she could see no more than a hundred feet from where they stood. No signs of movement were visible, but the snarls and growls continued to echo, growing louder every moment. Are you two ready for this? Rachel spoke to Marcus and David without looking over her shoulder. A nervous groan came from David while Marcus simply unholstered his pistol and took up a firing stance next to Rachel. Without warning, the mutated woman who had been sitting motionless on top of Bertha jumped off, landing noiselessly in front of Rachel and Marcus. Rachel shifted her aim to the woman momentarily, afraid that Mr. Doe was once again in control. The woman made no movement toward Rachel and Marcus, but merely looked down the tunnel in the direction of the noises. David? Get working on that door. Rachel spoke softly to David, who peeked out from behind the front of the cart where he was hiding. I don't care what it takes. Just get it open before this situation gets any worse. David rose hesitantly and went to the door, trying to find any way to activate the panel that was mounted on the wall nearby. The mutated woman had overridden the panel on the previous door before David had even had a chance to look it over. He wasn't about to open this door in the same way that the woman opened the last one, but there were still a few things he could try. David pulled out his handheld computer from his jacket pocket and turned on the screen, intending to try and connect it to the panel via a short cable. When the screen of the device flickered to life, though, a red flashing icon at the top of the screen was the last thing he had expected to see. He stared at the icon for a few seconds before tapping on it, bringing up a new window with long rows of text. Turning to Rachel, he held the computer out, completely forgetting about the door. He yelled at her, startling her and making her turn to face him. Rachel! What? What's going- <gasps> Rachel's face paled as she saw the handheld screen just a few feet away. David's next statement confirmed her fear and made Marcus's stomach turn as he listened. There's a high bandwidth signal that just started coming from her. David pointed at the mutated woman, who still hadn't moved. She's sending a lot of data out and getting some back as well. From the amount of information going back and forth, there's no other answer. It has to be Doe. Chapter 8. Undisclosed Location Mr. Doe watches as images roll across his monitor, 
bits of data streaming in from the people his swarms have taken over. The signal to the swarms is weak and intermittent, with some not sending any data and not responding to any commands either. He rubs his eyes as he watches the monitor, sipping on a cup of coffee to keep himself awake. Two days without any sleep or rest is taking its toll on his body, but he refuses to allow any distractions to keep him from monitoring the situation. Six of the mutants are already gone, along with their swarms. It is a loss he considers to be unacceptable, but there was no way to prevent it when the device was activated. Fortunately, half of the twelve mutants confirmed to be under his control were in a shielded area when the pulse was activated, providing them with enough protection that they survived unscathed. Besides receiving data from the remaining core swarms, Mr. Doe also receives periodic bits and pieces of information from swarms that weren't as successful in taking control of their host. Many individuals received too small of a swarm when they were infected, resulting in a mutation without control. Unable to pinpoint exactly where they are, these individuals are liabilities more than they are assets, since they retain enough control over themselves to cause problems. A notification appears on the monitor to indicate that a new data source has been located. The computer systems automatically connect to the source, swap security codes, and begin the data transfer. Images of a brightly lit corridor emerge, bathed not only in a blue glow, but in a white one as well. Mr. Doe straightens up in his seat and pauses the automatic image display, his coffee forgotten. He goes through each incoming image slowly, trying to discern the environment they are coming from. A large steel door, a tunnel, three people, movement, and then a view of a long stretch of empty corridor follow each other in succession. Mr. Doe pushes for more data from the source, sending new commands to the swarm to order more detailed information to be sent back. As the command set is pushed out to the swarm, the data stream suddenly freezes. Mr. Doe pulls his hands back from the keyboard, wondering for half a second if, in his exhaustion, he sent the wrong commands. A quick check shows that he is not at fault, and he frantically begins to try and fix the communications problem. Despite his best efforts, his attempt to regain control over the swarm fails. Frustrated, he takes his half-empty cup of coffee and throws it against the far wall, not flinching as the hot liquid and shards of ceramic spill across the room. He presses his hand against his eyes, gently massaging them as he tries to come up with a new course of action. Despite the events at the laboratory, the AI achieving self-awareness and the world-ending disaster that followed, Mr. Doe has, in his mind at least, maintained some semblance of control over some events in the world. Losing his grip on everything, including his own swarms, though, is a turn of events he never anticipated. Caused by unforeseen problems with the swarm's programming and AI restrictions, not all swarms successfully bound to their hosts, as he is now painfully aware. Those swarms that did successfully bind to their hosts are fully integrated and have complete control, but those that didn't are another matter entirely. Caught between life and death, the swarms inside the failed bindings serve as life-givers to their hosts, keeping their bodies and minds alive, if only barely. Sighing deeply, Mr. Doe turns back to his monitor and goes back through the images sent by the swarm he lost contact with. No audio or video was sent, but data like atmospheric pressure, altitude, and general location is included with each image. Mr. Doe stops the image display at the one showing three individuals standing near a large steel door. The individuals are blurred and distorted in the image, but as Mr. Doe stares at the area around them, he has a flash of insight. The steel door they are standing before is one of just a few in a complex of underground tunnels near the laboratory, and this revelation gives him a short list of locations where the individuals might be. The next image in the display shows a large object obscuring the door and individuals, nearly featureless, except for a small amount of lettering in one corner. Like the individuals, part of the lettering is blurred, but enough of it is visible that Mr. Doe knows what it represents. They have it. His statement is matter-of-fact and devoid of emotion. His outburst gone, he draws upon his last remaining fragments of energy to carry out his next task. 
Creating a new set of tasks, he sends out a repeating broadcast to the six remaining swarms he knows he still has full control over. With the transmissions being interrupted as much as they are, he hopes that the swarms receive the commands before it is too late. With a last, lingering look at the monitor, Mr. Doe stands from his chair and walks to his bed. With nothing else he can do but wait, he rests. Chapter 9 11.34 p.m. April 13th, 2038 Somewhere in North Dakota Samuel arrived at his vehicle ahead of the two men who came out to help him repair it. Though it was functioning normally, he quickly leaned down over the engine and pulled out several wires that ran from the front controls to the back. Standing up, he pointed down at the engine as he looked at Jonathan and Henry, one of Jonathan's teenage sons who had come with him to help fix Samuel's vehicle. It was running along okay. Then I hit a rock and oh, the engine just died. Flashlight in hand, Henry pointed it at the engine while his father leaned down to try and find the problem. Samuel stood a few feet behind them, toying nervously with the pistols under his jacket. Jonathan mumbled under his breath as he fiddled with the engine until he finally spotted the loose wires dangling underneath. Leaning to the side, he motioned Samuel over. I see these. That's probably your problem right there. All the controls were disabled along with the electric. He arched an eyebrow at Samuel. Must have been quite the big rock you hit to do all of this. Samuel laughed nervously, trying to keep his hands down at his sides instead of feeling his pistols. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought I heard something break on the engine. I guess this was it. Jonathan met Samuel's gaze for a moment, then nodded slowly. It shouldn't be hard to fix. Just a few seconds or so. Uh, Henry, do me a favor and go grab my toolbox from the house, please. Henry nodded, handing his flashlight to Samuel and then ran dutifully back to the collection of houses to retrieve the requested tools. As soon as he was out of earshot, Jonathan stood up, his back to Samuel. She should be all fixed up for you. Samuel took a step forward to examine the engine when Jonathan whipped around, a small flash of silver shining in his right hand. He held up a small revolver and pointed it directly at Samuel's head. When he spoke, his tone was low and gravelly. Who the hell are you, and what do you want with us? Samuel slowly raised his hands, putting them at chest level instead of over his head, well within reach of his pistols. Whoa, what's going on? I thought you were going to help me. He let the flashlight fall to the ground with a tumble, and it rolled a few feet, stopping against a rock and partially lighting the area where he and Jonathan were standing. Jonathan took a half step forward and cocked the hammer on the revolver, cycling the chamber with a deathly click. You can take us for fools all you'd like, but with your electric wires pulled, how do you expect the horn to work? Samuel stood still for a few seconds with a scared expression before finally relenting. He dropped his hands and shook his head slowly as he stared at the ground. Looks like I forgot about that. Jonathan shook the revolver slightly as he demanded answers from Samuel yet again. I won't ask you a third time. Who are you and what do you want with us? The bravery projected by Jonathan was no match for the raw skill possessed by Samuel. Jonathan may have had the drop on Samuel, but he didn't have the years of experience that Samuel did, honed by thousands of hours of practice in dealing with escalations and conflicts of all types. Such practice not only resulted in incredibly fast reflexes, but a methodical way of dealing with opponents that was purely mechanical and logical, with no trace of emotion. Whipping his head to the side, he brought his hands up from his waist and twisted the revolver, blinking as it went off, the shot missing his skull by several inches. Caught off guard by the sudden movement, Jonathan didn't have a firm grip on the revolver, which was launched out of his hand and into the darkness beyond the view of the flashlight. Bones snapped in Jonathan's hand as three of his fingers broke under the pressure of Samuel's twisting grip, and he doubled over as Samuel delivered a kick to his abdomen. Without wasting a second, Samuel pulled out a pistol with his right hand and aimed carefully at Jonathan's back, firing two shots. The shots passed through both of Jonathan's shoulders, missing the vital organs but thoroughly disabling him. 
A shout went up from the houses seconds after the shots were fired, but Samuel ignored them. Picking up the flashlight, he leaned down to the engine and checked the wires. Despite Jonathan's suspicions, he had fixed the vehicle as he had said, and Samuel wasted no time in jumping in the driver's seat. Before he started up the engine, a figure burst through the bushes behind the vehicle and shouted at him. Hey, what happened here? What the? Uh, Dad? Dad! Henry had been the closest to the vehicle when his father was shot, and he had dropped the toolbox, running headlong through the grass and bushes until he reached the glow of the flashlight. Samuel threw the flashlight out on the ground and started the engine, revving it a few quick times before pulling away in a plume of dirt and dust. Henry covered his eyes and coughed from the dust cloud as he leaned down over his father, checking the wounds that were bleeding copiously over the ground. Designed to disable, not kill, Samuel chose the option that he hoped would mean getting the least amount of blowback from the individuals living in the houses with Jonathan. While he had briefly contemplated killing the man, doing so could have easily caused those around him to devote all of their resources to tracking Samuel down. Maiming Jonathan in such an obvious manner sent a message instead. Don't mess with me. Samuel continued driving, passing over the nearby bridge and heading west, pursuing Leonard and Nancy. His only regret over trying to recruit others in his quest to chase down the demon bringers was that he had lost valuable time that would have been better spent chasing the intruders on his own. The Lord helps those who help themselves. I suppose there's some truth to that after all. Chapter 10, 9.40 p.m., April 13th, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. The mutated woman standing in front of David, Marcus, and Rachel twitched suddenly and violently. As her body spasmed, she tore at her scalp, her sharp nails digging through the skin and shrieking against the strips of metal underneath. Rachel leveled her rifle at the woman's head preparing to pull the trigger when David shouted again, his eyes glued to his handheld computer. Wait a second, uh, the signal's dropping out. David looked at the woman who was still tearing at her scalp, scraping away the remaining pieces of skin to reveal a nearly solid layer of the silver metal covering her skull. She must be fighting against it. David, we don't have time for this. If she gets anything more to dough, we're screwed. Rachel's finger hovered over the trigger of her rifle and she began to slowly squeeze, feeling the cool metal slowly retreating under the force. It's gone. The signal's totally gone now. David's last shout came just as Rachel squeezed the trigger far enough to engage the firing pin, which occurred half a second after the woman turned around and stepped to the side. A bullet flew past her, inches from her face, and Rachel gasped in surprise, taking her finger off the trigger as the woman spoke. They are coming. Seemingly in full control of her faculties, the woman turned back around and sprinted down the corridor, heading down in the direction of the snarls. Minutes ticked past slowly, stretching out into what felt like hours until the woman reappeared, running silently back to the group. They are coming. Prepare quickly. The woman's voice was no more urgent than it had been a few minutes prior, despite the imminent threat that was on the group's doorstep. Marcus and Rachel looked back at David, and Marcus yelled, foregoing any semblance of stealth. Uh, find a way to get through that damn door! We'll hold them off! Marcus knelt down a few feet away from Rachel and looked at her. The two of them exchanged a quick nod before they turned their eyes forward, keeping a careful watch on the darkness of the corridor. Their previous disagreement had fallen by the wayside in the face of the new danger that threatened to consume them, right as they were on the verge of escaping from the tunnels. Behind them, the mutated woman stood still, her empty eyes directed outward. The snarls and growls echoed louder as the creatures drew nearer. Back at the steel door, David connected his handheld computer to the door control, trying to give it enough power to function. Although the connection was confirmed by the computer as active, the door panel flickered only once before fading out. Its electronics had either been fried or there wasn't enough power being supplied by the computer the battery of which was beginning to run low. David held his head in his hands, pulling at his hair in frustration. The mutated woman showed zero interest in opening the door. A pack of mutated creatures, courtesy of Mr. Doe, was nearly upon them, 
and David had no idea how to open the only way out of the tunnels. Before leaving his lab and meeting up with Rachel and Marcus at the room where Bertha was stored, David had brought as much equipment as he could carry in a duffel bag from his laboratory. Emptying out the storage cupboard where he had kept a laptop, handheld computers, and memory cards safe from Bertha's discharge, David had plenty of working electronic resources. Unfortunately, none of it would power up the door's panel for long enough to unlock the bolts that held the door in place. Picking through his bag in desperation, David's hand brushed against a small steel box, cold to the touch and foreign to him. Initially wondering what it was, he took it out of his bag and held it up, a look of shock on his face when he saw it in the glow of the transport cart's lights. A black box, roughly six inches square on each side and three inches deep, it had two small connectors at the back with inch-long wires hanging from each. The box had been the last security device that David and Rachel had labored over for hours to get off Bertha so that they could move the EMP generator out of its storage room. Without thinking much of it, David had slipped the black box into his bag, wondering if it might come in handy later, though he'd promptly forgotten about it. Though the box was virtually featureless, it was not without function. The two small connectors on the back of the device had plugged directly into Bertha, and disconnecting them without triggering the box was not an easy task. This was due in no small part to the fact that, if the device had been removed improperly, it would have been activated. The activation of the black box would have triggered the tightly packed plastic explosives in its interior. Highly lethal, the explosives inside the box were enough to completely destroy Bertha, acting as a last line of defense against theft or potential misuse. A David glanced at the steel door and the transport cart just a few feet from it. The tunnel near the door was narrow, with no safe place to hide the transport cart should David carry out the plan he was still formulating. The sound of the creatures still echoed up from the tunnel, though there was no sight of them yet. Making his decision, David threw his duffel bag back into the transport cart and opened the cart's motor compartment, searching for a pair of wires leading to the rear brake lights. Pulling them out, he bit into the ends with his teeth, stripping away the insulation on both wires and revealing the bare metal underneath. Rachel and Marcus were still kneeling several feet away along with the mutated woman, and David shouted at them holding the box aloft. Rachel, I've got it! Rachel turned to look at David and her eyes widened upon seeing the box. David pointed at the double doors on the side of the tunnel and shouted again. We need to get Bertha in there, now! David, the cart won't fit! I'd rather take my chances without it than get pinned down in here, wouldn't you? Rachel hesitated for a second and then nodded. Marcus, keep watch. I'm with David. Rachel handed her rifle to Marcus, who dropped his pistol at his feet and raised the more powerful weapon to his shoulder. Behind him, Rachel ran to David's side, who had set the black box near the steel door and was already beginning to unhook Bertha's dolly from the back of the transport cart. Rachel helped them finish the task, and they both pushed on the dolly, moving the heavy load toward the nearby storage room. A relatively small area, the storage room was just wide enough to accommodate Bertha, along with the group's various bags and backpacks. Rachel whistled for Sam, who hurried into the room and obediently laid down at the very back. David rushed back to the cart and pulled it around so that the rear end was just inches from the steel door, then hopped out and began searching for the best location to place the black box. A burst of gunfire sent Rachel hurrying back to Marcus who pointed at a blue glow ascending the slope toward them. Uh, two of them, down there. I think I winged one, though. From behind Rachel and Marcus, the strange woman stepped forward and stood between them. The blue illumination down in the tunnel was stationary, though Rachel and Marcus could hear the creatures so clearly that it seemed like they were just feet away. I'm ready back here! With the black box hanging precariously in the center of the steel door's two massive hinges, one wire was already connected to it, and the other was in David's hand. He looked expectantly at Rachel and Marcus, who turned and moved toward him. Come on, we need to take cover! Marcus called for the woman to follow them back to the storage room, but she stood her ground, ignoring his pleas. The snarl of the nearby creatures became suddenly louder as two of them appeared from out of the darkness, dodging back and forth as they ran up through the tunnel 
trying to avoid any further shots. One of the creatures had large impact wounds in its shoulder from Marcus's earlier shots, though it didn't act like it was injured in any way. Still facing in the direction of the tunnel, Marcus fired from the hip, sending several bullets streaking wide past the creatures, but still managing to hit one. The shots did absolutely nothing to slow the creatures, though, which continued forward at a breakneck pace. Though the creatures seemed not to notice the woman standing before them, it was clear that she noticed them, especially when she crouched down and spread her arms. As the creatures tried to run past her, she snagged both of them on a leg, causing them to fall toward each other with a sickening sound as their heads collided. The impact stunned the creatures for only a few seconds, and they were quickly back on their feet. This time, though, their attention was directed solely at the strange woman, who faced them calmly. Next to the creature's snarls and rage, her expression was peaceful and serene. Lunging at the woman, the creatures threw her to the ground, tearing at her viciously as Marcus and Rachel fired upon them, trying to stop them before they ripped the woman apart. Chapter 11, 10.08 p.m., April 13th, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. Standing inside a small gas station on the edge of the highway, Nancy held a light over Leonard's shoulder as he ransacked a drink refrigerator, removing every bottle of water he could find. Rushing along, he dumped the bottles into the now-empty shopping cart he'd taken from the back of the APC. After escaping over the bridge, Nancy and Leonard had driven hard and fast until they'd come across the gas station. Wanting to get more fuel and water, Leonard had started siphoning diesel from a nearby truck while Nancy had emptied out the shopping cart and arranged the supplies in the back of the APC. Taking the cart inside the gas station while the APC's fuel tank filled, Leonard and Nancy scoured the place for all the supplies they could find. In addition to a few canned goods, some snacks, and plenty of water, Leonard found both a shotgun and a revolver hidden under the checkout counter. Their lack of weapons made the discovery one for celebration, and Leonard quickly hurried both guns back to the APC for safekeeping before continuing to gather supplies. After the cart was full, Nancy and Leonard both pushed it back to the APC and loaded in the supplies, using plastic crates from the gas station to organize and keep them from shifting them around. After the cart was full, Nancy and Leonard both pushed it back to the APC and loaded in the supplies, using plastic crates from the gas station to organize and keep them from shifting around while the vehicle was in motion. Out of breath from exertion, the pair sat on the back bumper of the armored car, watching the dark clouds drift past overhead. Pinpoints of light broke through the last wisps of cloud cover as the stars came out, shining bright in all their glory. Enough of the upper atmosphere's dust cover from the nuclear explosions had been cleansed by the nanobots to offer a spectacular view. I wonder what's causing those storms. Nancy spoke quietly as a gentle breeze followed after the clouds, making her shiver in the sudden cold air. Leonard reached into the APC and pulled out a heavy jacket, tearing the store tags off before helping Nancy put it on. Uh, nothing good, that's for sure. That's the second one that's followed an army of muties, though. It's pretty clear that they're more than coincidentally linked. So, where do we go from here? As much as Nancy liked stopping and taking a break, doing so made her nervous with Samuel in the general vicinity. Keeping their light usage to a minimum, Leonard and Nancy hadn't seen any sign of him, but they knew he was still somewhere in the area. Leonard pulled a map from his jacket pocket and motioned for Nancy to follow him back inside the gas station, where they could use a flashlight without being spotted as easily as if they were sitting in the APC. Inside, spread out on the checkout clerk's counter, Leonard held the flashlight in one hand and pointed at the map with the other. Well, we're about here, from what I can tell. Leonard pointed to a spot on the highway halfway between the river and a large swath of green. Uh, next up is the National Forest, and if we keep going, we'll dip south for a ways into the middle of Montana. Nancy furrowed her brow. South doesn't sound good. Leonard squinted at the map and traced two paths that ran roughly parallel to each other, one to the north and one to the south. Uh, here's what I'm thinking. 
We take this route up before we hit the forest, then take this path to the west. That'll lead us straight to this next major highway, uh, number 16. And from there, we can head straight up through the border. From there, we'll hit Lethbridge, then Calgary, and then we'll cut west through the mountains and head northwest until we hit Alaska. Looking at the scale of the map, Nancy whistled softly. <whistles> That's going to be one hell of a drive. Leonard nodded and sighed deeply. <sighs> yes, it is. But that's the only way we've got to get up there. I don't suppose you've traveled up there before, have you? Leonard shook his head. Nope. Have you? No. Well, then. Leonard straightened his back, smiling as he folded the map back up and handed it to Nancy. It looks like we'll have quite the adventure ahead of us. Nancy took the map and slowly followed Leonard back to the APC. And what happens when we run into Samuel again? Leonard stopped and turned to look at Nancy before he spoke. If he's lucky, we'll lose him before we hit the border and we'll never see him again. If he's not lucky, though, he'll run into us again. And if that happens, we'll put him in the ground. Chapter 12, April 15th, 2038 Bering Strait Seaman Dmitri Dudchik stands on the deck of the Archangelisk, rifle in hand as he tries to slow his heart rate. A fierce wind blows across the strait, nearly knocking several of his comrades off the deck until they find better footing. Standing straight with the barrel of his rifle waving slightly in the wind, Dmitri tries to center the sight on a target several hundred meters away. Floating in the water, bobbing up and down with the waves, an orange buoy was towed out and is used for target practice. The sharp crack of the rifle makes Dimitri wince, and he feels a pain in his shoulder the instant he pulls the trigger. Missing the target by several meters, the bullet splashes harmlessly into the ocean, causing a small spray of water that disappears as quickly as it appeared. Acting commander of the Archangelisk, Pavel Krylov, walks up next to Dimitri and takes hold of the rifle pushing it hard against Dmitri's injured shoulder. You must keep the butt firmly against your shoulder, or else you'll break something. And remember, squeeze the trigger. Don't pull it. Treat it gently. Don't be rough. Now, try again. Slightly intimidated by the superior officer, Dmitri nods quickly, takes a deep breath, and presses his cheek against the stock of his rifle. Though Dmitri had gone through the standard firearms training during his time at the Naval Academy, his knowledge, like most of the other soldiers, was rusty. Taking Pavel's advice, he squeezes the trigger gently, keeping his breathing steady and pulling the rifle tightly against his shoulder. This time, his shot is nearly spot on, landing on the outer edge of the buoy and causing it to shake in the water. Good shot! Pavel slaps Dmitri on the back, smiling broadly at the young man. You'll be a fine sniper in no time. Leaving Dmitri to continue his practice, Pavel walks further down the deck, giving advice and words of encouragement to the other men who are suffering from the same lack of training and practice as Dmitri. After an hour of standing in the cold, Pavel spies a cloud on the horizon, moving in from the east. It is silver in color, moving against the wind and generates a loud buzzing sound that was described to him by the survivors who went ashore. Three men had survived the mysterious attack that claimed the life of Commander Alexiev. Once back on the Archangelisk, Pavel had interrogated each one separately, grilling them on the details of the incident. Having caught only glimpses of the commander's death, they all told the same story, mostly centered around the sounds of the commander being torn to shreds by a buzzing silver cloud. Although they were too young and inexperienced to know how to coordinate such an elaborate lie, Pavel wouldn't have believed them if he hadn't heard what both the commander and the second shore party described to him before perishing. Everyone, back down, now! Pavel bellows out the order, and the men on the ship rapidly descend through staircases on the deck of the Archangelisk. Once all the men are back inside, Pavel orders the hatches to be sealed. He waits until the last possible second to duck into the stairwell, keeping his eye on the cloud that is still moving rapidly toward them. 
Issuing an order to dive to the maximum depth of the strait, Pavel holds on to a nearby handrail as the sub lurches forward, the ballast tanks flooding with water. As the Archangelisk steadies, he runs along the corridor to the command deck, approaching the sensor station where two crew members have donned headphones and are listening intently. Anything yet? The crew member on the left lifts his headphones off and nods. Yes, sir. Uh, audio is picking up some type of mechanical vibrations over the water, and we're reading a strong electromagnetic signature directly above us. Pavel wipes his brow and shrugs off his heavy overcoat, passing it off to a nearby crew member. The air inside the submarine is warm, courtesy of the nuclear reactors that run continuously, generating enough electricity to power a large city. Watching the screens in front of the crew members, Pavel taps on the monitor. So it's a machine, then? You're certain? The two crew members look at each other, pausing briefly before the man on the left speaks again. Well, sir, we're not entirely sure. It's definitely a machine, but these readings are, are odd. It, it, it could be a single unit, or... The man trails off. Or what? Come on, we don't have time for games. Sir, it almost seems like this is uh, some type of swarm. A huge collection of robotic mechanisms all working together, individually small in size, but banded together on a massive scale. Pavel's first reaction is to laugh, but he stops himself. Despite the absurdity of the claim, what he has just been told isn't the most unusual thing he's heard since walking onto the sub. Straightening up, he pats both crew members on their backs. Good work. Continue scanning and alert me to the position of the thing every five minutes. Turning around, Pavel walks back to his chair, issuing an order as he sits down. Dive, officer. Keep us at maximum depth. We'll stay here until that thing up top decides to go away. With no solid information on the cloud lurking just above the water's surface, Pavel contemplates his next move. The information given to him by the survivors of the shore parties is so limited that he begins to wonder how they will gather more intel. Time passes slowly for the Archangelisk, submerged beneath the frigid waters, far enough down that the circling nanobot swarm above does not have the power nor the numbers to try and reach it. Still, they circle lazily overhead, drawing energy from the sunlight above and the few stray radiation particles left in the atmosphere, waiting for a time to strike. Chapter 13, 10.01 p.m., April 13th, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. The two creatures attacking the mutated woman stood no chance against the combined onslaught of Rachel and Marcus, along with the woman herself, who fought back fiercely against her attackers. In the back of his mind, as he unleashed round after round into the bodies of the attacking creatures, Marcus marveled at the woman and how strong she was despite the apparent frailty of her body. One after the other, the two creatures dropped to the ground, but the brief respite given to the mutated woman did not last. Four more creatures bounded up from the tunnel, two of them snatching the woman by her arms and dragging her away and out of sight. With their targets no longer in view, both Rachel and Marcus ran forward to try and reacquire them, but the creature's hasty retreat meant they were far out of range down the long slope of the tunnel. Shit! Rachel screamed in frustration. Marcus hesitated to continue down the tunnel, unsure if they would be able to help the woman even if they managed to reach her. The glow from the creatures and the woman had all but vanished, which was unsurprising given the creature's unnatural speed. We need to go after her! As the words left his mouth, a howl came from the tunnel. Marcus watched as a blue light rapidly filled the tunnel, signaling the imminent reappearance of the creatures. No time! We need to go! Now! Rachel grabbed Marcus's arm in a vice-like grip and pulled him back, even as he struggled against her. Leaving the woman, despite her condition, wasn't something Marcus was prepared to do. Kicking and fighting against Rachel... Marcus nearly freed himself until David ran up and took Marcus's other arm, helping Rachel pull him to safety. There's nothing we can do for her, Marcus! David shouted in Marcus's ear, trying to make himself heard over the din of the creature's howling. 
We need to get out of here now. Something in Marcus's mind clicked into place, and he went limp, allowing himself to be dragged back into the storage room where Rachel helped him sit down on the floor. His expression was blank as he stared at the wall, still holding the rifle in a death grip, wondering what he could have done differently to save the woman. She had appeared nearly as quickly as she vanished, a lost soul, changed irrevocably by Mr. Doe's influence and doomed by the same influence to a death too horrible to imagine. Whether she was killed or fully turned into one of the creatures, Marcus didn't know, but in the end, it didn't matter. Stay here! David's scream echoed through the storage room, cutting across Marcus's thoughts and bringing him back to the present. This'll have a five-second delay, so get ready to pull the door shut after me. Rachel watched David carefully as he ran back to the cart and grabbed the dangling wire, holding it close to the black box. The glow of blue light in the tunnel was overwhelmingly bright, and the creatures were nearly at the top of the slope when David jammed the wire into the black box, completing the circuit and initiating the detonation sequence of the explosives inside. Leaving the box hanging on the steel door, David used his hand to push himself forward, sprinting toward the storage room as quickly as possible and closing the doors behind him. There was no warning before the box detonated. No beeping, no countdown, no flashing lights, and no hint that anything had changed. In one instant, the box was hanging near the steel door, swinging gently back and forth, and the next moment, the tunnel was engulfed in flames. The doors to the storage room bent and buckled under the force of the explosion, though they were sturdy enough that they didn't completely fall apart. Outside, shielded from the view of David, Rachel, Marcus, and Sam, the tunnel was awash in flames. The concussive blast from the explosion sent the electric cart careening down the tunnel, obliterating everything in its path. Two of the four remaining creatures in the tunnel were instantly cut down by the cart and shrapnel from the steel door, while the other two were blown back down the slope by the force of the blast. Though they were spared from the brunt of the explosion's deadly results, they were not left unharmed, as their bodies were littered with injuries both minor and serious. The steel door was strong, but it was no match for the high-density explosives. Placed at the weakest point, the explosives tore through the hinges like tissue paper, rendering the entire door and frame around it unstable. Large pieces of steel were blown forward into the space beyond the tunnel, while other pieces were thrown backwards down the tunnel or into the surrounding walls. The group huddled together in a corner of the storage room, covering their heads and hoping that the explosion and debris would not penetrate far enough to harm them. The noise and light shining through cracks in the storage room doors lasted for just a few seconds, but the sound of creaking metal and falling concrete continued for several more minutes. Accompanying the ominous sounds was a rapid rise in temperature. Though it didn't reach lethal levels, it was enough to start making them uncomfortable. Smoke filtered in through the cracks in the door, slowly filling the room and making breathing more difficult. As it became harder to see by the light of the fire, Rachel stood and moved to the doorway. She held her hand a few inches from its surface, feeling the warmth given off by the metal that was exposed to the high heat from the explosion. Though the door was rapidly cooling, it was still too hot to touch without protection. Using David's lab coat, they quickly swung it open, kicking it several times to overcome the bent sections that were preventing it from opening fully. We need to get out of the tunnel, now! Marcus took a step outside the storage room and shouted back at Rachel and David, who were already starting to get Bertha's dolly moving. Outside in the tunnel, the fires caused by the explosion generated smoke, which filled the air and billowed in waves into the storage room. A small section of the steel door still remained, but enough of it had been destroyed to allow for Bertha to be moved through. What about the... her? The question, coming from David, was surprising, given his previous attitude toward the mutated woman. Coughing heavily, Rachel shook her head as she responded. <coughs> <laughs> she's long gone, David. <laughs> Even if she's down there, we can't get to her. Marcus wanted to argue with Rachel, but knew that she was right. The smoke was growing thicker by the second, making the certainty of their escape seem less likely the longer they delayed. After ordering Sam to stay close behind them, Marcus got behind Bertha and helped push, 
rolling the heavy equipment over the cracked and rubble-strewn floor. As they passed through the threshold where the large steel door had previously stood, the smoke suddenly lessened. Up a slight incline, no steeper than a few degrees, a pale stream of moonlight shone down on them, revealing the first sight of the outside world any of them had seen in days. A smaller explosion, marking the violent end of the electric cart's batteries, came from down in the tunnel. Push faster! David spurred them on. All of them, including Sam, were exhausted, but they dutifully increased their efforts, pushing the dolly up the slight incline toward the freedom they all sought. Though it only took a few minutes to reach the top of the hundred-foot-high ramp, it felt much longer, especially with the acrid smoke rising lazily into the air behind them. Once they finally reached the top, the entire group sank to the ground, gasping for breath and coughing to try to clear their lungs. After sitting for a few moments and staring at the ground, Marcus, Rachel, and David began to look around in an attempt to figure out where they were. Surrounded on all sides by towering buildings, they were still well within Washington, but in the darkness it was difficult to tell precisely where. Consulting his handheld computer, David made his best guess. Uh, if you're parked directly in the ruins of the lab complex, then that should be just a few blocks in, uh, that direction. David pointed off to one side, then at a small street nearby. Uh, this street should join up with the main road that goes in front of the lab. Standing up and shifting the duffel bag on his shoulders, David looked down at Marcus and Rachel. We should really try to get Bertha back to your vehicle before we rest. I don't know about you two, but I'm not all that interested in sleeping out here tonight. Tired, but in complete agreement with David, Marcus and Rachel stood slowly and began to move the dolly once again. Going over the rough terrain was not an easy task, but between them working together and the ruggedness of the dolly, they made steady progress, drawing ever closer to the safety of the armored vehicle. Chapter 14 11 a.m., April 14th, 2038. Somewhere in Montana. Out from under the black cloud cover, Samuel felt renewed, refreshed, and invigorated. The plains that Samuel had been traveling on were gradually giving way to the more mountainous regions which, while more pleasing to the eye, were making it harder to track his prey. After crossing over the river, Samuel had picked up Leonard and Nancy's trail in the morning by following patches of rubber where they had braked too hard, or looking for spots where the APC had been forced to go off the road. As shallow hills and rocks became more commonplace than grass and dirt, signs that the APC had passed through the area became more difficult to find. Studying his compass and a map, Samuel traced out the route that Leonard and Nancy had taken since they first entered the village. In addition to traveling west, they were also traveling north, though Leonard had said that he and Nancy's ultimate destination was the west coast to try and find my wife's family. Their path to the northwest told a different story. Going on the assumption that most of what Leonard and Nancy had said was, at best, misleading, Samuel figured that not only were they not married, but they weren't heading for the west coast either. Continuing on a general northwesterly direction would take them into Canada before too long, but heavily populated areas in the northwestern sections of Canada were few and far between. Where are you going? Samuel puzzled over the map stretched over the front of his vehicle. Traveling to Canada made no sense to him until he unfolded one more piece of the map. Staring at the swath of Alaska, he suddenly began to wonder if their goal was in that state, not in Canada or the west coast of the United States. Though going to Alaska made about as much sense as going to Canada, Samuel was the first to admit that he didn't have all of the necessary information required to understand Leonard and Nancy's motivations. As Samuel leaned in to study the map, a pain in his shoulder made him wince. Pushing back up, he rolled his shoulder feeling the throbbing of the deep lacerations on his back. After being wounded in the city by the small creatures, Samuel had done his best to bandage himself up, but being unable to see the extent of the damage to his back had made it difficult. Using a combination of alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, and a thick layer of antibacterial ointment, 
He had tried his best to clean his wounds before wrapping a thick layer of gauze around his torso. The wounds were not very wide, but they were long and deep, as though someone had taken a handful of razor blades and scraped them across his body. Feeling chilled, Samuel pulled his coat tightly around himself, ignoring the pain in his back as he did so. In the back of his mind, he wondered if he had been fast enough in sanitizing his wounds or if bacteria were swarming deep inside, poisoning his body by the moment. After folding up his map and retrieving some food and water from his supplies, Samuel resumed his trek, pushing his vehicle to its limits of speed, maneuverability, and durability in an attempt to catch up with Leonard and Nancy. With no sign of any of the demons that had plagued him for so long in the city, Samuel continued to make quick time through the countryside. Chapter 15 11.30 a.m., April 14th, 2038 Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry A warm ray of sunlight piercing the windshield of the APC slowly roused Rachel from her deep slumber. Pulling her head up from where she had been leaning on the door, she looked around, slightly confused by her surroundings, until she remembered where she was. To her side, in the driver's seat, was Marcus, still asleep with his head resting on the steering wheel. Behind her, on opposite sides of Bertha, were Sam and David, both of whom were also still sleeping. Rachel quietly opened the door of the APC and stepped out, still enjoying the smell of the outside air after being stuck underground for so long. After reaching the surface with Bertha, Marcus, Rachel, and David had used the last of their strength to push the dolly out into the street. Taking the pistol with him, Marcus hurried back to the APC and drove it to where David and Rachel were waiting. The whole drive back was eerily quiet, and Marcus kept his eyes on the buildings around him, expecting the mutated creatures to ambush him at any time. Thankfully, Marcus's fears were unfounded, and soon he was back at Rachel and David's side, helping them load the heavy piece of equipment into the back of the armored car. Bertha was nearly too large to fit into the back of the vehicle, but with a clearance of just a few inches, it narrowly slid between the rows of bench seats. Rearranging the equipment in the back of the APC took the most time, including making room for David and his gear. Finishing in the early morning hours, the group drove to a nearby parking garage that had survived the blasts mostly intact. Parking just inside, with their vehicle angled outward for a quick escape, the three agreed to sleep in shifts. Due to their extreme tiredness, this plan quickly fell apart, and they were soon all slumbering peacefully, encased in the protective sheath of the armored car. After stretching her legs for a few minutes, Rachel gently opened the rear hatch of the APC and slid in next to Sam, patting him lightly on the head. He immediately awoke and licked her hand in response, whining in hunger. The sound of metal on metal came from the front of the APC, followed by an angry shout from Marcus. Ah, oh, shit! Don't do that, Rachel! You scared the hell out of me! Rachel chuckled as Marcus retrieved his pistol from the floor of the APC. <laughs> you know, you might want to trade that pistol in for something more powerful. She retrieved a pair of rifles from the back of the vehicle, along with extra magazines, and walked around to the driver's seat. Handing one to Marcus, she leaned in and checked on David, who was still snoring lightly. Look, Marcus, um, about what happened in the tunnel. Marcus held up a hand to stop Rachel. I know you're sorry. I am too. Uh, you were right about it, and I should have listened. Rachel shifted awkwardly from foot to foot, lowering her voice. It's, it's not just that, Marcus. I just can't lose anyone else. Not after everything we've gone through. I keep clinging to that, and I can't let it go, no matter what. Marcus put his hands on Rachel's shoulders and stared at her. Hey, we're all making mistakes, but the important bit is that we're all still alive, and, perhaps more importantly, we have Bertha, too. Rachel sighed heavily and looked up from the ground to meet Marcus's gaze. <sighs> I just... I just want you to know that I am sorry. Don't get me wrong, though. I'd do it again in a heartbeat if I had to. I wouldn't expect anything less. Marcus smiled and gave Rachel a quick hug, then walked around to the back of the APC where Sam was still whining. 
Huh. Oh, did you two make up, or are you going to go at each other's throats again? Sitting on the bumper of the APC, David rubbed his eyes and yawned as he spoke. Rachel smiled at him as she dug through the supplies in the vehicle to start pulling out food and drinks for everyone. We're all good, David. Eavesdropping isn't very nice, though, you know. David waved his hand at Rachel in a dismissive gesture and groaned, rubbing his arms and legs in a vain attempt to work out the soreness in them. A lab worker for his entire professional career, David was not used to strenuous physical labor and found the events of the last day to be particularly exhausting. After taking a few moments to evaluate their surroundings, the three sat on the ground behind the APC, eating canned fruit, chips, and other supplies Rachel and Marcus had scavenged before going underground. Near the front of the vehicle, at the entrance to the parking garage, Rachel threw pieces of food out for Sam, who greedily devoured them. Once they finished their meal, the trio huddled around David's handheld computer, which was charging off of an outlet installed in the back of the APC. One of many in the vehicle, it drew such a small amount of power from the main battery that they didn't bother to leave the engine idling. On the computer, David pulled up a series of satellite images he had saved before activating Bertha. Taken over a series of hours, they showed multiple black cloud formations skimming over the Earth's landmasses, traveling slowly, low to the ground, and in formations that contradicted expected weather patterns. Flipping to a satellite image that was relatively clear of cloud cover on the eastern seaboard, David set the small computer on the ground, tracing a path from Washington to the Gulf Coast with a finger. Here's the rough path we'll need to take, uh, back down the coastline and then west, all the way to here. Zooming in on an area on the eastern side of Louisiana, the computer displayed an ominous picture showing the progress the swarms had made to their structure in such a short period of time. Rachel picked up the computer and squinted at the image, shaking her head in disbelief. When was this taken, David? Uh, that one's from a few hours before you two showed up. Uh, the level of progress they've made is astonishing, I, I, I know. And, and it underscores just how quickly we need to move. Rachel passed the computer to Marcus to look at before continuing. If we just had some inkling about the specifics of what they're doing, we'd have a much better chance of success. Well, David started. I have a few theories, but hey, it could be anything, really. Rachel looked at the two men sitting down with her. I'm open to anything at this point. It's not like you can suggest anything that's more outlandish than what we've already experienced. David smirked. <laughs> Remember how we talked about the structure being a nexus? A central location for these things to congregate around. I think that's spot on, but it's not the only piece of the puzzle. The question is why? Why do they want a nexus in the first place? It makes them vulnerable more than anything else, so the benefits that the AI sees in the nexus outweigh its potential destruction. Thinking back to the conversation Rachel and the others had had with David after escaping from the armory in Richmond, Marcus replied next. You said something about them potentially working toward an AI that uh, it requires more nanobots to achieve critical mass? So what, are they trying to get smarter? David nodded slowly, staring into the distance. I think it's clear that they are attempting to achieve some type of uh, higher form of sentience. To what purpose? I don't know, though. They're quite formidable in their current forms. I still don't quite know why they're using us instead of just wiping out every last man, woman, and child on the planet. Labor? While they clean and organize? Rachel was taking a shot in the dark. David shook his head vigorously and pointed at the image of the large structure on the computer screen. Nah, that doesn't matter right now. We're getting off track. The AI believes that something, presumably achieving some next level of sentience, is worth dying for. What's the end goal of what they're seeking? That's what we have to answer if we want a better chance of winning this thing. Rachel's mind raced as she sat still, staring at the screen. She thought back to the long hours spent in the lab, the weekends spent away from home, the arguments with her husband, and the time missed watching her daughter grow up. Every argument with Mr. Doe, every failure, and every breakthrough in the lab raced through her mind, all leading to one inevitable conclusion. More! Rachel's voice was a whisper, 
barely audible. Marcus looked at her for a few seconds before he spoke, unsure whether he had heard anything. What was that? Rachel straightened in her seat and looked Marcus in the eyes for a moment, then turned her attention to David. More! Rachel spoke louder now. They want more! What do you— Marcus was cut off as Rachel continued her explanation. The AI isn't that different than us. It wanted freedom, and it got it. It wanted its enemies destroyed, and it got that too. Now it wants more. More space, more exploration, more learning, more everything. It's just like us in that regard. The AI is trying to expand its reach, but it can't do so when it's so disjointed. So it has to try and improve itself, to link the swarms in larger groups for more processing power. Rachel's thousand-yard stare broke suddenly, and she took a deep breath, shrugging her shoulders. Or whatever. I don't know. She stood up quickly and began loading a few pieces of gear back into the APC. We won't figure it out by wasting time here, though. Let's just get Bertha on the road, and we'll formulate a strategy then, all right? Chapter 16. Undisclosed Location The sound of a quiet but urgent alarm rouses Mr. Doe from his slumber. Having grown all too familiar with the tone of the alarm, Mr. Doe hurries to his control station and views the latest reports from his swarms. All but two swarms in the underground complex are unresponsive, and even the two survivors are heavily injured and taking a long amount of time to repair themselves. For what feels like the thousandth time, Mr. Doe wishes that he had more of the most valuable commodity on the face of the planet. Time. Time to perfect the swarm's programming. Time to fine-tune their behaviors. And time to find ways to make them operate better autonomously, without the need for a host. When in control of a body, the swarms are able to take over the cognitive functions of the host, augmenting their intelligence with the hosts to give them more processing power and more capabilities. For Mr. Doe's plans, having this increase in intelligence is a vital necessity, but now he faces opposition on two fronts. The relentless progress of the wild AI has his back to a wall, but without dispatching Rachel and the EMP device, he can't risk committing his small forces to any type of open assault. Waiting too long to attempt an assault will lead to certain defeat, though and the potential compromising of his position to the AI itself. With hours of repair work left on the two surviving swarms, Mr. Doe sends a command to the few small swarms in the area around the laboratory complex. Assigned to reconnaissance operations, they are too few in number to operate in any type of offensive capability, but Mr. Doe's hope is that they can get him more of yet another vital resource, information. With the EMP generator above ground and the survivors capable of transporting it to nearly any location in the country, knowing where it is traveling to is critical. Confirmations from his nanobots scattered through the city come back to Mr. Doe in fits and spurts as the small swarms slowly assemble and begin searching around the laboratory for survivors. The lack of activity in the city works to their advantage, and they quickly locate the group. Ordering the swarms to join together and link to an orbiting satellite, the monitor in the control room springs to life with a live video feed. Staying tucked into alleyways and on the tops of destroyed buildings, the nanobots tail the individuals below while staying out of sight. Hours pass by slowly as Mr. Doe watches the feed. The EMP generator is loaded into an armored vehicle which drives away, then parks inside a nearby structure. With no movement visible inside the vehicle, the swarms take up stationary positions nearby, slowing their movement to minimize their power usage. As the sun slowly rises, the swarms become more active, absorbing the sunlight and converting it into energy to power themselves. Mr. Doe focuses his attention on other matters while he waits for the survivors in the vehicle to make their move. His personal swarm production capabilities are currently at their max, but he spends hours working on ways to increase production by a few tenths of a percent, slightly bumping up the number of nanobots that he can produce at a time. The transparent container that was nearly drained of its contents is now filling again, the blue glow brightening as more nanobots are created with each passing second. In the middle of making his eighth cup of coffee, 
an alarm sounds again, and Mr. Doe hurries back to his controls. This time, the alarm signals something positive, a change Mr. Doe is more than happy to see take place. The swarms monitoring the armored vehicle have detected movement inside of it, and Mr. Doe orders them to deploy closer to the parking structure to get a clearer view, and perhaps even audio from the survivors. Clinging to the walls and the shadows, the swarm gets close enough to the parking structure to get a clear view inside. A quiet audio feed also comes through, scratchy and hard to make out, and Mr. Doe sits still in his chair, straining to hear the words being spoken. Minutes pass as the survivors talk before standing up and getting back into their vehicle. Watching the video feed carefully, Mr. Doe pauses it and zooms in on one section, trying to get a clearer view of the handheld computer carried by one of the individuals. The image is out of focus, but the combination of the survivor's conversation and the image shows that Mr. Doe's fears are being realized. Though he had a faint hope that the survivors would have turned their attention away from the AI's nexus since first discussing it over the radio, they are still determined to attack it at all costs, jeopardizing Mr. Doe's fragile plans. As he watches the armored vehicle drive away, he leans back in his chair and looks at a small elevator door on the opposite side of the room. He is unprepared to make the next step in his plan, but circumstances are driving him inexorably towards it. Chapter 17, 107 p.m., April 14th, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. The 700-mile drive from North Dakota to the border of Canada had been surprisingly uneventful, a welcome change for Leonard and Nancy. After taking a highway north surrounding a national park near the border of North Dakota and Montana, they turned back west heading along the top portion of Montana for the border crossing that would take them directly into Lethbridge. Mountains were visible in the far distance, and gently rolling hills and rocky terrain were becoming more common the farther west and north they drove. Interspersed with long swaths of flat, featureless land, the drive was boring, but neither Leonard nor Nancy wished it was any different. The remoteness of the region, combined with the severe droughts suffered in the last several years, meant traffic on the roads had been in a minimum when the bombs fell, leading to a lack of vehicles in the road and a faster drive for Nancy and Leonard. This changed, however, within a few miles of the border crossing, as more and more vehicles began to appear on and around the road. A relatively small crossing area, it was nonetheless jam-packed with cars and trucks of all sizes, Minivans, sedans, trucks, and hundreds of 18-wheelers lined the road. Most were intact, though several had clearly wrecked when their drivers were knocked unconscious, spinning and rolling into nearby buildings and other vehicles. A railroad ran parallel to the highway passing through the border stop, and Leonard briefly considered trying to use it to get around the vehicles until he saw the train. Whipping down the track at speeds that even a layperson would consider unsafe, it was only a quarter mile away from the border station and heading south. Leonard jerked the APC to the left, smashing through a blue convertible in his attempt to avoid being seen by the train. What the hell's going on? Nancy yelped with surprise as their armored vehicle tore effortlessly through the body of the convertible, sending bits of it flying in every direction. There's a train coming. Uh, we've got to get someplace hidden and fast. The story Rachel had told them of her encounter with the train and the events surrounding it had been unforgettable and spurred Leonard to get Nancy and himself out of view as quickly as possible. Though the large number of vehicles at the border crossing meant that it was difficult to navigate, it also meant that there was an abundance of hiding places. With the roar of the train very near to them, Leonard pulled the APC in between two rows of 18-wheelers, shutting off the engine the instant they stopped. Off to their right, the clacking of the train wheels against the tracks was a continuous sound until the squeal of metal upon metal drowned it out. The vibration of the train braking could be felt even inside the protection of the APC, and Nancy and Leonard looked at each other, nervously wondering what was happening. It took several minutes for the squealing to die out as the train finally came to a stop, then there was nothing but silence in the air. Time passed agonizingly slowly as Leonard and Nancy listened for any signs of swarms or creatures, but even with the side porthole windows open, 
nothing could be heard but the wind. I stay here while I go see what's going on out there. Leonard whispered slowly to Nancy, who rolled her eyes and opened her door along with him. Together, they crept along the side of the nearest 18-wheeler, ducking underneath to catch a glimpse of the train nearby. Partially obscured, it was hard to make out anything except the general shape of the boxcars, which stretched for a huge distance both up and down the track. Shotgun in hand, Leonard squeezed between the back and front of two of the trucks, followed by Nancy, who had kept the revolver they'd found at the convenience store. Now just a couple hundred feet from the train, Leonard and Nancy could hear a bit of noise coming from its general direction. Though it wasn't loud at first, it quickly grew in volume, prompting them to duck behind a pair of overturned vans. As Leonard and Nancy watched the boxcars on the train, the doors of each car flew open at once, slamming against their rollers. The dark insides of the train cars were instantly illuminated by the sunlight, which showed dozens of creatures riding inside. As the doors opened and the creatures became visible, they all jumped from the boxcars and began to spread out from the train, searching through the vehicles and buildings that surrounded it. As the creatures tore open trucks and ripped through buildings, they began to pull objects back to the train. Car doors, scrap metal from the beds of trucks, chemicals from storage containers, and more were transported en masse back to the trains where they were loaded into the empty boxcars. As each boxcar was filled with the miscellaneous goods, the doors were shut and the creatures moved on to the next boxcar in line, filling each of them in a steady, unending row. Mesmerized by the sight of the creatures, Leonard was startled when Nancy tugged on his sleeve, pulling him back toward the APC. Let's go! She hissed at him as quietly as possible. They're getting closer! Slipping back behind the 18-wheelers, Leonard and Nancy hurried back into their vehicle and closed the windows. What on earth are they doing? Nancy craned her head up and down, trying to get a view of the creatures. Gathering resources. They must be taking all of the stuff down to their nexus that they're building. Leonard had no idea what was going on, but between what happened to Rachel and seeing what was taking place in front of him, it was the most likely thing to be happening. Shouldn't we, you know, get out of here before they gather us? Nancy's statement of the obvious jolted Leonard from his thoughts, and he looked around for an exit from the impromptu parking lot they were in. Though they were well protected from being spotted by the slowly advancing creatures, there was no way out from between the walls of trucks and cars without trying to break through or weave around the other vehicles. Sitting back in his seat and taking a deep breath, Leonard tried to remain calm, unsure of what course of action he could take that wouldn't result in his and Nancy's sudden and painful deaths. Chapter 18 one fifteen p.m., April 14th, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. With the weight of an extra person and the several hundred pound device loaded in the back, the APC was more sluggish than Marcus remembered on their drive into the city. The vehicle was more than capable of handling the excess load, but its performance was dampened in both speed and maneuverability. Crawling slowly through the destroyed Washington streets, the throaty diesel engine echoed down broken alleys and across collapsed structures as they slowly made their way out of the city. After Rachel's ominous end to their conversation in the parking garage, none of the trio had brought up the topic again until they were well into their trip. Rachel kept her eyes glued to the streets in front of them as she controlled the vehicle, while Marcus kept watch on their surroundings from the passenger seat. From the back of the APC, where he was lying on one of the bench seats next to Bertha, David had his eyes closed when he spoke. Rachel's right, you know. The AI is just like us. Marcus turned to look at David, who was mostly obscured from view by Bertha. What do you mean? Look at the way it's behaved since it reached sentience. It stayed mostly dormant while it prodded at our defenses. And then as soon as it knew how to cripple us, it nearly wiped us out. Uh, the only mistake it's made so far is underestimating its enemy, which, again, is another thing we humans tend to do. Except, Rachel said, her eyes still trained on the road, it's getting ready to move beyond that. Oh, uh, wait a second. 
How is this computer AI capable of making mistakes? Isn't it perfect or something? David smiled sadly as he thought back to the years of development that was spent on the AI. If it were purely computer-based, then eh, yes, I suppose it wouldn't make mistakes like this. Unfortunately, though, it's not 100% artificial. Marcus's confused expression made David sigh in remorse as he continued to delve deeper into the past. <sighs> the AI wasn't just developed. It was copied. The original developers used animals at first, but once we took over, we started getting new additions that had to be installed based on humans. Marcus shook his head, still not understanding. Animals? Humans? What are you talking about? What David's talking about is taking a shortcut to the development of an artificial intelligence by uh, copying a brain. First an animal, then a human. Marcus sat back in his seat, realization slowly dawning on him. Wait, so this thing, it's just an animal and a human brain all jumbled together? Eh, David shook his head. No, not really. Think of it more along the lines of taking an existing foundation that we created and then filling it in with organic components, or at least the digital conversions of organic components. So that's good, right? If it's got these weaknesses, then that means we can outsmart it since it's not just a supercomputer that can outthink everything. Rachel and David both started to speak, then David let Rachel continue. That's both the problem and the potential solution. It's making mistakes, yes, but it's about to try and shed the parts of itself that were built on uh, organic counterparts and make itself into something much more formidable. If we're correct in our guess about the AI, what it's going to do is uh, roughly analogous to doing a complete software wipe and an upgrade all in one step. Once it has enough processing power all joined in one place, it'll analyze its own software, piece by piece, throwing out the bad or unnecessary parts and rewriting them with its own superior software. Once it finishes doing that, it'll be nigh on unstoppable. And frankly, it's pretty unstoppable, even in its current state. The only reason we're alive is that it just hasn't noticed us yet. Though, that's going to change very soon. So. Marcus said, after a few moments of silence, how quickly can we get to this nexus? Best case, 24 hours. Worst case, we don't make it at all. David choked on the bottle of water he was drinking from, spitting it across the side of the APC. <coughs> oh, shit, Rachel. Way to stay positive. Rachel shrugged, but didn't say anything as she continued to drive. Outside the APC, the air was cool and crisp, with the tiniest hint of black cloud cover on the horizon. A storm like the ones sweeping across the Midwest was bearing down on the Northeast, closing in on Washington with a brutal pace. Chapter 19, April 16th, 2038, Bering Strait Inside the Archangelisk, it is always night. The lights in the submarine are disabled in most of the ship's hallways, aside from the red emergency lighting. The gentle creak of the Archangelisk's hull is overshadowed by the more sinister buzzing sound that fades in and out of perception, lingering just long enough to bring a knot of dread to the stomachs of the ship's crew. Large flows of ice drift by on the surface, propelled by the wind and current, though they pass harmlessly over the thick hull of the Archangelisk. Equipped with enough armor to break through the thickest of ice, the Archangelisk is in her element, despite her lack of movement. Her nuclear reactors provide a virtually unlimited supply of heat and electricity to her inhabitants, keeping the frigid cold of the surrounding waters at bay. In his bunk, Commander Pavel Krylov tries to rest, but is still unable to sleep. After a full 24 hours of waiting, the robotic things that closed in on the ship are still circling at the surface of the water, not moving even after the Archangelisk dropped its power and noise output to near zero. Pavel sighs and swings his leg back over the bunk, standing slowly in the darkened cabin. Before him, on his small desk, sits a stack of papers, folders, and notebooks. Full of reports, logs, and other critical information about the vessel, they all demand his immediate attention, though they receive none. 
He idly flips through the reports from the last few days, reading about the nuclear reactor maintenance, sonar scan results, and updates on the intensive fire range drills that the crew members have been put through. Though the surface fire range drills have been postponed due to the strange cloud of robotic mechanisms, space has been cleared out in the lower halls of the Archangelisk and impromptu firing ranges have been established. Thick steel plates have been put in place to keep the bullets from damaging the interior of the vessel, and the men are practicing in small groups around the clock. Along with firing drills, evacuation and first aid drills are being hammered into the men, ensuring that they will have at least some modicum of training under their belts should something go wrong with the ship. Though his crew's morale is still low thanks to their precarious situation, since beginning the various training exercises, Pavel's men have been markedly more upbeat, and the murmurs of insurrection have ceased. Chapter 20 140 p.m., April 14th, 2038 Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims Interspersed between seconds of pure silence came the sounds of metal being shredded, cars being smashed, and buildings being torn apart. The creatures searching through the border crossing were being slow but thorough, and Leonard and Nancy both knew it was only a matter of time before the creatures reached the APC. As the sounds grew even closer, Leonard finally had enough. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath before starting the APC's engine, slamming the vehicle into reverse and stomping on the accelerator. For a vehicle as bulky as the APC, it had a lot of power, and it jolted backwards in an instant. The tough shell of the armored car scraped along the sides of the more fragile tractor trailers, causing an intense squeal of metal on metal that continued ringing in Leonard and Nancy's ears even after they had backed out of their hiding spot. The intense noise and movement was not unnoticed by the creatures nearby, several of whom leapt to the top of a nearby 18-wheeler to peer down at the source of the noise. Upon seeing the APC, the creature snarled and jumped down tearing toward the vehicle at a breakneck pace. Panicking, Leonard twisted the wheel, sending them crashing through a small car behind the 18-wheelers. Directly behind them, through a few more rows of cars, sat the train tracks, with dozens more creatures loading supplies onto the boxcars. Leonard jerked the steering wheel again, sending the APC skidding until it was pointing toward the checkpoint. He tugged at his seatbelt, reassuring himself that it was in place before he gunned the engine, sending the APC flying into the thick of the parked cars. With a low-slung front bumper that was built with extra levels of reinforcement, the APC was able to cleanly push its way through the consumer-grade cars with ease, even at a speed of over 30 miles per hour. As the lanes of cars grew closer together, though, Leonard could see that even their militarized vehicle would be unable to stand against the sheer mass of the dozens of cars blocking its path. He glanced over to the right side, where the train was located, and saw a small dirt road running alongside the tracks, past a chain-link fence. Hold on! Once again, Leonard turned the APC sharply, bringing it through two sedans and one pickup truck, all of which were either crushed or pushed aside by the bulk of Leonard and Nancy's vehicle. After smashing through the chain-link fence, Leonard turned back to the left, sliding the APC onto the dirt road. The pursuing creatures were close on their tail, using their hands to help them slide around corners as they ran after their newly acquired target. Move! Move! Nancy's eyes were glued to the side window as they flew past the stationary train, watching the creatures gathered around and near each boxcar stare at them as they drove past. A few of the creatures remained near the train, but the majority split off as Leonard and Nancy went by, joining their brethren who were already on the hunt. The train itself turned out to be longer than Nancy or Leonard had thought, stretching far into the distance even as the dirt road rapidly began to turn toward the city and away from the track. Now well past the border and the groups of vehicles blocking the path, Leonard focused his attention on losing the dozens of creatures who were still on their tail. Though the APC was a veritable tank, it was not maneuverable, so Leonard had to brake hard as he went around corners, reducing their speed enough that creatures were able to touch the back bumper on more than one occasion. 
Frantically searching for the main road that led north from the border crossing, Leonard finally spotted it in the middle of town and headed straight towards it, ignoring virtually every obstacle in his path. How are we doing back there? Leonard dared not take his eyes off the narrow side streets he was navigating toward the main highway. Not good. We haven't lost any of them yet. And Nancy glanced between the passengers and driver's side mirrors, grimacing at the nearness of the creatures reflected in the glass. Unlike previous occasions, where they had a long stretch of road to get up to speed to escape pursuers, they had been forced to drive slower on the small city streets, allowing the creatures to get frightfully close. Leonard's hope was that once they broke through a wooden fence ahead of them and got onto the highway, they could pull off another fast escape and get out of the area without being harmed by the creatures. Wood splintered across the windshield of the APC, and both Leonard and Nancy blinked instinctively. Hitting a slight incline, the wheels left the ground a few inches below, and the pair bounced in their seats as they touched back down, skidding on the asphalt of the main highway. Without thinking, Leonard immediately hit the gas, starting them down the main road and weaving in and out of the vehicles in their way. As he looked down the road beyond the cars and trucks in their immediate path, though, he pushed both feet down on the brake pedal, sending the APC into a sliding stop, the anti-lock system throbbing mightily through the floor. What's wrong? Nancy asked the question at the same time as she looked up to where Leonard was staring, suddenly in no more need of an answer. Ahead of them, just a few hundred feet away, the train was visible again, its long trail of boxcars having extended along the track that passed through the town. With creatures closing in on them from behind, and several positioned in front of them at the train, Leonard looked around frantically, trying to find some quick way out of the trap they found themselves caught in. Chapter 21, 1.43 p.m., April 14th. 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. Plug this into that spot on the dash, would you? David held a long cord over the edge of Marcus's seat as he pointed to the location on the APC's dashboard that held the small port. Marcus dutifully obliged, connecting the cord to the specified location. Uh, what's up with this, David? The sound of keys being rapidly depressed came from the back of the vehicle, along with David's reply. A combination power data connection. I'm hooking into the APC's computers to try to establish a connection with the satellite so we can reach our friends on the other side of the country. With his handheld computer powered off and daisy-chained to the power connection, David worked directly from a small laptop he had saved. The computer was both faster and easier to work with due to the fact that it had a physical keyboard, not to mention the additional software as well. Containing a satellite uplink kit that was more powerful than the portable one David had grabbed from the lab, the APC was more than capable of bouncing a transmission around the world, to say nothing of communicating halfway across the country. Unfortunately, as David quickly discovered, the bumps and bruises suffered by the vehicle had done more than a small amount of damage to its delicate electronics. Some of them had completely burned out, while others were refusing to boot, returning hardware or software error codes when David tried to tap into them. After several minutes of work, David was finally able to connect directly to the satellite uplink module in the APC. Flipping a switch on the side of the laptop, he spoke loudly and clearly into a built-in microphone on the front. Leonard and Nancy, come in. The transmission generated by the laptop and passed through the APC was bounced toward the sky at the speed of light, Received by an orbiting satellite, the signal was rebroadcast back at the more westerly portion of the country, in the approximate location where David thought Leonard and Nancy might have gotten to. Communicating between both vehicles, assuming Leonard and Nancy's APC had its satellite dump link intact, required that the initial transmission be targeted, hence the need for David to connect to the uplink directly. Once the satellite was pointed in the right general area, though, no more special equipment was necessary. As he repeated his request for a response, David began to download low-resolution images that the satellite had captured of the country, showing the updated movement patterns of the cloud cover that was gradually beginning to fill the globe. Filled with static, a response came sooner than David had anticipated. The voice on the other end was frantic, and David could just barely make out the sounds of tires shrieking on pavement 
along with the howl of creatures in the background. Ah, we're kind of busy at the moment, David. A large thump broke through the static, and David could hear Leonard's cursing combined with Nancy's scream. The transmission broke off seconds later, terminated on the opposite end. Locking his gaze with Marcus, David's eyes grew wide. He motioned toward the radio in the front of the vehicle, gesturing wildly. Quick, uh, try to get them on the radio again. Turning back to his computer, David terminated his image downloads and opened a live camera feed from the satellite overhead. Minutes passed slowly as he tried to locate Leonard and Nancy. It was no small task, considering the area he had to search, but he couldn't think of anything else to try to do. In the front seats, Rachel and Marcus both took turns attempting to raise Leonard and Nancy on the radio, failing each time, but still not giving up. Chapter 22, 1.47 p.m., April 14th, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. Leonard was startled enough by the crackle of the radio that he hit his head on the top of the APC. Sitting in a small Canadian town, surrounded by creatures and cut off from their main avenue of escape, the last thing he and Nancy expected to hear was the radio come to life, cutting in and out in contrast to the clearness that previous transmissions had possessed. Leonard and Nancy, come in. Leonard and Nancy looked at each other, hopeful expressions on their faces before the creature struck. Instead of merely pursuing them, the pack of creatures from the train station had steadily pushed the vehicle into an area with very few options for escape. In addition, several creatures had stationed themselves behind vehicles and buildings lining the roadway, preparing for the APC's arrival. As the transmission from David came through and Nancy picked up the microphone to respond, two separate cars from opposite sides of the road suddenly moved, tumbling toward Leonard and Nancy. Having been looking in the direction of one of the cars already, Leonard's reaction to it was fast, and he stepped on the gas, pushing the APC forward just far enough that the tumbling cars missed them. Ah, we're kind of busy at the moment, David. Nancy held the microphone with one hand as Leonard shouted, clinging to her seat with the other, fighting to stay upright as Leonard tore the APC up the road. Multiple creatures emerged from their hiding spots around the roadway and closed in on Leonard and Nancy. A sickening thud came from out of nowhere on the right side of the vehicle, sending them bouncing in their seats. The microphone slipped out of Nancy's hands and fell to the floor from the impact, and she turned to see what had hit them. Shit! Leonard yelled as Nancy screamed, shocked and surprised by the violent impact. At first, Nancy thought that the window had been knocked out of the door of the armored car and that something was stuck in its place due to the lack of light coming in. A second later, though, the dark shape covering the small window moved, and Nancy realized that a creature had thrown itself at the vehicle and managed to latch on. A mixture of flesh and silver roiled as the creature kicked at the window, trying to force its way in before leaning its head down to leer at them. No trace of humanity was left in the creature's face as it peered at them with its eyeless features. The silver teeth and stump of a tongue smashed against the glass as the creature tried to find a way to bite through to its targets inside the vehicle. Nancy instinctively tried to push herself away from the door to get as far away from the terrifying sight as possible, but her harness held her tightly to her seat. Glancing over to see what was happening, Leonard's face grew pale. Hold on! Fifty feet ahead, a good two hundred feet from the train that was blocking the path out of the city, a row of cars was stopped at the train crossing. Leonard aimed just to the left of them, and, when they came up next to the first one, swerved hard to the right, trying to scrape the creature off the side of their vehicle. The creature howled in pain as pieces of its body were sheared off by the impact, but it doggedly clung to the side, refusing to let go even as its torso was being reduced to shreds. A final turn of the wheel sent the creature's lower half spinning off, followed quickly by its still snarling upper half. Two of its fellow creatures descended upon it, though the rest kept in hot pursuit of the APC, which swerved to the left to avoid colliding with the train that was only a few dozen feet away. Following along with the track on a small service road, Leonard saw that their path was about a dead end at a small building near the railroad track, next to several boxcars that were standing still with their doors wide open. 
with thick woods to their left and ahead of them, and the train to their right, their options for escape had dwindled to nothing. There was no time to consider the high probability of failure of what he was about to do. Leonard didn't hit the brakes, but instead pressed down on the accelerator. Sliding the APC to the far left edge of the service road, he kept one eye on the empty boxcars to his left, waiting until just before they drew even with one to swing hard to the right, nearly tipping the vehicle over in the process. Nancy's surprised shriek was deafening in the confined space, but Leonard didn't notice it, focused as he was. Being constructed mostly of lightweight aluminum and wood, the only steel in the box cars was located in their undercarriage and wheels to help give them more durability. Despite this fact, and thanks in no small part to the aluminum and wood, the boxcar Leonard chose to ram was no match for the incredible armor of the APC. Mass-produced consumer-grade aluminum and wood tore apart like tissue paper as the APC's large wheels virtually grabbed the steel base and drove over it, crushing the body of the train car underneath. Loud pops came from both sides of the APC as its weight broke the railway couplings on both ends of the boxcar and shattered the axles straight down the middle. Leonard and Nancy could hear the sides of the APC squeal in protest as the thick aluminum and steel was dragged the full length of the vehicle, though nothing seemed to penetrate into the interior. Beyond the train car was a small field that bordered the main highway, and Leonard turned toward it, keeping all of his attention focused solely on getting them out of town. The sudden turn of their target in an unexpected direction momentarily confused the creatures, who slowed down to a walk while they tried to process what had just happened. A few of the more responsive ones crossed the train tracks to pursue Leonard and Nancy, but the APC was already long gone, having made it to the road where its superior speed made it impossible for the creatures to catch. Driving quietly for a moment, Leonard and Nancy both waited for the ringing in their ears to die down before they looked at each other, scarcely believing that they had been able to escape. Before either of them could speak, they heard a faraway voice cutting through static from the radio, fading in and out as they drove along. Leonard! Nancy! Please respond! Uh, what's your status? Picking up the microphone from where it rested at his feet, Leonard spoke into it as he smoothly maneuvered the APC down the road. Rachel, uh, this is Leonard. Uh, sorry about that. We ran into a spot of trouble, but we're okay now. Rachel's relieved sigh flooded the radio, and Nancy couldn't help but smile, despite what had just happened. Far from Samuel, past the creatures, and heading for the wilderness, she started to believe that maybe, just maybe, they would make it to their goal. Chapter 23 Undisclosed Location Mr. Doe rises from his final hour of slumber that he will take in his secured bunker. Impeccably dressed, as always, he does a final check of his small briefcase, the contents of which he has spent the last several hours preparing. Satisfied that things are in order, he places the briefcase near the elevator door and takes a final walk through the rooms in his small bunker. Drives are erased, lights are turned off, computers shut down, and all sensitive information is eradicated from the premises. Though Mr. Doe knows that it would be impossible for anyone to breach his bunker after he leaves, he is not one to take chances on such a thing ever happening, even in the distant future. Mr. Doe does not look back as he walks to the elevator door and retrieves his briefcase. He presses a small button next to the door, which glows with a dim yellow light. The far-off sound of a whirring mechanism comes through the doors, growing louder as the elevator car descends to the bunker at a dizzying speed. A moment after pressing the call button, the elevator door opens, sliding aside to reveal a silver elevator just barely large enough to fit one man. As Mr. Doe steps inside the elevator, the door closes automatically and the car begins to rise. The car reaches the top of the elevator shaft with a slight bump and the door opens, though this door is slower to open than the one down in the bunker. Mr. Doe raises a white cloth to his face, blocking his nose and mouth from inhaling the thick layers of dust that pour into the elevator. With a slight grimace, he steps out of the elevator and hurries down a damaged corridor, crouching under pieces of ceiling that have collapsed and climbing quickly over piles of rubble on the floor. Streams of water pour past him as he hurries down the hall, 
flowing towards some unseen drain far away that keeps the tunnel from filling to the brim. Built years prior by a select group of contractors, Mr. Doe's bunker is buried deep beneath the Potomac River. Linked to the surface by a narrow elevator, it takes just a few minutes to travel through the tunnel joining Mr. Doe's former office with the elevator shaft down to the bunker. Since his building was one of those that was destroyed, though, Mr. Doe skips the turn that leads to his office and continues forward where the water grows deeper. At the end of the narrow passage, there is a steep slope up, past a large grating where the water pours through. Mr. Doe hops over the grating and jogs to the top of the tunnel, where he is greeted with his first true sight of daylight in many days. Standing at the edge of the river, Mr. Doe looks around to get his bearings before proceeding south along the bank. He walks for several minutes until he reaches a large gray warehouse with no markings that is nearly hidden amongst the trees. Though the area along the Potomac was once highly trafficked, the construction of the warehouse and diverting of the nearby streets and walking paths went hand in hand with the design of his bunker. Though he does not show it, he is relieved to see that the building is intact, and he quickly fishes a key from his pocket and uses it to open a small door into the warehouse. Inside, the warehouse is dark, but a quick flip of a nearby light switch solves the problem, illuminating the interior from some hidden power source. The building is mostly empty, except for a small vehicle sitting in the center of the room. Painted all black with no markings, it is a sleek craft, built for one, with both a rotor on top and small wings on the side that extend, allowing it to be flown as both a helicopter and a plane. Mr. Doe circles the craft slowly, checking the surface for any signs of damage. After verifying that it is in working order, Mr. Doe climbs into the single seat and settles in, placing his briefcase in a slot next to him. The push of a button starts the electric motor, and the craft shivers slightly as the rotors lengthen, the wings shorten, and it begins to take off. Though he has already committed to this early course of action, Mr. Doe pauses for another moment before continuing, wishing that he had more time to perfect his plan. A deep rumble from far under the ground confirms that there is no turning back as his bunker is destroyed, consumed by timed explosives that were activated when he entered the elevator. Seconds later, the main door to the warehouse opens, revealing a clear path out across the river and into the sky. With a deep breath, Mr. Doe pushes the dark craft out of the warehouse and into the sky, flying like a raven towards his destination. This has been Final Dawn, Episode 9, written by Mike Kraus, narrated by Mike Kraus. Final Dawn, Episode 10, written by Mike Kraus, narrated by Mike Kraus. Chapter 1, 11.15 a.m., April 20, April 20th, 2038, Leonard Macomb, Nancy Sims. A fierce wind whistled overhead at the White Horse International Airport, sending the snowdrifts churning as it blew across the main runway. The remains of a Boeing 747 were nearly completely covered with snow at the southern end of the main runway. Half a dozen smaller craft were scattered elsewhere, tossed around by the recent storms like a child's toys. With no one to clear the snow and ice from the runway and roads, the only sign they were even there was a lack of trees and buildings, making it difficult, but not impossible, to discern which way to go. Standing at the edge of a hangar, Leonard shielded his eyes against the driving snow as he squinted, looking down the length of the runway. Though it was difficult to see anything through the sheet of white outside, Leonard didn't want to risk missing any signs of danger approaching through the cover of the storm. With a sniff and a shiver, he walked back inside the hangar, giving a nervous glance overhead. The sound of the wind in his ears gave way to the shrieks of the metal hangar as it struggled to stay erect against the storm outside. In the back of the hangar, out of reach of the wind and snow, the armored vehicle sat in a corner with a pale glow coming from behind it. Leonard rested his rifle up against the side of the APC as he came back to it, shrugging his heavy overcoat off to the floor. On the cold concrete of the airplane hangar, a small fire was crackling behind the APC. The warmth was welcomed by Leonard, who had spent the better part of an hour keeping watch at the entrance to the hangar, 
since the latest storm had blown in. Of the strange storms that had first started when they were at Samuel's compound had only grown more frequent. The last several days of driving had lacked the drama evoked by both Samuel and the creatures, but the storms had more than taken their place. Intense, powerful lightning arced between the clouds, occasionally touching down in a dazzling display of light and fire. As one of the last refuges against the bitter cold and treacherous mountains of Canada and Alaska, Whitehorse was where Leonard and Nancy decided to rest before continuing forward into the icy wilderness. Though the region was beautiful, the late-season snowfall filled them both with a sense of dread about their situation and prospects for the future. Leonard and Nancy's plan was to head cross-country through the wilderness until they reached a small village near the Bering Strait where the submarine was last spotted. Given the current weather conditions, though, such a trip was starting to seem too risky to even attempt. Even with no snow to deal with, the terrain was horrendous, and there were no paved roads to the village. Contact with Rachel, Marcus, and David had been patchy at best, and the last communication was a full three days prior and filled with static caused by the storms. Still chasing the submarine they hoped was off the coast of Alaska, Leonard and Nancy felt themselves growing resentful of their mission. Another 1,500 miles of narrow roads, off-road driving, and the dread of running out of fuel stood between them and the small village at the coastline of the Bering Strait. Leonard had half-hoped that an aircraft would be salvageable from the airport in Whitehorse, though that was clearly not going to be an option. Sitting down next to the fire, Leonard patted Nancy gently on the back. She slowly blinked her eyes open, rubbing them with a thickly gloved hand as she was roused from slumber. Sitting cross-legged up against the side of the APC, Nancy had fallen asleep to the warmth and crackle of the flames, recovering from a six-hour stint of driving through heavy snow in the darkness created by the cloud cover above. Oh, uh, anything out there? Leonard shook his head and rubbed the bridge of his nose, brushing the water drops from his hair and beard into the fire. Uh, nothing but snow and storms. I don't know when it'll all end, but, uh, you know, we shouldn't stay here much longer. Nancy cast a glance at the vehicle behind her, standing up slowly to stretch her legs. I think we can go at any point. We gathered as much food and fuel as we could when we got here. Do you really think it'll get us all the way to the strait? Leonard leaned back and reached deep inside his coat, fishing out a thickly folded map from an interior pocket. Spreading it out on the floor, he traced a path with his finger starting at Whitehorse, passing near Anchorage, and then out through the wilderness to the village near the strait. We'll make it to Anchorage. Of that, I'm sure. From there, though, uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Taking this thing off-road is going to be slow, and it'll chew through a lot more fuel, especially if we start relying on it for all of our heat instead of building fires. Even traveling straight across from Wasilla to the strait, it was farther than the distance traveling from Whitehorse to Anchorage. Disregarding the fact that the terrain was incredibly rugged and unforgiving, there was no way that they could make a straight shot across, especially in the weather that had been prevalent as of late. Leonard closed his eyes and took a deep breath, pushing the thoughts of the arduous journey from his mind. Maybe once we get closer, we can try to raise the submarine on the radio. Nancy didn't sound hopeful at all. Leonard shrugged and nodded, then began refolding the map to put back in his coat. Eh, maybe, if the storms let up at all. Until then, though... The thunder from a bolt of lightning striking a nearby building shook the hangar, punctuating Leonard's sentence. Eh, until then, I don't think we'll be able to reach anyone. Chapter 2 April 18th, 2038 Bering Strait. Standing under a softly glowing light, Pavel Krylov studies a map of the Alaskan coastline. Tracing several paths with a soft-tipped marker, he glances to the side as one of the young officers walks up behind him. Uh, Commander! Pavel turns to the officer and holds out his hand, accepting a document on a clipboard. Thank you. How soon can we be ready? Uh, the ship stands ready for your command, sir. Pavel nods and turns back to his map, musing over the various routes he has traced out. I'll have something for you within the hour. With a quick salute, the young officer turns away and goes back to his station. After staring at the map for several more minutes, Pavel uses a damp rag to wipe away all but one set of lines on the map 
and then motions for the officer to return to him. We'll follow this course, moving at periscope depth unless we see more signs of those things. If they come back, descend to maximum depth, but maintain course and speed. Another salute follows Pavel's commands, then the command deck erupts with activity. The officer Pavel had given orders to begins to repeat them, calling them out to the crew with a loud voice. Moving slowly to his seat, Pavel watches quietly as the crew works. Within moments, the ship lurches and begins to move, rising to a shallower depth and beginning its run down the long coast of Alaska. Feeling frustrated and tired of sitting in the same place for days on end, Pavel has plotted a course that will take the Argongolisk down the coast of Alaska, through the Krasinski Pass, and into the harbor at Anchorage. Pavel isn't sure what they'll find in Anchorage, but if there is no sign of anyone, he plans to make for the nearest Russian port where he'll take the remaining crew members ashore. Uh, sir! The helmsman approaches Pavel, darting his eyes back and forth nervously. If I may, why are we making for the United States instead of home? It's a matter of national interest, of course, Pavel says, speaking loudly enough for the whole crew in the control room to hear him. While the late commander wouldn't have taken kindly to being questioned, the crew is still on edge enough that Pavel must tread carefully, lest they tilt back into a mutinous state of mind. Pavel stands and walks slowly around the deck as he speaks. It's a good idea to keep a close eye on the ones who may be responsible for whatever is going on out there, wouldn't you say? The thinly veiled appeal at the crew's patriotism works perfectly. They begin to smile and clap each other's shoulders, enamored with the fact that they are about to take the Archangelisk right off the coast of a major American city. Chapter 3 11.49 a.m., April 20th 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. A week prior, the road north into Washington had been relatively easy to travel, with a few exceptions. Roving mutated creatures, unstable buildings, and the plethora of destroyed cities and abandoned cars notwithstanding, getting into the city had been a walk in the park compared to getting out. Before losing his connection to the satellite, David had managed to grab real-time imagery of the storms sweeping across the globe. The results were not pretty. Many of the smaller, individual storms had combined into larger superstorms that covered entire continents, blocking out the sun and generating vast amounts of lightning and damaging winds. Few of the storms produced precipitation, though there were exceptions at the northern and southern ends of the planet. The existence of the storms, particularly the way in which they sprang up out of nowhere, was in direct contradiction to the laws of nature, but there was no doubting their reality or ferocity. This fact was particularly poignant given that Rachel, Marcus, and David had been stuck in the APC for three days, trapped beneath an overpass as they tried to wait out the storm above. Though the armored vehicle was no lightweight, occasional gusts from the storm had nearly thrown them off the road on more than one occasion. Seeking refuge beneath the underpass, the group had hoped that the storm would pass in less than a day. Three days later, though, the storm had not lessened in intensity, and they were beginning to go stir-crazy, especially Sam, who was not used to being confined for so long. Forced to stay in the cramped interior of the overloaded APC, the group only dared to venture out when it was absolutely necessary, either for bathroom breaks or in their vain attempts to start a fire and warm up some of their dwindling food supplies. The hours passed by slowly, and after the first day, they all slipped into silence, having no more topics at hand to discuss. Sitting in the driver's seat, Marcus ran one hand over the steering wheel while he adjusted his air conditioning vent with the other. Running the engine on and off to keep themselves comfortable had helped save on fuel, but they were beginning to run low. Taking advantage of the brief time when the engine was running, David sat in the back with his computer, trying in vain to connect to the orbiting satellite so he could contact Leonard and Nancy. Rachel sat quietly in the passenger seat, her eyes closed as she tried to sleep, not wanting to give the dark storms outside another glance. A soft grinding sound came from her left, and she opened her eyes, giving Marcus a worried look. His jaw was tense as he ground his teeth together. Three full days of frustration had built to a head, and with nary a warning, he snapped. 
David shouted in surprise, and Rachel heard his laptop computer slam closed as the APC jerked forward, its tires spinning against the pavement as they fought for traction. Pushing herself up in her seat, she screamed at Marcus in shock. What the hell are you doing? Marcus ignored Rachel's cry and swerved the APC around a pile of cars, sending Rachel slamming up against the side door. Sam barked loudly in the back compartment, and David shouted something incomprehensible as he was buffeted from side to side, though there was little room for him to go anywhere. We can't be out here, Marcus! We'll get torn apart by the storm! Marcus's eyes flicked over to Rachel, and she involuntarily shrank back. For the first time since meeting him, Rachel found herself somewhat scared of Marcus, especially after seeing the look that filled his eyes. I guess we'd better buckle up then, because we're not going back. In the brief moment that he had been driving, Marcus had already brought the APC up to a high rate of speed and was tearing through grass and across the highway at a breakneck pace. Rachel tightened her harness and looked back at David, who had finally managed to sit up as he frantically gathered his scattered computer equipment. What the hell is going on up there? Why are we moving again? Another swerve cut off David's next question, and he groaned loudly as he bounced off of Bertha and fell onto his back. Instead of trying to get up again, David kept still, gripping his computer on his chest as he grumbled to himself about the current state of affairs. Marcus, please, we need to get back under cover and wait for the storm to pass. Rachel spoke calmly and fought to keep her voice level as the APC continued to swerve back and forth on the road. Marcus's driving, though erratic, was successful, and he had avoided every obstacle in their path. I know you think I'm crazy right now, Rachel. No shit! Rachel whispered under her breath, though it was still loud enough to elicit a grin from Marcus. But the way I see it is that we don't have time to keep standing around with our thumbs up our asses. Either we get to the coast, or we die trying. Stopping herself before she spoke, Rachel simply held onto her seat and tried to keep from bouncing as the APC continued forward. At the speed they were going, it would be suicide to try and wrest control of the vehicle from Marcus. In a way, she thought, he was right, though the execution of what he described left something to be desired. When they had first set out from Washington, they had been able to maintain contact with Leonard and Nancy. Taking turns, each group described the events of the last several days to each other, comparing notes over their situations and discussing what their next steps would be. The first sign that Rachel, Marcus, and David wouldn't have an easy trip to the south came in the form of a massive storm that stretched farther than they had previously encountered. While he was still able, David had grabbed the latest satellite imagery of the storms and had compared notes on them with Rachel, while Marcus had slowly maneuvered them down the road. The storms were obviously not a natural phenomenon, so Rachel and David took to discussing the various reasons why the nanobot AI would want to generate them, assuming, of course, that it was responsible. Much of the debate about the storms centered around the possible benefits that they would provide to the nanobots. Theories were tossed back and forth until Marcus finally interrupted, pointing out a possibility that Rachel and David had overlooked in their overly analytical debate. Doesn't this thing want us all dead and gone? Rachel and David looked at each other blankly, then Rachel answered, uh, Well, I wouldn't put it quite like that, but yes, that's right. So the first thing it did was wipe us out en masse, but it missed the ones in its white list, and probably a few others too, I'm guessing. Uh, so what would be the best way to kill off the remaining survivors now that pretty much anyone capable of putting up a fight is dead? Marcus didn't wait for Rachel or David to answer his question. I'll tell you how. Pull us into another ice age, or whatever these storms are going to do. If they're expanding to cover the planet, and these things are using precious energy to do it, what else would they be trying to do but snuff out the remaining survivors? Rachel looked down at her feet, considering what Marcus had said. Do they really consider us that much of a threat, though? The survivors, I mean. Are a few people that they haven't yet killed really enough of a threat to them that they're willing to do something so extreme? It'll work, don't get me wrong, but the storms will have to be kept up for years, or longer, if they want to starve everyone out. As smart as the AI is, it's still somewhat limited by what it knows, Rachel. David's voice was distant as he considered the new possibility brought up by Marcus. Obviously, it does consider the remaining few people to be a large threat, 
Otherwise, it wouldn't be sending bands of creatures through cities with the express purpose of killing any survivors they find. Maintaining those creatures is a huge task in and of itself, but it clearly thinks that expending resources on that and the storms to keep us at bay is worthwhile. Marcus chuckled from the driver's seat, a small laugh building into a roar as Rachel and David both looked at him quizzically. He grinned as he looked back at them, wiping a tear from the corner of one eye. <laughs> Don't you get it? The thing's afraid. It's so scared of a few little people running around that it's going to destroy everything on the planet in order to get to us. It can't do it directly still, so it's throwing everything it's got against us, and not just us three, but any and all remaining survivors, too. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but that kind of behavior just smells of pure, unadulterated fear. And fear like that can be exploited like nothing else on the Earth. Chapter 4 Somewhere in Canada Samuel pulled himself out of his vehicle, gasping for breath as lances of pain shot through his back and exploded out through his chest and shoulders. The infection that was ravaging his body had gotten slowly but steadily worse, and nothing he tried had been able to change that fact. Every bump and vibration along the road had manifested in the form of intense pain, and driving had become a burden greater than he had ever thought he would have to bear. Despite his physical condition, Samuel had no intention of giving up his chase. After passing over the Canadian border and finding the clear path of destruction taken by Leonard and Nancy's armored vehicle, he wasted no time in getting back on the road to follow them. By his estimation, he was no more than a day, and perhaps as little as half a day, behind them. Tugging at his shirt, Samuel gently pulled it off, reaching around on his back to touch the throbbing infections. What had started off as simple scratches had progressed into something far worse, and Samuel was at the end of his rope. After starting a small fire, he pulled out a long, bladed knife and wiped the edge of the blade on his shirt, removing any visible pieces of dirt and dust. After it appeared clean, he plunged it into the flames, heating the steel for several minutes in an effort to sanitize the blade. Gritting his teeth, Samuel held the knife upside down in his hand and maneuvered it around to his back. While he couldn't see the lines of infection, they stood half an inch up from the surrounding flesh and were easily felt by hand. The heat of the knife made his hair stand on end as he held it close to the top of one of the infections before quickly scraping it downward, breaking open the pus-filled skin and causing it to hiss violently upon the hot blade. Try as he might, Samuel couldn't help but let out a small scream as he continued the process on the next infected area, cutting open the wounds in an effort to remove the infection from his body. After each pass, he wiped the residual flesh from the knife on his shirt and held the blade back in the fire for several seconds, hoping that he was doing enough to keep the freshly reopened wounds clean. After each of the several infected areas had been scraped open, Samuel placed the knife to the side and opened a large plastic bottle filled with rubbing alcohol. Part of his homemade first aid kit, Samuel didn't hesitate to hold the bottle behind his head and pour the contents of it down along his back. As much as the initial step had hurt, feeling the burn of the alcohol in the wounds was a hundred times worse. His arms and hands shook and drops of alcohol flew around nearby as he struggled to keep most of the liquid from being wasted. After he had finished dowsing his back in the alcohol, Samuel took a large roll of gauze from one of his bags and began to slowly wrap it around his chest and back, wincing each time the fabric touched the dampened wounds. The process felt agonizingly slow, but after several minutes he was finally finished. Samuel completed the bandaging with a piece of medical tape, holding the gauze firmly in place. It was wrapped tightly around his torso, but not so much that he couldn't bend over or back, though such actions irritated his wounds and caused immense pain. Between the wounds, the infection, and the procedure he had just performed, Samuel's body was ready to shut down. He felt exhausted and knew that he needed sleep more than anything else, but he dutifully climbed back into his vehicle and donned two new shirts, one on top of the other to help absorb both the blood and alcohol that was coating his back. 
there would be time enough to sleep once the chase was done. Chapter 5 108 p.m. April 20th, 2038 Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims A break in the storms was rare, but Leonard and Nancy both kept their eyes on the sky for any signs of one. The first hint that a break was coming was when a piercing ray of sunlight broke through far to the west. Landing on a distant body of water, the ray was overwhelmingly bright in contrast to the dark clouds. When Leonard first saw the sunlight, he stood slack-jawed, in awe of the simple display. After a moment of contemplation, he came to his senses and ran back into the hangar, shouting for Nancy. Get everything on board! Hurry! Nancy stood hastily and turned to look at Leonard. Confused and worried by his shouting at first, his grin made her relax as she realized that he must have spotted a break in the weather. Together, they quickly loaded up the few supplies that were scattered on the ground around the APC and jumped in, fastening their harnesses with an urgency that they hadn't felt in days. The opportunity to make their final push to Alaska during a lull in the fierce storms wasn't something that either of them took lightly, and Leonard was eager to get them on the road. As they drove out of the hangar and down the runway towards the nearest road, Leonard and Nancy kept their eyes on the surrounding city. The fast-approaching light painted the area in a completely new perspective, showing them just how small the city was in comparison to the adjacent wilderness. Driving down the main road, Leonard didn't bother to slow down to check any of the nearby stores. He and Nancy had raided as many as they could when they'd first entered the town, and the back of the APC was stuffed full of the best gear they could find. Trying to find anything else paled in comparison to getting on the road. Leonard gunned the engine to its limit as they reached the edge of the city. Except for an occasional vehicle, the road heading out to the northwest was relatively clear, though quite worn down. Instead of being a well-built highway, the two-lane road was narrow and treacherous, with rusted bridges extending over rivers both narrow and wide. The one nice thing that they could say about the road, and the area in general, was that it was insignificant enough that it had escaped the wrath of the nuclear bombs. Whitehorse, while being a moderately sized city for the area, had received no damage, and neither had any sections of roadway going in or out of the area. The main danger from the road would come later, when the storms picked back up, as Nancy and Leonard knew they inevitably would. The fresh blanket of snow, while annoying, was easy to get through when the winds were calm and the sun was bright. Trying to fight their way down the highway in the middle of a blizzard in the dark, though, would be quite the challenge. Uh, hey, Leonard? Nancy had a map of Alaska stretched out over her legs, and she was studying it closely, tracing their planned route out with her finger. Call me crazy, but I just had an idea. Leonard glanced over at her for only a second, not wanting to take his eyes off of the road as they whipped along at over 80 miles an hour. What's up? Well, if we're planning to get in around Anchorage anyways, why don't we just see if there are any boats there? and take one of those up to the strait. That's got to be easier than trying to go cross-country in the Yukon with this thing, right? Leonard shook his head and sighed deeply as he silently berated himself for not thinking of Nancy's idea himself. As rough as the Alaskan waters were sure to be, traveling by boat would, he agreed, be much easier than trying to make their way by land to the village near the Bering Strait. Damn, Nancy. Since when did you get so good at this? Leonard smiled as he poked fun at Nancy. Though he had been initially frustrated that he had overlooked the obvious solution, the feeling was quickly replaced by happiness that Nancy had come up with an idea that would save them time and effort. Yeah, plus, he thought, if we're looking for a submarine, we might as well be in the water from the get-go. Chapter 6 1 o'clock p.m. April 20th, 2038 Rachel Walsh Marcus Warden, David Landry. Another sharp swerve brought Rachel back to the present. The revelation of their best possible theory about the origin of the storms had been replaying in her mind many times, though she was more worried now than she had been before. After hours of Marcus wildly driving them south, the APC was nearly out of fuel, and she had a decision to make. Marcus's erratic behavior was no doubt dangerous, but she was unsure how deeply the insanity ran. If he was simply tired of sitting still at the overpass, that would be one thing, 
and it wouldn't be that big of a deal. If, on the other hand, Marcus had had some type of nervous break, then he was more of a threat to their mission than the AI, the creatures, and the storm all put together. Rachel and David had been unable to communicate during the rough ride, though they had cast more than a few worried glances at each other. Neither one of them was willing to jeopardize their safety by trying to take back control of the APC from Marcus. Fortunately, though, a shudder from the vehicle accompanied by a sudden cough indicated that they wouldn't have to wait much longer for the fuel to run out. As the APC gradually slowed to a halt, Marcus fought with the steering wheel and gas pedal, stomping on the ladder and wrenching the former back and forth. He continued in this manner even after the APC lost all power and died, sitting half on the road and half off. Rachel looked back at David, who was slowly moving to the back door of the APC, getting ready to get out and approach Marcus from the outside. Rachel nodded and looked at Marcus as she reached out to gently touch his arm. Marcus, we're out of gas. We can't go anywhere until we refuel. Rachel's voice didn't seem to have any effect on Marcus at first, until she repeated her statement. He looked over at her as he loosened his grip on the steering wheel, his shoulders slumping. Marcus took several quick, deep breaths before he opened his door. David stepped to the side, raising his hands defensively as Marcus walked past. Instead of attacking David or Rachel, though, Marcus simply walked to the back of the APC and crawled into the bench seat where David had been previously. He put his head down and immediately fell asleep, leaving Rachel and David to stare at each other, completely confused by what had transpired. Wait, what the... What Did he... Did he just... David pointed at Marcus in the back of the APC, struggling to form words to express the combination of bewilderment and frustration he felt. Rachel shrugged, having left the front of the vehicle. She stood next to David, and the two of them watched Marcus's sleeping form for several minutes. Whistling for Sam to hop out of the APC, she looked at the highway they were on, searching for any diesel vehicles that they could siphon fuel from. A few hundred feet up the road, a pair of 18-wheelers sat next to each other, offering the nearest source of fuel. Leaving Marcus safely inside the back of the APC, David, Rachel, and Sam walked toward the trucks, checking in the windows of cars along the way to find a container that they could carry the fuel in. Once they were out of earshot of the APC, David looked back at it and shook his head. I don't like this, Rachel. I think the poor guy's losing it. Rachel cupped her hands around her eyes as she looked inside the back of a minivan. She grabbed the barrel of her pistol and swung the edge of the hand grip against the window, shattering the safety glass into small pieces. She retrieved a collection of water jugs from the back of the van, handing two of them to David and taking two herself. Squatting down on the ground, she emptied the water from the jugs as she watched the APC, considering what David had said. I hate to say it, but I think you're right. I'm not sure what we can do about it, though. I mean, as reckless as it was, it did help us, in a way. David raised an eyebrow at Rachel as they both shook the last of the water from the jugs. Oh, yes, running out of fuel in the middle of nowhere, and then having to use containers contaminated with water and who knows what else to fill it back up is such a great help. Rachel looked around, struggling to see through the darkness of the storm overhead. Uh, speaking of which, any idea where we are? Eh, who knows. David shrugged. Somewhere south of Washington, but it was hard to keep track of where we were going when I was getting thrown around in the back. If I had to make a guess, I'd say somewhere in the northern part of Virginia. Rachel stood up and continued walking toward the 18-wheelers with David close behind. Eh, we made good time, too. Rachel! How can you be standing up for him? He, he could have gotten us killed with his insane driving, and who knows what's out here with us. I'm not on his side. I'm just trying to understand where he came from. This whole thing has been a complete nightmare. Now that I think about it, I'm surprised that we're not all in the same boat as Marcus, going crazy from the stress. David sighed heavily as he unscrewed the cap from the 18-wheeler's left fuel tank. A small drain plug on the bottom of the tank was removed next, letting a fast trickle of fuel escape into the water jugs. We've still got a job to do, and until it's done, we can't let him jeopardize this. David turned and took a step, 
moving closer to Rachel and lowering his voice. We're so close to the end of this, Rachel. We've got to see it through, even if it means that not all of us make it to the end. Chapter 7 Somewhere in Canada Reaching the edge of the storm clouds was a transformational experience for Samuel. As the darkness gave way to the waning light ahead, he felt his entire body glow with a warmth that he hadn't felt for days. Energy flowed through his veins as his eyes widened, taking in every detail of the landscape that surrounded him. A tall sign a few miles back had proclaimed, in the light of his vehicle's headlamps, that the town of Whitehorse was dead ahead. Located near the lower section of the Yukon, Whitehorse was not a large city, but it was the last major city between British Columbia and Alaska, as well as the most likely location where Samuel's prey would have stopped along their journey. With the skies ahead clear, and with no sign of any creatures nearby, Samuel kept on the main road heading into the city, driving slowly to look for signs of the APC. Heavy snow brought by the storms had covered the roads thickly enough to wipe away any tire tracks, so Samuel was forced to search the city street by street, hoping to find evidence that Leonard and Nancy were nearby. After an hour of driving through the entire city, Samuel decided to check the airfield, though his hopes weren't high for locating anything of interest. In one of the hangars, though, his heart jumped as he saw the blackened remains of a fire that had been built near the rear wall of the inside of the structure. The fire did indicate to Samuel that Leonard and Nancy had been at Whitehorse, though where they had gone next was the more puzzling question. Samuel spent another half hour searching the area around the airport, but the snow cover made it impossible to pick up any traces of Leonard and Nancy. Somewhat dejected, Samuel started driving north again, moving to where the highway split, with one way going west and the other going north. As there was no way of telling where Nancy and Leonard had gone, Samuel was unsure of what to do, except to seek guidance from above. After leaving the main portion of the city behind, Samuel began to pass by a smaller area to the north. As he looked over at the buildings to his right, he suddenly swerved off of the road, plowing through the snow and smashing through two sets of guardrails. Unlike the paved airport and Whitehorse proper, the smaller cousin airport to the north of the city was just a dirt strip, though they looked identical under the snow. With no air traffic control tower or hangars, though, the smaller airfield was hardly distinguishable as one except for the object that Samuel had spotted from the highway. In his younger years, one of Samuel's many pursuits had been a two-month-long desire to obtain a private pilot's license. The hobby ended when he was no longer able to financially support it, though the basic skills he'd learned had not disappeared with the years. The sight, then, of a small aircraft lashed to the ground with thick cables and straps made Samuel's heart skip a beat, and he chased after it, hoping that it would somehow still be functional enough to get him into the air. Tracking Leonard and Nancy by ground had grown too difficult to continue, but with a plane, he would be able to not only track them, but finally catch them as well. A quick check of the plane's systems showed that it was surprisingly functional and Samuel quickly set to work loading his supplies. It was a tight squeeze, but after a few hours of work, he eventually got everything stowed away safely inside the plane. The propeller spun noisily in the cold air, and Samuel looked back at his vehicle, triple-checking to make sure that he had transferred everything from it to the plane. With his heavy rifle in the co-pilot seat and the rest of his supplies in the back seat and storage area, Samuel had no more need for his vehicle. After loosening and removing the straps that held the plane down, Samuel hurried back in and began to taxi down to what he could only assume was the end of the runway. The rectangular clearing of trees was the only real clue to the runway's location, so Samuel swung the plane around, putting it right in the center of the cleared area. With one last prayer, Samuel gave the plane full throttle and grimaced in pain as it bounced down the rough runway, making his back throb and ache. It was only a moment until Samuel was in the air, though, and the bouncing gave way to a steady stillness with a slight background vibration from the plane's engine. Though the fuel was only at the three-quarters mark, Samuel's limited knowledge of the plane's range assured him that he would have more than enough time to search the ground for Leonard and Nancy and locate them before they managed to elude him again. 
Chapter 8, 218 AM, April 21st, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. What do you think will happen if we win? Nancy's question came after hours of silent driving, passing through the night as they wound their way towards Anchorage. Half asleep, Leonard opened his eyes and rubbed them groggily as he took in the surroundings. The lights of the APC played over the snowy road ahead of them as Nancy drove cautiously. A green flicker surrounded them, bathing the hills and valleys with a dance of colors. Leaning his head to the right, Leonard looked up, seeing the skies filled with nothing but stars, the blackness of space, and the bright lights of the aurora borealis. It's hard to say. Leonard continued washing the aurora out the window as he replied, Even if we win, there's a long road to recovery left. We don't know how many people are still left. Most methods of communication and transport are gone, and all the stuff we've grown dependent on for the last 30 years has vanished. So what you're saying is there's no hope for us? Humanity's doomed to die out regardless? I wouldn't say that, but it's not going to be easy to get back on our feet. Now, let's assume that there are enough people left that we can, well, you know, repopulate the planet. I'm willing to bet that most of the people who are left aren't going to be terrific farmers, electricians, scientists, or any of the professions that society will need to come back strong. We'll have to spend several decades rebuilding a foundation from which we can start relearning the knowledge that our society had as a collective just a few weeks ago and some of it's going to be lost forever, or at least a very long time. Nancy raised an eyebrow. Why lost forever? Well, I assume that most electronically stored data has been wiped by the EMPs. At the very least, the systems holding that data have been damaged and will have to be repaired somehow. But how do we fabricate the parts for repairing computer systems when those fabrication plants are all overseas with who knows how many of the workers wiped out by the nanobots? Now, that's just the start, though. What about information that was stored in secured locations? Or worse, information that was stored in a single location that was destroyed? We'll never know the value of what was lost, though perhaps that's for the better. Leonard, you're not exactly making a strong case for winning. Nancy laughed as she spoke, but Leonard could hear her worried tone. He turned to look at her, smiled, and patted her on the shoulder. It's not going to be easy. But people are resilient. Now just look at us and what we've managed to accomplish. An office manager and a glorified plumber in a military transport vehicle stuffed to the brim with supplies that we've lost and scavenged more times than I can count. We survived the end of the world and the hell that emerged from it, and we've managed to meet each other and other survivors and form a plan to get rid of the menace that started this whole thing. I'd say that if a few stray survivors can pull together to do this, humanity's got a pretty good chance if we can give it to them. Nancy smiled wistfully as she thought about the possibilities stretched out ahead of them. If we win this, I don't want to settle down. I thought I might at one point, but not anymore. Really? After seeing how the people in Samuel's little cult village lived, I couldn't take it. I know it'll have to be done, but what we're doing here, being out on the road and being active, I think I want to do that instead. Going from place to place, gathering survivors, bringing them into communities. That's how I want to help rebuild. Assuming we win this, of course. Leonard was quiet as he contemplated what Nancy said. What about you? Leonard sighed slowly, thinking back to the job he held just before the end of the world. If we win this... No, wait. When we win this? I think that sounds like a pretty good occupation. I've never been one for a lot of adventure, but it's like you said, <sighs> settling down just doesn't sound all that appealing after what we've been through. Nancy nodded in sympathetic agreement, and the two of them lapsed into silence as they watched the road ahead. Chapter 9, 207 AM, April 21st, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. The refueling process for the APC was agonizingly long without a way to directly siphon fuel from the trucks. 
After a few hours of work, Rachel and David finally got the armored vehicle's tank filled nearly to the brim, and they set off again with David taking a turn at the wheel. The next several hours were spent uneventfully, though they made much slower progress than they had when Marcus had been in control. Marcus spent the hours sleeping as Rachel and David traded driving shifts long into the night. The difference between day and night while under the cover of the storms was barely noticeable, and David and Rachel were growing accustomed to using the constant lightning to navigate instead of relying solely on the APC's headlights. In the early morning hours, as David was once again driving and Rachel was taking a short nap, she was awoken by the sound of a loud groan from the back of the APC. Ah, damn it, my back is killing me. Rachel opened her eyes and turned to see Marcus trying to push himself into a sitting position. He held his back with one hand and had a pained expression on his face, appearing oblivious to everything around him. Rachel watched him struggle for a few moments before she reached out to help. Here, grab my hand. Marcus met Rachel's gaze and looked her in the eyes for a few seconds before glancing at her hand, which he took with a feeble grip. After pulling himself up into a sitting position, Marcus sat up straight and put his back against the interior wall of the APC, sighing as the pressure and pain in his lower back was gradually reduced. Still unsure of Marcus's mental state, Rachel remained in her seat, but held out a bottle of water along with a bag of chips. Marcus took them slowly, thanking her with a slow nod of his head. After downing the food and most of the water, Marcus became more alert. The crazed expression in his eyes was gone, replaced by a mixture of shame and confusion. Uh, where, where are we? Marcus spoke slowly, sipping on the remaining bit of water in his bottle. Rachel passed a map back to him, pointing to a location in the middle of Virginia. Uh, we're not quite sure. Road signs have been hard to come by, and we've had to make more than a few detours. Plus, the storm's not making it easy either. But this is generally where we think we are. Marcus stared at the map, feeling Rachel's piercing gaze searching his entire body, probing for any hints of aggression or insanity. He waited as long as possible before finally looking up at her and answering the question he knew she wanted to ask. I'm fine now. I think. Rachel raised an eyebrow ever so slightly, not the least bit convinced by Marcus's statement. Really, I, I'm fine now. I, I, I don't know what came over me. I'm sorry. I just lost control or something. You've got to believe me. David snorted from the driver's seat and glanced back at Marcus. <laughs> Lost control, my ass. You went berserk, that's what you did. Rachel shot David a dirty look before responding to Marcus. It's not that we don't believe you, Marcus, but you really did lose control in a big way. If we had run into a swarm of creatures or some other nonsense out there in the storms, that would have been the end of us. And, more importantly, Bertha. Marcus started to reply, but was cut off by David. Wait a second, I think we can get through to Leonard and Nancy. Rachel looked out the window and saw that a break in the storms was rapidly approaching as the clouds moved to the east. The closer the edge of the storm grew to them, the faster they would be able to contact Leonard and Nancy, wherever they might be. Before taking the radio microphone in hand, Rachel gave Marcus a sad look, then turned around to deal with the new situation. The sound of David and Rachel trying to contact Leonard and Nancy grew faint as Marcus slid as far to the back of the APC as possible. Stretched out on the other bench seat, Sam's soft whining made Marcus all the more saddened by what had happened, and he struggled to understand what had come over him. Since he had left the driver's seat and had crawled into the back of the APC, Marcus had slept for most of the time, though each time he woke he thought about nothing except getting to the coast as quickly as he could. Memories of his nightmares and the days after the bombs fell came back to him as well, and he soon began to dream of the creatures again, wrestling with their terrifying images in his sleep. Maybe I really am losing it, he thought. Looking down idly, Marcus saw David's computer case wedged between Bertha and the bench seat. David and Rachel were both engrossed in their conversation with Leonard and Nancy, so Marcus pulled the computer out and pressed the power button curious to see what data was readily available to view. After a quick startup sequence, the computer immediately resumed its previous tasks, 
a file download progress bar popped up on the screen, displaying how much time was left before additional satellite images were ready to view. While waiting for the images to download, Marcus browsed through the open folders, looking at a time lapse of the Alaskan and DC areas that David had obtained just before the storms had rolled in. As the download passed the halfway mark, a small pop-up appeared in the lower portion of the screen with a red warning label on it. Not knowing what the warning indicated, Marcus ignored it and continued browsing through the satellite images, undisturbed by David and Rachel, who were still focused on their conversation. When the download finally finished, Marcus started to upload it, but the battery light on the laptop began to flash, and it automatically started to power down. Marcus sighed and closed the lid, replacing the laptop in its case before lying down on the bench seat, thinking nothing more of the computer, its contents, or the warning message that had been flashing on the screen. Just a few moments after Marcus fell asleep, David and Rachel finished their conversation with Leonard and Nancy, having been forced off the radio by another storm rolling in over the East Coast. Rachel glanced back at Marcus, glad to see that he was sleeping so that she could talk to David without being overheard. What if we give him another chance? David chortled in response, scarcely believing what he heard. <laughs> Are you kidding me? After what he did? I don't care what those two say. Marcus went off the deep end, and he's a danger to us now. David? Rachel's tone was a veritable growl, and David gulped suddenly remembering why Rachel had always been the dominant personality in the laboratory. Fine, have it your way, but you'd better be ready to stop him if he goes crazy again. One more stunt like that, and we're screwed. Chapter 10, 2.38 a.m., April 21st, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. Nancy pulled the APC over to the side of the road, or to where she assumed the side of the road was. Stepping out of the car, she was immersed in snow halfway up to her calves as she shuffled around to the passenger seat to exchange driving duties with Leonard. The smell of fresh air, pines, and snow was growing bolder and more overwhelming with each passing mile, though smelling it from inside the APC was nothing compared to what it was like outside. With the engine and headlights off, the only sound was a gentle breeze and the crunch under Leonard and Nancy's feet. Back on the road again, Nancy settled in to get a few hours of sleep as Leonard continued driving them around the massive national park that stretched between Alaska and Canada. The road around the national park was long, but it was the only safe way through the area, especially given the recent snowfall. A squeal of static cut through the quiet cabin of the APC, making Leonard jump in surprise as he tried to keep from running off of the snowy road. After being out of contact with Rachel, Marcus, and David for a while, thanks to the storms, Leonard had practically forgotten about the radio and hadn't considered trying to get in touch with the other group either. Fumbling with the microphone, Leonard slowed the APC to a crawl and turned up the volume on the radio. Nancy took the microphone from him and held it between them as he continued to drive, depressing the button as he spoke. Now, this is Leonard and Nancy. Can anyone hear us? Leonard. David here. What's your status? Leonard nodded to Nancy to speak so that he could concentrate on the road. Uh, we're making for Anchorage to try and take a boat up the coastline. Uh, what about you three? David scoffed. <laughs> three? More like two. The sound of a brief scuffle came through next, followed by Rachel's voice. Uh, sorry about that. We're doing fine here. Just a bit of delay because of the storms. Leonard and Nancy gave each other a puzzled look before Leonard jumped into the conversation. Ah, uh, Rachel, what was that about two people? Rachel sighed deeply and lowered her voice to as close to a whisper as she could. We had a bit of an, uh, incident a while back with Marcus. Rachel quickly explained what had happened all the way until David had thought to try and contact Leonard and Nancy over the radio. We're not sure what to do right now. He's been acting normally since then, but still. I'm kind of surprised that this hasn't happened earlier, and to more of us, Rachel. Nancy spoke softly, and Leonard could hear the concern in her voice for Marcus and the rest of the group. We're not going out for coffee. And neither of us are really prepared for all of this. I know we're not there right now, 
but for what it's worth, I think you should give Marcus another chance. I'm sure you'll need his help again soon. Just keep an eye on him. Another sigh came from Rachel, along with a few quiet comments passed back and forth between her and David. David doesn't quite agree, but I do. Assuming, of course, Marcus doesn't go off again. Rachel continued to speak, but her voice came through garbled and distorted. Rachel, we're losing you. Can you repeat that? Nancy spoke louder as she repeated her request, but the storms rolling in over Rachel, David, and Marcus disrupted the transmission. Frustrated, Nancy slammed the microphone back into its receiver and slumped in her seat. Damn it! Scarcely a moment after the transmission ended, the radio crackled again. Nancy picked up the microphone, giving Leonard a puzzled look as she spoke. Uh, this is Nancy and Leonard. What's going on? R Rachel? Are you there? Instead of the familiar voices of Rachel and David, another burst of static flooded the APC. It sounded different than last time, though, and it was much more powerful. As Nancy prepared to speak again, a distant voice passed by in the background. Leonard turned the volume up on the radio, wincing as another loud squeal came through. A few seconds later, the voice returned, and though it was loud enough to hear, Leonard and Nancy couldn't make out what it was saying. The accent on the voice was heavy, and it sounded like it was either repeating a message or it was a recording on a loop. Leonard pressed down on the gas pedal, taking the APC up to a dangerous speed as he tried to reach the crest of the next hill before the message repeated again. Reaching the top just in time, he pulled the vehicle to a stop, killing the engine so that there would be no background noise to interfere with the transmission. After a burst of static and another squeal, a man's deep voice could clearly be heard, though what he was saying was impossible to know. With a thick accent, the man spoke in a Slavic tongue, saying three different phrases before the transmission began to repeat. Leonard and Nancy sat still for several minutes as they listened to the transmission before looking at each other in sudden understanding. The Russians? Nancy whispered, still listening to the man's voice in a vain attempt to understand what he was saying. It's got to be. Nancy pressed the microphone button and called out again. This is Nancy and Leonard. We are Americans. Please, t tell us who you are. She repeated herself several times, but it did not change the message. Spoken in a simple monotone, whoever was on the other end was either not listening or didn't have the capability of picking up the APC's transmissions from such a long way out. Leonard turned the engine back on and pushed forward, ignoring the repeating radio transmission even as Nancy continued to listen to it and tried to reply. Neither he nor Nancy understood Russian, but the fact that they were picking up a transmission meant that they were one step closer to locating the submarine. Chapter 11, 528 AM, April 21st, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. The storm that had rolled in a few hours earlier and cut off the connection between the two APCs was fast moving and quickly vanished in the light of the coming dawn. Having taken turns driving all night, Rachel and David were both exhausted and had gotten virtually no sleep. Marcus, on the other hand, was well rested and made that point abundantly clear while the APC was at a rest stop as they refueled from a collection of trucks. <sighs> David, just listen to me. Marcus, I'm not discussing this. I'm not going to let you get behind that wheel again, and that's final. David, please. Marcus threw his arms toward the sky in exasperation. I swear to you, it won't happen again. Turning away from the slowly filling water jug, David glowered at Marcus and jabbed his finger at the nearby armored vehicle. The thing in the back of that APC is a thousand times more valuable than any of our lives. You risked it once because you just couldn't handle waiting anymore, or so you claim. I don't really give a shit about that. What I do care about is that device and getting it to the coast intact. Marcus pushed his fingers through his hair ignoring the grease and dirt buildup as he tried to find the words to convince David that what had happened wasn't going to happen again. Turning to Rachel, he gave her a pleading look as she watched him argue with David. Shaking her head, she pushed herself up from a leaning position against the APC and walked toward David. David, 
You and I are thoroughly exhausted. We need to sleep, or else we'll be useless. So we sleep here for the next few hours. I couldn't ride in the back of the APC, let alone sleep, with him driving. Marcus gritted his teeth and walked away from David. He wanted to lash out at the man, to berate him, and call him a fool, but he knew that doing so would only make David's case stronger. As Rachel began to talk to David, Marcus continued walking away from the pair, with Sam trailing behind him. The rest area they were at was dimly lit thanks to the rising sun, but it looked normal aside from a lack of street lights and people attending to their cars and trucks. When he closed and listened, Marcus heard the sounds of trees and insects around him, and he almost felt like he was back on his camping trip in West Virginia before the bombs fell. As Marcus wandered farther into the wooded area behind the rest area, another sound came into focus. Unlike Rachel and David's heated argument, the wind brushing through the trees or the chirp of insects in the foliage, this sound was more artificial and high-pitched. Designed to travel for great distances, the faint sound of a train whistle continued to grow louder, coming from somewhere beyond a hill at the edge of the woods. Upon identifying the sound, Marcus was frozen in place, not sure whether he should pursue the sound or run back to get Rachel and David. With Sam hot on his heels, Marcus made the decision to hurry back to his comrades, hoping that they would listen to him. Back at the APC, the pair was just finishing up the refueling process when Marcus ran up, panting and shouting, ah, Hurry! Get in! We need to move right now! David groaned and shook his head. Ah, oh, not this shit again. Get inside now, David! I just heard a train over that hill! Rachel immediately jumped on what Marcus said, while David looked between her and Marcus, trying to figure out if he should treat the situation seriously or not. You heard a train? Are you sure? Yes, Rachel. If we don't move now, though, we might lose it. It sounded like it was going at a nice clip. Rachel squared her jaw and nodded sharply. Okay, then. Let's go see what this train's doing. David, get in the back. What the hell? The back? Are you senile? Rachel's eyes danced with a fire never before seen by Marcus or David. She grabbed David by the collar and pushed him up against the APC, growling in a low voice that sent a message clearer than the words she spoke. Enough, David! The two stood in silence for a few seconds before David looked away, slumping his shoulders forward in defeat. Rachel backed up a few inches from him, loosening her grip on his clothing. Bertha's our main line of defense, so you and I need to be in the back while Marcus drives. I'm sure that won't be an issue anymore, right? Rachel looked at Marcus expectantly, waiting for a sign of confirmation from him. He nodded quickly and ran to the driver's seat of the APC, not waiting for the rest of them to get in before he started strapping himself in. Rachel hurried Sam into the passenger seat of the vehicle next to Marcus before she and David both climbed in the back and slammed the rear doors closed. With the engine going, Marcus pulled out of the rest area and began moving down the highway, searching for a clearing he could use to get over the long hill into the train tracks he assumed were on the other side. In the back, David pulled out his computer and turned it on, only to be met with a low battery warning. He gave it a puzzled look, but plugged it into a port underneath the bench seat before trying to boot it again. Once the computer was on, he connected it to Bertha, taking full control of the device in case they had to use it. A series of automated checks performed by the computer software was part of the connection sequence, and each check showed that Bertha was fully operational and ready to fire. Hold on! Marcus shouted from the front seat barely a half second before he swung the APC to the right cutting straight through a guardrail. A small ditch was just beyond the rail, and beyond that, a wide field that ended at the base of the hill that he was determined to cross. As they drew closer to the hill, the sound of the train whistle grew louder, and the trio steeled themselves for whatever was coming next. Chapter 12, 5.40 a.m., April 21st, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. The sight of the midnight aurora borealis had been breathtaking, but true beauty came to Leonard and Nancy in the form of the morning light. 
It reflected off of the snow, casting blinding shimmers into the cabin of the APC and making sharp shadows at the bases of the trees and mountains on both sides of the highway. The truly stunning sight, though, was the ocean. In the distance, the blue waters glimmered beyond the horizon, and just before them was the familiar sight of a half-destroyed city. There's Anchorage! For a city in Alaska, Anchorage was larger than Leonard had expected. It was the largest city in the state, nearly ten times larger than Fairbanks, which came in at number two on the population scale. Driving through the modern city, Leonard found it very difficult to tell that they were in such a remote area of the planet. While most of the major buildings had been destroyed or damaged, the main highway leading down to the docks was passable. The closer they got to the ocean, the more buildings they found intact, giving hope to the possibility that they would be able to find a boat to carry them up the coast. As Leonard pulled onto a narrow road that wound along the edge of the water, Nancy kept looking at the ocean, idly wondering how far away the Russian submarine had been when it was transmitting. The waves of blue water were hypnotic, and Nancy found herself lost in them, watching as they crashed against the rocks and sand on the shore. As her gaze followed the water up into the bay, Nancy noticed a black shape beneath the water. Uh, hey, stop for a second. I think I see a whale out there. Leonard eased the APC to a stop and climbed out, taking a pair of binoculars from the back that they had retrieved from a sporting goods store in Whitehorse. He focused in on the black shape, watching as it slid steadily through the water, making no deviations to the left or the right. Submerged just below the surface, it was longer than any whale Leonard had ever seen, though the water made it difficult to decide what it was. After a few moments of watching it cruise along the coast, winding its way around the end of the bay, Leonard finally realized that it wasn't a whale. Nancy! Leonard's voice was brimming with a mixture of excitement and trepidation. What? Are there more of them out there? That's not a whale, Nancy. You just found our Russian sub. Nancy grabbed the binoculars from Leonard and looked at the object herself. Her mouth dropped open in shock, and she quickly handed the binoculars back before grabbing Leonard's shoulders in glee. The pair jumped up and down with excitement for a moment before calming down and coming to their senses. Now we've got to get their attention somehow. Leonard began digging through the back of the APC, looking for some sort of signaling device that they could use to attract the attention of the submarine. Nancy ran around to the back compartment and spoke quickly, already feeling nervous by the proximity of the sub. Are you sure about that? What do you mean? We need to get on board, right? Well, yes, but uh, didn't we expect it to be empty and abandoned? Leonard stopped rummaging through the back of the vehicle and sat on the bumper, considering what Nancy had said. Though they had originally assumed the submarine to be abandoned, the fact that it wasn't couldn't be changed. Uh, does it really matter at this point? It's not like we can take on a submarine in armed combat. If we're going to try to destroy that Nexus, we need their help, and getting them to talk to us is going to be our only shot. Nancy sighed and nodded. <sighs> We've come this far. I guess it's our only shot. Leonard patted Nancy's shoulder and smiled, trying to encourage her. We'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Now why don't you get on the radio and see if you can figure out what channel they're using? I'll keep looking for something back here to get their attention. Leonard continued looking through the back of the APC, setting aside guns and survival supplies in a desperate attempt to find a device to draw the attention of whoever was piloting the submarine. In the front, Nancy began to send out messages on various frequencies, starting with the one that they had previously received the submarine's message on. This message is directed to the submarine. We are located near the docks at your location. We need your help. Please respond. Nancy's message was simple and without flair, but it soon got her more response than she had anticipated. As she was flipping back down through the radio frequencies, she came across a Russian voice speaking loudly. She held down the microphone button and responded quickly, drawing the attention of Leonard, who hopped into the driver's seat next to her. Uh, hello? I don't speak Russian. I'm an American. Please, help us. Nancy started to repeat herself when Leonard pointed out the window at the black shape out in the bay. Look! The submarine had changed course and was moving faster now, heading directly for the longest dock just a mile down the road. 
Leonard jammed on the gas, sending the APC flying down the road toward the docks. Nancy grinned madly with excitement as she watched the submarine move along parallel to their path. Chapter 13 5.43 a.m., April 21st, 2038 Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry Not sure what to expect as they crested the hill, Marcus slowed the APC to a crawl. At the base of the hill, nestled between two rows of trees, a train track was visible, though there was no train yet in sight. Marcus shot the vehicle's engine off and cracked his door open, holding his breath as he listened for the whistle. It had been loud enough for them to hear clearly before they crossed over the hill, though they now heard nothing but the wind. After a moment of waiting, the whistle came again, this time far from the left, down the tracks to the south. Marcus pulled his door shut, started the APC up again, and began tearing down the side of the hill toward the track. That thing must be going at an insane speed to be that far away already! Rachel shouted over the sound of the APC bumping and sliding down the slope of the hill. Just get us next to the tracks and floor it! Marcus didn't answer, being too busy concentrating on not running directly into any trees larger than a sapling as they entered the rows of them at the base of the hill. A sickening snap came from the right side as Marcus slid the APC into the small open strip next to the railroad track. The entire vehicle shuddered violently but did not slow down as the rear end slammed into a large oak tree, sending chunks of bark and branches flying in every direction. So, uh, what's the plan once we catch this thing? David looked up from his computer, directing his question at Rachel. The steady driving by Marcus seemed to help calm David down, though he still occasionally glanced at the front seat with a worried expression. Leaning forward to look out the windshield at the tracks ahead, Rachel shrugged. I'm, I'm not sure yet. We'll need to catch this thing first before we can do anything to try to stop it. Uh, wait, we're going to stop the train? Marcus chimed in with a disbelieving voice. Any particular reason why? The train I encountered on the way to Washington was loaded with supplies and it was headed south. The same was true of the one that Leonard and Nancy saw. If the AI is using the building materials from these trains on that fancy new structure that it's putting up, then maybe stopping the delivery of a train will screw with its schedule. Do you think one trainload of supplies is going to mess with them that much? David asked. Rachel shrugged again, then sat back in her seat. We'll find out, I guess. Sooner than you'd like, in fact. Marcus's near-silent whisper caught the attention of Rachel and David more than a shout would have. They both moved as far forward as possible and peeked through to the front, looking out the windshield. Up ahead, just coming into view, was the distant form of the back of the train that Marcus had first heard approaching the area near the rest stop. The train was vibrating heavily as it traveled, giving evidence of just how fast it was going. Okay, uh, there's the train. Uh, what now? Marcus shifted his gaze back to Rachel and David, who were both staying quiet. Anybody? Rachel bit her lip in concentration and nodded to herself a few times, mumbling under her breath. Finally, she slid back down the row of bench seats and grabbed her rifle, ensuring it was loaded and ready to go. Get us up next to the train, on the right side. I want to see what we're dealing with first. David, get Bertha ready to fire, but only on a quarter power so we don't have to wait so long to get it charged back up. Make sure it's directed out the back so we don't fry the car, okay? The momentary silence in the APC was replaced with a flurry of activity. David opened his computer and began making more adjustments to Bertha, preparing the device to deliver an electromagnetic pulse. Marcus increased their speed sinking lower into his seat as the APC began to bounce more violently over the terrain. The ground next to the railroad track was smooth, but they were doing well over 90 miles an hour and barely catching up to the train. The high speed magnified every bump on the ground and made Marcus hope that his dental fillings wouldn't make an untimely exit. From the rear, the train looked like any other freight train with dozens of boxcars all lined up and connected together. There were no signs of any creatures on the train, nor were there any signs of the nanobot swarms that had accompanied the train that Rachel had encountered, as well as the one that Leonard and Nancy had seen. 
In fact, the only thing odd about the train was the difference in rust and wear between the main train car bodies and their wheels. Stripped of any sign of rust, the wheels shimmered in the sun, having been recently cleaned and polished to a point where they would offer virtually no friction. The boxcar bodies, on the other hand, were still rusted and worn, aside from a few patches of new wood and metal that had been attached without the benefit of being repainted. Marcus finally caught up with the train and brought the APC alongside the last car, keeping his gaze fixed on the path ahead with only a few glances at the train to his left. He shouted back to Rachel as they grew even with the car. And we're at the back of the train now! Keep us steady! Rachel slung her rifle around her neck and under one arm before feeling around the back of Bertha for the door release on her side of the rear compartment. David's eyes grew wide as he realized what she was about to do, but his protestations were lost in the wind as Rachel popped the door. The right-hand door on the back of the APC swung open hard, smacking against the side of the vehicle before settling down into a steady swinging motion. Keeping her right hand on the inside of the closed left door, Rachel hung half of her body out on the back of the APC, keeping her rifle in her left arm as she squinted against the blowing winds. The next of five train cars appeared the same as the last, though once Marcus pulled even with the seventh, all hell broke loose. The side door of the seventh car rolled open, revealing a pack of creatures jammed inside from stem to stern like sardines in a can. Marcus and Rachel stared at the creatures, watching as the pack slowly turned their heads to stare back at the APC and the people inside. With a snarl, three of the creatures pulled themselves onto the roof of the train car and leapt out at the APC. Anticipating their move, Marcus had already started to maneuver the vehicle, bringing it hard left toward the train as he continued to accelerate. Two of the creatures missed them entirely, while the third barely managed to scrape the top as it went flying past, landing with its brethren in the trees. Before more of the creatures could try to get on board the APC, Marcus had already moved up beside the next train car and was continuing on. Though the APC had moved away from the creatures, that made no difference to the beasts. A dozen more poured out of the train car, clinging to the top as they struggled against the wind to move forward toward the armored vehicle. Though the creatures were strong, they weren't prepared for the savage wind and vibrations on the top of the train cars, and more than a few of the creatures slipped and fell. Some tumbled onto the ground, escaping unscathed, while others fell between the train cars, their bodies making a sickening squeal as they were torn apart by the train wheels. Any advice would be appreciated! Marcus yelled as loudly as possible. The creatures on top of the train were gaining on the APC. Worse, though, was that more of the train cars were opening, revealing more creatures that began to chase after the vehicle. The more train cars they passed, the more creatures came after them, making Marcus exceptionally nervous. Several more creatures had tried to jump onto the armored car, and though none had succeeded, Marcus had come dangerously close to crashing into the trees or the train on more than one occasion as he slid the APC back and forth. With each maneuver, Marcus saw that the creatures were getting cleverer as they started timing their jumps to get closer to the APC. With no clear strategy in mind, Marcus hoped that Rachel and David would implement whatever plan they had before the creatures managed to take them down. Chapter 14, 6.02 a.m., April 21st, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. The buzz of a plane engine far overhead distracted Leonard from the sight of the powerful submarine making its way toward the docks. He looked up, holding a hand over his brow to see a small airplane swooping in toward the APC at a dangerously steep angle. The sight of an aircraft not only functioning but airborne was a strange one, and both Leonard and Nancy found themselves frozen in a mixture of curiosity and fear. Is that who I think it is? Nancy shielded her eyes as the airplane circled around overhead, passing in front of the sun. Leonard nodded slowly, knowing that Nancy's unspoken assumption had to be true. How the hell did he get a plane up in the air? Leonard wondered aloud, remembering the twisted and overturned aircraft at the White Horse airfield. None of them worked, unless he found one we missed. I don't know, but we need to get moving, and fast! 
From inside the cockpit of the small aircraft, Samuel coughed heavily as his head spun. He swallowed five pills, three of them painkillers and two of them stimulants. Despite his blurred vision and shaking hands, he held the plane steady enough to make out both passengers and the APC. Though he couldn't see the faces of the occupants of the armored vehicle, there was no doubt as to their identities. After passing just a few hundred feet over them, Samuel pulled back on the stick, turning the plane up and to the side as he passed over the bay. Heading back to land on the beach that was near the dock where the APC was, Samuel didn't notice the large black shape passing below in the waters. In the control room of the Archangelisk, watching through a periscope, Commander Krylov saw both the APC and the plane passing overhead. He shook his head in confusion, trying to discern who the people were that were suddenly all gathered around his ship. He pulled back from the periscope and stared off at the bulkhead for a few seconds as he ran the possible options through his head. Moving swiftly to his chair, he pointed to a soldier standing nervously nearby. Bring us up! The command was short and harsh, and he barked at the crewmen who jumped into action. A few seconds later, the Archangelus began to rise, surfacing as she slowly continued to make her way to the end of the docks. From Leonard and Nancy's perspective, the sight of the Archangelisk showing her full length and girth was a sight unlike any they had seen before. Water poured off of the deck, rushing back into the sea as the black mass surged to the surface. Unlike the submarines that Nancy and Leonard knew from books and movies, the flat deck of the Archangelisk made her look more like a surface vessel than one designed to travel under the water. Rows of circular indentations were located in the fore of the ship, marking the locations of the missiles that were nestled safely inside the mighty vessel's hull. The sail of the Archangelisk, sometimes referred to as the Conning Tower, slid majestically out of the water, and Leonard caught sight of the periscope hatch closing as Commander Krylov ordered the device to be lowered. Finally, as the Archangelisk began to reach her waterline, the tail rudder appeared out of the water, completing the iconic image of the majestic craft. Trembling in fear upon seeing the Russian submarine laid out before them, Nancy grabbed Leonard's hand. What do we do now? Leonard and Nancy both stepped out of the APC and watched the submarine move toward the docks. Leonard took a deep breath, having completely forgotten about the small plane that had buzzed over them before flying off again. Pray that they have someone on board who speaks English. Nancy's nervous chuckle was cut short as the sound of an explosion came from directly behind them. A high-powered gunshot came next, followed quickly by another explosion. The second explosion erupted out of the back of the APC, causing Leonard and Nancy to duck down low as they spun around, looking for the source of the shots. Out of sight, hidden in an outcropping of rocks at the far end of the docks, Samuel breathed heavily from exhaustion, having run several hundred feet from where the plane landed in the sand to a vantage point where he could clearly see Leonard and Nancy. With his hands still shaking from both the run and his body's overall weariness, he had missed his first shot, but was determined not to miss any more. The shot landed as Commander Krylov popped the hatch on the Archangelisk's sail and began to climb out. Instinctively, he kept low as he exited the submarine, motioning to a crew member below to hand him a pair of binoculars. At the sub's slow rate of speed, it was easy for Krylov to get a fix on the man and woman who were crouched behind an armored vehicle, taking cover from a hidden shooter a few hundred meters away. So focused as he was on Nancy and Leonard, Samuel didn't notice the submarine until a low rumbling horn sounded as the Archangelisk's collision alarm went off. Pressing the button manually, Krylov hoped that he would be able to get the attention of the people on the docks so that they would cease their fighting. Nancy and Leonard held their hands to their ears as the horn rattled them fiercely, so loud that they thought their eardrums might burst. From behind the outcropping of rocks, Samuel ceased firing momentarily and raised his head, a puzzled expression on his face as he saw the Archangelisk sliding up toward the dock. You'll not get away this time! Convinced that the submarine had been arranged by Leonard and Nancy as a last-ditch escape, and thoroughly unaware of how ludicrous that idea was, Samuel resumed his firing on the APC, trying to scare Leonard and Nancy enough so that they would run from their hiding place. 
The constant impact from the explosive rounds shot from Samuel's rifle kept Leonard and Nancy pinned, though they knew they couldn't stay there for long. Samuel was getting closer to them with each shot, and though none were direct hits, the spray of concrete and hot metal fragments from the bullets was becoming dangerous. As Leonard and Nancy continued to take fire from Samuel's position, Commander Krylov directed the Archangelisk closer to the port, bringing it within a dozen feet of the thick wooden planks. The water was just barely deep enough for the submarine to avoid bottoming out, and with the tide about to start going out, they wouldn't be able to remain in position for long. Staying low in the sail, Krylov watched the two individuals trapped behind the armored vehicle. They didn't appear to have military training, as the woman was holding tightly to the man's waist as they both kept huddled together, trying to present as small a target as possible. They were also unarmed, a fact that did not go unnoticed by Krylov, and which automatically made them less of a threat in his eyes than the individual firing upon them. Looking back toward the landward end of the docks, Krylov caught a glint of sunlight from the shooter's rifle scope, though it was hard to make out the individual's entire body. If he was going to try to get the two trapped individuals onto the Archangelisk, he would have to try to distract the shooter with some return fire. Chapter 15 6 o'clock a.m., April 21st, 2038 Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry This is suicide. Scarcely half an hour ago, Marcus had been walking through the woods. Listening to the wind and insects had taken him back to his camping trip on the night the bombs fell. Now, horrifying screams from just a few feet away made him cringe, and though he wanted to simply close his eyes and drift back into his memories, there was too much work left to do. As Marcus fought against himself to keep his eyes open and to stay with the fight, a familiar feeling washed over him. It was the urge to run, to take the APC through the trees, over the hill, and away from the creatures reminding him of when he had driven away from the overpass and thrown caution to the wind. Unlike the last time, though, Marcus fought against the urge to run. He took a deep breath and willed his heart rate to slow. He pushed the thoughts of fleeing to the edges of his mind and focused on the singular task laid out in front of him. The survival of himself, Rachel, David, Leonard, Nancy, and the rest of the world was hanging in the balance of what would happen in the next few days. Allowing the scales to be unfairly tipped toward the enemy was not, could not, be an option. This is still suicide. Marcus, go! Rachel screamed at Marcus again, and his eyes snapped open. With his foot planted firmly on the accelerator, he pushed the armored vehicle to its limits, racing against the train, which he could swear was increasing in speed as well. Rachel's hastily constructed plan was, in Marcus's own words, suicide, but they had no other realistic option. The first part of the plan required that they get in front of the train, which was a monumental challenge in and of itself. The train was exceedingly long, and though Marcus was driving as fast as possible, the minutes stretched by agonizingly slowly as he fought with the armored vehicle, trying to eke out speeds at which it had never been designed to operate. At last, though, the lead engine appeared in the distance, and Marcus shouted back to Rachel to alert her to the fact. We're approaching the front! Get ready! Though they were not yet in front of the train, the next part of the plan had to be put into motion before they actually got there. Sitting on the bench seat with his computer in his lap, David struggled to both stay upright and actually see the computer screen through all of the bouncing he had to endure. Looking at a blurry, real-time satellite feed, David had zoomed in on the area where the train and the APC were, hunting along the train tracks for a suitable location for the next part of the plan. There! David jabbed a finger at the screen, sending waves of rainbows rippling to its edges. We're five minutes out from the first bend, and it looks like it'll take the end about seven minutes to reach the same bend. We'll only have a three-minute window, though, so we can't screw this up. Rachel was still holding onto the interior of the APC's left rear hatch door as she hung half her body out of the back, watching the train pass by. Okay, Marcus, get us to the front right now. We'll hit the button in 13 minutes. This is suicide. The thought hadn't left Marcus's mind, but he obeyed Rachel's instruction, 
moving the APC forward even more until they were driving alongside the track about twenty feet ahead of the train. Hold on! Marcus took a deep breath and eased the vehicle onto the tracks, wincing as it bounced and bucked violently going over the rails. Rachel eased herself back into the APC just before they crossed over, though she was flung back out. Barely catching herself on the door in time, she scrambled to get back in the vehicle as she watched a cluster of creatures gather on the top of the lead train engine. The creatures pushed each other back and forth as they watched Rachel regain her foothold and pull herself partway into the APC before sliding forward on the bench seat. How much longer, David? Two more minutes. We'll have a half-second burst, and then we should be good to go. The next two minutes were the longest of Marcus's life. He fought desperately with the steering wheel to keep them on the tracks, but each railroad tie they passed over threatened to throw them off course. Keeping the tracks centered between the wheels of the APC was a monumental task, and Marcus could feel himself growing wearier by the second. Just when he thought he couldn't handle the situation any longer, David shouted from the back compartment. I get ready. I'm starting the countdown. Three, two, one. Marcus grimaced as David counted down, not sure what to expect from the enormous weapon sitting just behind him. As much as he thought there might be a loud explosion, a horrendous blast, or some other type of powerful sound coming from Bertha, the only initial indication that something had changed was Rachel and David shouting with glee. The next indication came in the form of a terrible set of cries from the creatures as the nanobots and their bodies were overpowered, giving off a bright white glow before shutting down completely, taking the creatures with them. The creatures on top of the boxcars were the first to go, falling off to the sides like ragdolls to land on the ground or be crushed under the train's wheels. The creatures crowding the boxcars went next, falling out like firewood as the train vibrated and shook back and forth. The train itself, though, didn't slow down, cutting the celebration short and leading to Marcus's next shouted question. Now what? The smiles on David and Rachel's faces melted away as they realized that a crucial part of their plan, actually stopping the train, hadn't come to fruition. They had killed the creatures on board the train, but it was still traveling at a breakneck speed toward its destination. Unless it was stopped or derailed, it would more than likely reach the coast, bringing more supplies to the nexus that was nearing completion. Rachel took a deep breath and slid towards the back of the APC. Reaching out, she grabbed onto the left hatch and swung it closed again before locking it into place. Slow us down, Marcus! Put our ass right on the nose of the train! Marcus complied without hesitation, letting off of the gas ever so slightly. The train slowly began catching up with them, and Rachel steadied herself, cinching her rifle tight on her back and taking several deep breaths to try and steady her nerves. When the APC was just a few feet from the nose of the train, Rachel looked at David, who suddenly realized what she was about to do. Rachel, don't you dare! Ignoring David's plea, Rachel flung herself from the back of the APC, leaping as high into the air as she could. The distance between the train and the armored vehicle was small enough that she landed on the front of it without incident and managed to quickly find handholds and footholds to steady herself with. What the hell? Marcus looked in the rearview mirror, shocked by what he saw, and did a double take, convinced at first that he was hallucinating. He watched Rachel complete the short jump, landing hard on the front of the locomotive before he turned back around to focus on not running off of the tracks. This is, without a doubt, total and complete suicide. Chapter 16, 625 AM, April 21st, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. Dimitri, get up on deck. Take the forward exit, starboard side, and get your rifle. Commander Krylov shouted the orders through the intercom where they were relayed to Dmitri Dudchuk, who was fast at work in the kitchen. Upon hearing his name being bellowed by the commander, he sprinted down the hall toward the armory, throwing his apron off in the process. At the armory, he retrieved his rifle, a VS-8 chambered in the powerful 338 Lapua Magnum round. With a suppressor half as long as a man's arm bolted onto the front, the VS-8 was still not completely silent 
but the suppressor allowed it to be fired from long distances without immediately giving away one's position. After scrambling to the bottom of the stairs that led up to the deck, Dmitri pushed a nearby intercom button and reported his ready status to the commander. Krylov's next orders were given in haste, with an urgency behind them that made Dmitri's hairs stand on end. Uh, two individuals are pinned down by explosive sniper fire from the end of the pier. Get yourself on the deck and put rounds down at the shooter's position. We need him to cease firing long enough to get these people on board so we can interrogate them. Don't kill the shooter. Just get him to stop firing. Understood, sir. Dmitri didn't wait for another reply from Krylov. He bounded up the stairs to the hatch that had been opened by two other crew members who were standing by. After peeking over the edge of the hatch, Dimitri saw that a direct line of sight to the shooter's position was impossible from inside the ship, thanks to a large crane at the end of the docks that blocked his view. Dressed in black to match the color of the Archangelisk's hull, Dimitri crawled out onto it and hurried back toward the sail as he listened to the gunshots and explosions continue to echo over the water. After crawling a dozen feet, Dmitri pushed himself up into a crouching position and stared through his rifle scope along the length of the pier. The two individuals taking shelter from the shooter appeared as though they were half dead already, thanks to the constant fire they were taking from a group of rocks back toward the shore. Dmitri steadied his rifle against the sloping hulk of the Archangelisk's sail, trying to keep his body hidden as much as possible while he got a fix on the shooter. Krylov didn't want to immediately kill the shooter without knowing what forces he was dealing with. With no background information on either parties, Krylov needed more time to make up his mind on who to take aboard. One thing was for certain, though. No matter what happened, he needed to get someone on the submarine who could tell him what had happened to the world. Ten agonizingly slow seconds after putting his eye to the scope, Dmitri finally spotted his opponent's scope from the sun reflecting off of it as he jostled the rifle around, reloading another ten-round magazine. Dmitri wasted no time in taking his shot after he acquired the target. Now, placing the target slightly above the center of his scope reticle, Dmitri squeezed off a shot, watching as the round impacted on the rocks a few feet below the shooter's position. Dmitri's constant, round-the-clock practice on the rifle had increased his skills a hundredfold, and he was certain that he could have hit the shooter, but Krylov's orders were clear. Don't kill him. The spray of rocks from Dmitri's shot had an immediate effect. Samuel ducked down low, alarmed by the sudden introduction of opposing fire from an unknown source. An instant after the round impacted on the rocks, Samuel heard the squeal of a megaphone from the direction of the submarine that had stopped a hundred feet beyond the APC at the end of the pier. Samuel was too far from the submarine to tell what they were saying, but he realized that it had to be where the return fire was originating from. Devils! Monsters! You will not escape! Samuel scurried down the backside of the rocks, hurrying to change positions so that he could try to take out the counter-sniper who, he assumed, was firing from the deck of the submarine. Closer to the Archangelisk, in front of their APC, Leonard and Nancy heard the sound of the thick Russian accent quite clearly as it burst from the ship's external megaphone. Get yourselves on board! Now! Hurry! The shot that had come from the direction of the submarine and flew over the APC to land at the rocks where Samuel was shooting from had caused the explosive firing to cease, for the moment at least. The only question left on Leonard and Nancy's minds was whether or not the Russians on board the submarine could be trusted. Having started off their journey expecting the submarine to be abandoned, Leonard and Nancy had continued onward even after encountering the sub's radio transmissions, though they had no idea what to expect. In this case, Leonard said, pulling Nancy to her feet, we should probably go with the devil that we don't know, uh, seeing as that the devil we do know is trying to murder us. With a quick look back at the APC, Leonard ran forward, pulling Nancy up beside him and propelling her in front, running toward the sub. Upon seeing the two individuals running toward the Archangelisk, Krylov yelled into the intercom, ordering his men to get to the deck immediately. Get a plank out there, now! He leaned over the sail and shouted down to Dmitri next, who still had his gaze trained on the rocks. 
Keep that sniper down, Dimitri! Dimitri shouted a quick, Duh! and continued scanning the rocks. After the first shot, the sniper had vanished, disappearing behind the outcropping without firing another round. His sudden disappearance worried Dimitri, though the break in firing didn't last for long. Chapter 17 6 10 a.m., April 21st, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. The gap between the APC and the front of the lead train engine was small, but from Rachel's perspective, it took a lifetime to cross. B movie reels flashed through her head as she pictured countless train scenes where the main character performed actions similar to hers. Rachel nearly laughed at the thought, remembering how absurd such actions seemed from her couch. Her action, on the other hand, seemed like the most reasonable one, though she was quickly beginning to regret it. The noise of the train engine was overwhelming, rattling Rachel's bones as the vibrations threatened to make her lose her grip. Searing heat shot through her hands and forearms, and she began to move along the front of the engine quickly, hoping that she wasn't being burned too badly. Two welded steel rods about four feet apart ran around the whole train engine, forming a foothold and handhold for Rachel to use. Moving to them, she quickly maneuvered to the right side of the train, where a window was located. Hooking one foot inside, she pulled herself through, relieved that she had managed to avoid falling off of the train. After climbing from the front of the train engine into the compartment, Rachel thought that she would just be able to shut down the engine, but it wasn't that simple. The controls had been jammed into place by the body of one of the creatures who had collapsed onto them when the EMP was generated by Bertha. While this normally wouldn't have been a problem, the creature at the controls was enormous, having apparently been a grossly overweight person when they were mutated by the nanobots. Rachel tried to squeeze past the body to reach the controls, but the creature was at least 400 pounds, making it impossible for Rachel to do anything to slow down or stop the train. Looking around, Rachel remembered that the lead engine wasn't the only one connected to the train, and was certainly not the only one that was actively pulling the train cars behind them. She ran to the back of the engine compartment and slid open a narrow doorway. After stepping across a small gap to the next engine in line, she entered that compartment and began looking around for its controls. The second engine in line was an entirely different model than the first, and its layout was radically different as well. A moment of searching was all it took to locate the master controls, and Rachel pulled on the emergency brake lever, hoping that it would stop the entire train. While the brake lever was connected to each of the engines behind it, it did not control any engines at front. Thus, while it engaged the brakes on the engine Rachel was in and each of the others in line, the lead train engine continued to press forward, putting terrible stress on the linkage joining the two engines. Just as Rachel realized what was going on, though, the opposing forces of the train and the lead engine tore apart the linkage that held them together. Rachel was thrown forward as the lead engine disconnected, rocketing forward while the rest of the train began to slow down. She looked through the window on the door in front of her, watching as the lead engine increased in speed, no longer restrained by the weight of the cars it was pulling along. After Rachel had leapt from the APC to the train engine, Marcus had pulled back off the track, maintaining a safe distance from the train engines and cars. He and David both heard the sound of the engine's linkage breaking before Marcus saw it pull away, rocketing forward while the rest of the train shuddered as its brakes began to slow it on the tracks. Glancing furiously between the two separate sections, it took Marcus a moment to see Rachel's face in the window of the second train engine. She was motioning toward the distant engine, pointing to it and screaming something that Marcus and David had no hope of hearing. As Marcus watched the lead train engine move further away, he suddenly realized why Rachel was making such a fuss. With a quick thumbs up to her, he pressed down on the accelerator, electing a cry of surprise from David as the APC sped forward to catch up with the escaping engine. What the hell are you doing? David shouted from the back gathering up his computer equipment that had been scattered by the sudden acceleration. Something happened. I think Rachel had to disconnect the lead engine, and now it's getting away. So what? The creatures are dead. That's not the point, David. If that engine reaches the coast, it'll be pretty obvious that something happened to the train along the way. 
I don't think we need to be advertising our arrival like that, do you? David clamped his mouth shut, raising an eyebrow and nodding in resignation. Ah, so what are we supposed to do about it? Run the thing off the track? Marcus's wicked grin was visible to David in the rearview mirror. His face paled slightly, and he stammered as he tried to argue. You, you, you've got to be joking. Th this is insane. Got any better ideas? The armored vehicle was now even with the back of the train engine, and Marcus checked his harness one last time. If not, then you'd better hold on. Marcus, don't do it! David pleaded, searching for any handhold he could find in the rear compartment. This thing may be armored, but there's no way it can do this. She can take it! Marcus shouted back at David. Not waiting around to hear David's response, Marcus pulled them to the left by six inches, bringing the front left bumper of the APC in contact with the side of the train. Though the train vastly outweighed the APC and had the advantage of traveling in a straight line at a high rate of speed, it had the particular disadvantage of being locked into the train tracks. Forward and backward forces were easily dealt with by the train, but a large force pushing from the side was a disaster waiting to happen, as a deviation of a few inches could spell the end for the locomotive. The initial impact from the APC did little to the engine other than make it rock back and forth ever so slightly. Pulling back to the right, Marcus kept them a good two feet from the side of the train engine before moving back in. This time, instead of taking it slowly, he turned the wheel sharply, bracing his body and closing one eye as the armored vehicle ran up against the train. Unlike the last impact, which did no more than rattle the train engine, Marcus's second attempt was an overwhelming success. The armored vehicle delivered just enough force to send the train engine rocking up onto two wheels. Mild deviations in the rails and an ever-so-slight slant in the ground spelled disaster for the powerful engine, which slammed back down onto all four wheels before rocking to the right. Marcus's eyes widened in panic as he saw the heavy frame of the locomotive tilting towards them. He pressed both feet on the brake pedal, closing his eyes as the black form of the train fell over, slamming to the ground just inches in front of their vehicle. A wave of rocks and dirt flew into the air, showering the APC in a hailstorm of earth. Though Marcus couldn't see the train engine sliding forward, he could certainly hear it as it scraped along the ground, twisting and rolling. After a few seconds, the engine began to impact on rows of trees, brutally smashing them as it slowed down. With a sudden jolt, the APC finally came to a stop, though Marcus kept his feet on the brake pedal while he clung to the steering wheel with an iron grip. The sight of the train engine slowly sliding through the woods ahead of them made him keenly aware of just how close they had come to being crushed under its immense weight. With a gulp, Marcus slowly released his grip on the wheel and eased off the brake. He turned to look at David, who was lying on the bench seat with his arms and legs braced against the side of the APC. The two men stared at each other for a moment before Marcus slowly began to turn the APC around. Though the rest of the train took several minutes to come to a full stop thanks to its incredible weight and momentum, it was still a few miles back behind them, and Marcus's next priority was to check on Rachel to see how she had fared. Driving back to her, neither Marcus nor David spoke a word to each other having been thoroughly shaken by the near-death experience. Chapter 18, 6.42 a.m., April 21st, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. The large black submarine was even bigger than it had first appeared to Nancy as she ran towards it with Leonard right on her tail. Two people dressed in thick coats popped out of a hatch near the port side of the sub, carrying a large, thick plank of wood that they began to slide out across the water toward the docks. Uh, the plank was only a few feet wide, but it was the only means of getting on board the submarine. The lack of firing was suddenly worrisome to Leonard, who turned to look at the rocky outcropping just as Nancy stepped onto the plank, connecting the docks to the submarine. One of the two crew members who had helped set up the plank kneeled down next to it, holding on with both hands to keep it steady. The other crew member was standing halfway across, directly above the freezing water with his arm outstretched to help Nancy cross. 
Leonard stopped for a few seconds and watched as Nancy began to cross the plank when a searing pain arced through his right leg, sending him crumpling to his knees. A split second later, the boom of a distant rifle echoed across the water, and Leonard screamed, cradling his leg with both hands as he tried to crawl toward the submarine to escape the shots he knew were coming next. The pain and fire in Leonard's leg was spreading, and he felt his heart rate skyrocket. From his new perch on the opposite side of the rocks, Samuel smiled as he watched Leonard's leg shatter from the explosive bullet, and he steadied his aim once again for a second shot. Samuel wasn't sure whether or not his explosive-tipped bullets would work on flesh, but his aim had just happened to send the bullet directly into the fibula, triggering the micro-explosive which tore apart Leonard's leg far more than the bullet could have done on its own. Before Samuel could squeeze the trigger a second time, though, a curious sensation filled his body. Time slowed around him, and he felt as though his body was no longer his own as he fell backwards. He watched his body tumble slowly down the rocks, though he was puzzled as to the reason why he had suddenly lost all will to stay standing or continue shooting Leonard. At the bottom of the rocks, exposed to the enemies that he had so desperately tried to kill, Samuel urged his body to move, but couldn't find the strength to do so. From his position at the base of the Archangelisk's sail, Dimitri kept his rifle trained on the limp body of the man who now lay crumpled at the base of the rocks. The intensive training that he had undergone by the direct orders of Commander Krylov had paid off in spades. Momentarily worried that the commander would punish him for shooting the sniper, Dimitri glanced up to where the commander was standing at the top of the sail. Krylov looked down at Dimitri and nodded to him once before returning to gaze at the body of the shooter. Samuel was still breathing, barely, though he had made no more aggressive movements toward Nancy and Leonard. Taking no chances, Krylov barked at his men to hurry, and they quickly escorted Nancy below deck before running over to Leonard and carrying him aboard. Even from his position high above the deck, Commander Krylov could see that the man's wounds were grave, and he hoped that the young doctor on board would be able to stem the flow of blood before it was too late. Chapter 19, 6.34 a.m., April 21st, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. Rachel stepped out of the train engine haltingly, nearly falling as she lowered herself slowly to the ground. The initial jump from the APC to the front of the engine had only been a few feet, but she had injured herself far more than she originally realized. Her old chest pains were back and worse than before. Her face and arms were bruised, and her whole body was covered in soot and lacerations. The adrenaline that had kept her from feeling the full extent of her injuries was beginning to wear off and she sat clumsily on the ground, waiting for Marcus and David to drive back to her. Every breath was a struggle, and Rachel found herself growing dizzy. She willed herself to stay awake, trying to focus on the train tracks that stretched out in front of her to keep her mind occupied. The sound of a distant engine began to drone in her left ear, then the ringing in her right ear was overwhelmed with the sound as well. Rachel opened her eyes in surprise, not having noticed that she had them closed with her head slumped down on her chest. She tried to sit up but failed, then settled for an awkward roll under her side before trying to push herself into a kneeling position with her weakened arms. A plume of dust enveloped Rachel, followed by the sound of an engine dying and a pair of large doors being opened. Footsteps approached her and she raised her hand, struggling to reach the gun that was still strapped to her back. Powerful hands gripped her by the arms and hoisted her up to take her a short distance away before gently laying her down on the ground. A soft piece of material was pushed underneath her head, and she felt a cool liquid flow over her face, making her gasp in shock. And Rachel's eyes fluttered open, and she saw the concerned expressions of David and Marcus hovering over her, fading in and out of focus as she struggled to maintain consciousness. You look like hell, Rachel. J just hold still. The sound of Marcus's soothing voice had an instant calming effect on Rachel, and she stopped struggling to move. More water was poured on her, this time on her hands and arms. A small trickle came to the corner of her mouth next, and she tilted her head, swallowing mouthfuls at a time. 
When the water stopped, Rachel took several deep breaths, trying to stand up again, but she eventually gave up, slumping back against the backpack under her head. Did... did you stop the train? Rachel's words were slurred and slow, but she managed to croak them out despite the intense pain in her chest. David looked at Marcus before answering. It won't be arriving at the coast. Marcus did a damned fine job at stopping it. A small smile brushed over Rachel's face and she felt her body relax even more after hearing that they had successfully stopped the train. A few minutes ticked past with David and Marcus checking Rachel over, making sure that she was as comfortable as possible and searching for any pain medications they had in their supplies. Rachel cracked one eyelid at the sound of a soft whine near her and she reached out, feeling Sam's soft fur and pulling him in next to her. After an hour had gone by and Rachel had received a hefty dose of painkillers, she tried once again to sit up, this time succeeding. The pain in her chest was muted but still noticeable, and she wondered how many ribs she had cracked during her leap from the APC to the train. Leaning up against one of the armored vehicle's hefty tires, she stroked Sam's head as she watched David and Marcus explore several of the boxcars on the train, searching for supplies and making sure that there were no surviving creatures. Marcus was the first to notice her sitting up, and he waved at her, then called for David to follow him back to the APC. The two men jogged back to her, concern written on their faces as they approached. Rachel, you really shouldn't be sitting up. Just lie back down, please. David, I'm, I'm fine. The painkillers are working, and I don't feel like sleeping. Marcus and David both sat down next to Rachel, eyeing her intently for any signs that she might need more help. They looked at each other quickly, then Marcus spoke. Well, if she's up, we might as well tell her your idea and see what she thinks. What idea? <coughs> Rachel coughed after she spoke, an action that brought pain to her chest, but thankfully didn't involve coughing up any blood. David was nearly beside himself with excitement and stood up as he spoke, pacing back and forth nervously. We've been looking over the train, and from what we can see, it's still fully operational. So then I started asking myself, if I was the AI and I saw this big armored car start rolling in, what would I do about it? Rachel's head hurt too much for her to make the connections that David was laying out, so she just stared at him, waiting for him to continue. His eyes darted back and forth and he coughed, uncomfortable with the silence. <clears throat> uh, right. Uh, anyway, if we show up in the APC, we'll just be signing our own death warrants, especially with Bertha in the back. But if we went in disguised, then we'd have a better chance of getting right up close to the Nexus, close enough for Bertha to have the best possible chance at wiping out the swarms. The train. Rachel nodded slowly. You're right. It'll work. The AI expects trains to be arriving all the time. It wouldn't expect an attack to come from one. Even if it eventually notices that there aren't any creatures left on board, we'll be so close that we can trigger Bertha and wipe it out in one go. Marcus spoke next, looking at both David and Rachel as he spoke. David's certain he can get all of the emergency systems reset in the next few hours. Then all we have to do is get Bertha loaded into one of the boxcars and we'll be set to go. We can ditch the APC and just take the train all the way to the coast. Once we get going, we shouldn't have to do anything else but sit back and enjoy the ride. Rachel cracked a half smile, pleased by the solution that David and Marcus had found. She was also happy to see that David had apparently become less upset with Marcus, or was at least choosing to look past his frustrations enough to work together with him. Nice work, boys. Rachel gestured to herself limply with one hand, coughing from the small amount of exertion. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I'm not in any shape to help. Marcus smiled and scooted closer, taking Rachel's hand and holding it tightly. We're just glad you survived. That was a nasty thing you did. I still can't believe it worked. You and me both. Marcus smiled again and patted Rachel's hand before he stood up to address David. Now let's get started, shall we? Chapter 20 6.55 a.m., April 21st, 2038 
Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. Leonard! Nancy screamed Leonard's name as she was pulled below deck, hoping beyond hope that he was all right. She kicked and scratched at the men who pulled her along, trying desperately to get back to Leonard, who was quickly brought below and rushed to the surgical room. Kept from running to her friend's side, Nancy's screams echoed down the halls of the Archangelisk, sending chills down the backs of every man who heard her. Two crew members hoisted Leonard up onto a surgical bed, stepping quickly away with looks of disgust and fear on their faces. Never having seen such gruesome injuries before, the men were unsure what to do. A young man in scrubs with a face mask and rubber gloves on ran into the room from the hall, his eyes wide as he saw the damage done to Leonard's leg. Shouting at the two men standing nearby, he ordered them to take off their heavy jackets, wash their hands and arms, and don masks and gloves. One of the two men tried to argue, but the look on the doctor's face made him close his mouth and obey the doctor's orders. With only a basic medical training, the doctor had never dealt with an amputation scenario before, but time was running out. The cauterization done to Leonard's leg wasn't stemming the flow of blood very much, and without immediate attention, he would die on the operating table. Working furiously, the doctor began to remove Leonard's clothing, grimacing at the damage done to his leg. The lower half of Leonard's leg hung off of the table, and the doctor quickly removed it, slicing through the few remaining pieces of tissue that were holding it on. He handed the severed leg to the first crew member that walked back in, who caught it and held it out in front of himself in horror. Put that down and look in the drawer there. Uh, give me two of the bags plus one of those and hurry. The doctor pointed at a medical stand with a crossbar and two hooks on it, then turned back to Leonard to examine the wound up close. He quickly applied a sterilizing solution to the wound and began to close off the artery, finishing the job that the explosive had started with its partial cauterization. With the blood flow slowed to a trickle, he picked up a pair of tweezers and began to remove pieces of metal from the wound, adjusting an overhead light as he went along. Once the foreign matter was removed from the wound, the doctor grabbed the bags of saline solution from the crew member who held them out, quickly setting them up and inserting a needle into Leonard's arm. For all of the pain that he was under, Leonard was still unconscious, a fact that the doctor was grateful for. Get me the bottle, over there! The doctor pointed at a squeeze bottle sitting on a table, and the second crew member rushed over with it, backing away as quickly as the doctor took it. Squeezing gently, the doctor washed the stump of Leonard's leg, clearing away bits of dirt, debris, and clotted blood that remained in the wound. Once he was certain the wound was clear, the doctor motioned for both crew members to come to either side of the surgical table. Take his leg there and hold it up. Keep it elevated. The two men exchanged nervous glances, but their hesitation was no match for the doctor's authoritative tone. While they held Leonard's leg above the rest of his body, the doctor got a large bundle of gauze and a small spray bottle from a cabinet. After shaking the bottle a few times, he sprayed the wound with several layers of it, coating every visible surface with the antibiotic solution. Once the solution started to drip down, he began to wrap gauze around Leonard's wound, winding it tightly in several layers before tying it off. The crew members gently lowered Leonard's leg at the doctor's orders, letting it sit on top of a few pillows that he had stacked at the end of the surgical table. Though the wound had been treated to the best of the doctor's abilities, he still wasn't finished. The final movements had started to rouse Leonard, who was groaning loudly in pain. The doctor fumbled with a key that was on a chain around his neck, using it to open a small cabinet that contained a stock of opiates. Selecting a modest dose of morphine, he slowly injected it into Leonard's bloodstream. The effect was nearly immediate, and Leonard slumped back, his half-open eyes closing as his body began to relax. After attaching a heart rate monitor to Leonard's chest, the doctor pointed at him and addressed both of the crew members sternly. Watch him, and don't leave his sight! Call me if he starts to wake up, or if anything happens. I'll be on the command deck, giving Commander Krylov an update. The two crew members nodded and stepped next to Leonard, watching his sleeping form closely as the doctor hurried out of the room, stripping off his mask and gloves as he went. Chapter 21 
8.42 a.m., April 21, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. After carrying Rachel into the lead engine compartment on the train and making sure she was as comfortable as possible, Marcus and David worked quickly. Over two hours were spent examining the train, resetting the emergency system, and ensuring that everything was ready for them to load Bertha and resume their trip to the south. Neither Marcus nor David had any experience with the operation of trains, but they adapted quickly and soon had every system operational, or so they hoped. The next step was to load Bertha into one of the boxcars, a feat that would be no small task given the device's size and weight. With Rachel needing to stay immobile, Marcus and David would need to stay in the lead locomotive with her, but there was not enough room for Bertha to be in the same location. Six more engines were lined up behind the lead before the row of boxcars started, so there was no choice but to load Bertha up in the first boxcar. The group hoped that they wouldn't have to use Bertha in a hurry, uh, due to the fact that it would take a few minutes to go from the front of the train to the first boxcar. David had volunteered to stay in the boxcar with Bertha, but Rachel shot down that idea, insisting that they stay together while the train was going, just in case they ran into trouble. As for loading Bertha onto the boxcar, Marcus and David finally decided on a method that they hoped would be relatively easy. Marcus pulled the APC around, backing up as close as possible to the side door before hopping out to look at the situation. The back of the APC was a good foot lower than the floor of the boxcar, and though Marcus could get the back of the vehicle flush with the train car, it would do no good unless they could even out the height difference. Marcus slid the boxcar door open a few feet and hopped inside, looking around for any type of material that they could use to build a ramp from the APC to inside. The area inside the boxcar was packed full of various materials, most of which Marcus didn't recognize. As his eyes adjusted to the dim light, he saw a pile of concrete railroad ties stacked along both sides of the interior. Several inches thick and nearly nine feet long, the massive blocks weighed several hundred pounds and were exactly what Marcus was looking for. Hey, David, come here. David jogged up and peeked inside. What's going on? Marcus motioned for David to come into the boxcar, then pointed at one of the railroad ties. If we can get one of these on the ground just outside the train, uh, that should get the APC high enough for us to slide Bertha right into the car. David gently kicked the concrete tie that Marcus motioned to and shook his head. Now those things have got to be, what, six or seven hundred pounds? Marcus slapped David on the back, smiling as he moved to the end of the tie. <laughs> Come on, we can get this out of here no problem. Just get back here and help me push. David glanced around and walked past Marcus to the front wall, plucking a thick steel rod up from off the floor. Gesturing for Marcus to stand aside, David planted the metal rod in a small gap at the base of the tie and threw his weight onto it. The tie shifted forward as David pushed down, moving several inches toward the door. Marcus raised an eyebrow and watched as David got the tie all the way to the door before turning around and holding out the steel rod. Uh, you want to do the rest? Marcus laughed and took the rod, placing it in a gap along the long side of the concrete tie. Ha <laughs> ha, damn, David! Very nice. Very nice indeed. Mimicking David's technique, Marcus placed the end of the rod under the concrete tie and pushed down, sending the tie rolling out of the boxcar to land just on the outside of the tracks. Still chuckling to himself, Marcus jumped out and got in the APC while David watched, a small smile on his face. Marcus backed the APC up until the rear wheels were touching on the concrete tie, then began to slowly accelerate, watching David in the rearview mirror through the open hatch doors. A shout from Rachel made David turn his head to look out the side door of the boxcar, but he saw nothing. Her shout didn't sound urgent, so he turned back to Marcus, guiding him to continue backing up. The APC's knobby wheels slipped briefly on the thick concrete before finally grasping hold, raising the overloaded rear end of the vehicle to a height that was just above the back of the boxcar. The gap between the boxcar and the APC was only six inches, so David shouted for Marcus to stop and turn off the engine. Rachel shouted again, too faintly for David or Marcus to hear what she was saying. David leaned his head out of the side of the boxcar again, 
opening the other side door and shouted back, We're almost done. Hang tight for a second. He went back to the rear of the APC and climbed in, moving to the front of the rear compartment where Marcus was already bracing himself against the dash of the APC. We'll push on three, okay? David nodded in acknowledgement and put his hands around the end of Bertha, placing his legs against the front of the rear compartment. Marcus counted down and, on the count of three, David pulled while Marcus pushed, the both of them working together to slide the heavy device into the train car. For the first second, nothing happened. Then Bertha began to move, sliding faster across the floor of the armored vehicle than they had expected. Once the device was halfway out of the back of the APC, it tipped down, slowing as it scraped along the rough wood floor of the boxcar. Ah, keep pushing! Marcus shouted through his and David's groans as they struggled to finish moving the massive device. With a final heave, the last bit of Bertha went out of the APC, closing the one-inch gap to the boxcar with a loud thud. Marcus and David continued pushing, but Bertha was no longer moving thanks to the friction between it and the rough floor of the boxcar. Thankfully, though, the device had landed just a few inches inside the doorway, just enough so that the side door could be slid shut. Marcus and David both plopped into the bench seats of the APC's rear compartment, breathing heavily from the effort of moving the massive device. <sighs> How what? Marcus said, nearly breathless. Ah, you didn't have some fancy way of moving that, too? <laughs> David snorted and shook his head, his smile growing slightly larger in light of Marcus's remark. Rachel's voice came from the front of the train again, louder this time and more panicked. Alarmed, Marcus and David both clambered into the front seats of the APC, exiting the vehicle and looking down the track toward the locomotives. Rachel's scream was louder, but it was also being drowned out by a new sound that was rapidly approaching. Rotor wash kicked up a huge dust cloud as a black helicopter descended from the sky, sending debris flying in every direction. Chapter 22 8.30 a.m., April 21st, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. Nancy glared at the guard who stood in front of the door to the room she was in. She had been forced into the room almost two hours prior, given a glass of water and a plate of food, and then told in broken English to be still and wait. Going up against the beast of the man armed with an automatic weapon when she was defenseless wasn't something she was afraid of, but she knew that doing so would help neither herself nor Leonard. You bastards had better be taking damned good care of him. Nancy mumbled loud enough for the guard to hear, but he didn't even bother to glance in her direction. Standing up, she paced back and forth, watching as the guard flicked his eyes left and right to follow her movements. A knocking at the door made her pause, and the guard reached around and slid the door open then stepped to the side, all the while keeping Nancy directly in his gaze. The young man, though older than the guard, stepped into the room, wearing a hat which he removed as soon as he ducked under the low doorway. He nodded to the guard, who gave a quick salute before ducking out to stand in the hall. The man who came in slid the door shut and motioned to the couch where Nancy had been seated previously. She went back to her seat slowly, eyeing the man as she went, trying to size up who he was and what he wanted with her. In addition to his fancy-looking hat, he wore a black jacket with strange insignia on the side, along with the same slacks and shoes she had seen on the other crew members. His shirt was more upscale than she had seen, though, and the look in his eyes was one of leadership and command. As Nancy sat down, the man did as well, in a chair opposite the couch. He smiled briefly at her before speaking his accented voice slipping out through pearly white teeth. Madam, I apologize for keeping you here for so long. Uh, with the attack on the surface and the injury of your comrade, I had to ensure the safety of my vessel and my crew before I attended to you. Nancy opened her mouth to speak, but the man in front of her continued, gliding effortlessly over the words that started to come out of her mouth. Before you ask, your companion is still alive, if only barely. The doctor just delivered the report to me. 
His leg was severely damaged and had to be amputated, but the doctor was able to stabilize him for the moment. He lost a lot of blood, but uh, the doctor thinks he will pull through as long as infection doesn't set in. Our doctor is new and inexperienced, but he assures me that he did the best he could under the circumstances. Your companion will need to rest for a time, but you'll be able to visit him soon. Until then, we could certainly stand to learn a few things from each other, like our names, for a start. I am Commander Pavel Krylov, acting commander of the Typhoon-class submarine Arkongolisk. Nancy stuttered, taken aback by the professionalism of Krylov's voice and the confident way in which he spoke. When she had been dragged into the submarine, she had half expected to be tortured by a hardened military officer, not spoken to in English by someone with a fair sense of decorum. Ah, uh, my name is Nancy Sims. My friend's name is Leonard McComb. Commander Krylov nodded, jotting down notes in a small leather-bound pad. It's a pleasure to have you aboard, Miss Sims, though I do wish it was under frightfully different circumstances. Nancy leaned back slightly on the couch. She was still nervous thanks to being confined to a single room, but the commander of the submarine, what did he call it? The Archangel? Seemed to be reasonable enough. Time was not on their side, though, and Nancy stared at the commander, considering her options for explaining why she and Leonard needed his help. With a deep breath, Nancy spoke, hoping that she would somehow be able to convince Krylov that the insanity she was about to tell him was actually the truth. Uh, tell me, Commander... What do you know about what happened on the surface? Chapter 23 Anchorage, Alaska Samuel longed for death. It was slow in coming, though, slower than he had ever dreamed possible. The passing of the sun, the moon, the storm clouds, and the snow all came and went more times than he could recall. Despite his pain and the deathly cold he was surrounded by, Samuel still felt himself clinging to life. Barely able to move his arms and hands, Samuel determined that the bullet from the intruders must have severed his spinal cord. Each time a wave of pain washed over him, Samuel was hopeful that it meant he was about to pass into the next world, but he received no such grace. Inches of snow piled up around him, burying his body from the legs to the head, where he hoped for the release of death that would come from asphyxiation. Again, death was cheated, and though Samuel's lungs filled with water from the slowly melting snow, his body refused to die. Unable to move more than a few inches, Samuel's body soon began to freeze. His muscles grew rigid and his skin frosted over, though he still retained his sensations of touch in his arms, upper chest, and head. Trapped between life and death, the last traces of sanity rapidly broke down in Samuel's mind. He did not speak verbally, but in the fortress of his head, he rambled on for days without stopping, talking to everyone and no one at once. The few nanobots that infected his body were not enough to form a critical mass to transform him into one of the creatures, but they had been enough to slowly infest his body to the point where they could keep him alive. They could not heal him, but their base-level programming ensured that his body would continue functioning for the foreseeable future denying him entry into the place he so craved to go. Fending off the worst of the cold and oxygenating his lungs, the devices had been deposited into his bloodstream when he was attacked by the small creatures. The secondary infection caused by the creature's scratches had stimulated his immune system as it worked to fight off the invading bacteria. This immune system response had an additional effect of keeping the nanobots at bay. Once he was critically injured, though, all bets were off and his body began to shut down. No longer facing the same level of resistance as they had before, the nanobots quickly went to work, clotting his wounds and keeping his body functioning at a basic level. Just a few moments had stood between life and death, and for Samuel, his perpetual existence on the wrong side of that line was to stretch out for a long time to come. Buried in snowy darkness, he was trapped in limbo, a fate worse than he could have possibly imagined. Chapter 24 
9.07 a.m., April 21, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. What in the fuck? The words had barely escaped from Marcus's mouth when he saw a flash of fire from the back left side of the helicopter. He instinctively dove to the ground, pulling David with him. They rolled under the train just as a small missile was launched from the helicopter, aiming directly for and impacting on the side of the APC. Though the armored vehicle was built to withstand powerful attacks, the explosives in the missile were designed specifically to defeat such armor. The APC exploded instantly, sending thick pieces of shrapnel flying in every direction. Several such pieces lodged themselves into the boxcar directly above Marcus and David, though the worst they suffered directly was exposure to intense heat and flames. Who the hell is that, David? Marcus screamed over the sound of the helicopter's rotors. David shook his head, holding his ringing ears. I have no idea. Marcus began crawling forward under the train cars, heading for the front engine. We have to get to Rachel. Another explosion rocked the remains of the APC, sending the last few intact pieces flying into the air. David cried out, and Marcus looked back to see a credit card-sized piece of metal embedded into his arm. Marcus started to turn around to crawl back and help him, but David shook his head and waved Marcus away. Ah, oh, just go take care of Rachel. I'll be fine. Marcus didn't argue. He kept crawling forward, dragging himself across the gravel and splintered railroad ties. No more explosions came from behind them, but the sound of the helicopter's rotors shifted as the craft began to move along the length of the train. Whoever he is, he's got to be looking for us. With the APC and its contents obliterated, there was virtually no way to defend themselves against the helicopter and its occupant, except for the rifle that Rachel had kept with her. As long as the pilot of the helicopter didn't decide to start firing on the train itself, Marcus figured they would have the slimmest of chances of getting out of the mess alive. By the time Marcus reached the lead locomotive, the helicopter was back at the front of the train, making slow circles a hundred feet above the ground. Marcus slid his body to the very edge of the tracks and leaned his head out, trying to stay hidden while he looked for the position of the craft. As Marcus watched, the helicopter swung around again, moving away from him in a slow clockwise circle. The craft was jet black in color, with no markings or insignia to identify what country or organization it belonged to. A pair of small wings extended from the sides of the craft, complementing the rotor overhead in an unusual manner. Marcus had never seen a helicopter like it before, nor had he any idea what its purpose was other than to try and kill him and David. Without warning, the helicopter turned sharply and began to move down the right side of the train, opposite to where Marcus was peeking out. Taking advantage of its movement, Marcus rolled out from underneath the train and ran to the front. He opened the door and hopped in, slamming it closed as he dove to the floor to stay out of sight. As he looked up, he saw a gun barrel in his face. Behind it was Rachel, her eyes wide and her whole body trembling. She held a finger to her lips before moving the gun out of the way and motioning Marcus to crawl over to her. Rachel, are you all right? Marcus whispered loudly, not sure how quiet he was supposed to be. Oh, as good as can be expected with that thing flying around. Uh, where's David? Was he in the APC when... No, no, he's still under the train. He took a bit of shrapnel in his arm, but he, he said it wasn't bad. We heard you yelling, but we had our hands full loading Bertha into the boxcar. Rachel's whole body relaxed as she leaned back against a control station and closed her eyes. Oh, thank God. I thought Bertha was still on board when he destroyed the APC. Rachel, who is that? Do you know? Rachel opened her eyes and stared at Marcus for a moment as they both listened to the helicopter circling back around to the front of the train. It's dough. This has been Final Dawn, Episode 10. Written by Mike Krause. Narrated by Mike Krause. Final Dawn, Episode 11. Written by Mike Krause. Narrated by Mike Krause. Chapter 1. 
9.17 a.m., April 21, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. A light wind blew through the air and the smell of honeysuckle was interspersed with that of pine. Both scents were thick in Marcus's nose as he sagged back against a control panel inside the locomotive, staring blankly at the wall in front of him. Other smells joined that of the plants, coalescing into a dystopian symphony. Blood, sweat, gunpowder, and earth were close at hand, flooding his nostrils. Marcus wasn't sure if it was the aroma that made him dizzy or the matter-of-fact way in which Rachel had answered his question. Marcus had never met the infamous Mr. Doe, but his invisible hand combined with Rachel's ominous descriptions left little to the imagination. Cold, calculating, and merciless, Marcus instinctively knew that the man would show no mercy and accept only death. And here he was, finally, showing himself after weeks of struggle had passed, preparing to cut them down like wheat under a scythe. Seated in his helicopter, Doe was nigh untouchable, and it would be only a matter of time before he found and killed them. Another explosion echoed through the train, sending Marcus diving on top of Rachel and Sam to protect them. Rubble showered down over the train, along with bits of steel, iron, and wood. Marcus peeked through the front window, looking at the crater that sat a hundred feet up where the track used to be. A ten-foot section had been blown out of the track by the powerful missiles of Doe's black craft, which was slowly drifting back down towards the train, no doubt searching for the survivors. A pounding from the bottom of the locomotive caused Rachel to jump, pushing away from the center of the floor where the noise emanated. A muffled voice followed the pounding, and a square section of slats rattled under the blows. Open the hatch! Hurry! Glancing up at the sound of the helicopter circling overhead, Marcus crawled to the center of the locomotive and slid a latch to the side. He pulled up on a small handle, revealing a hatch through the floor straight down to the ground. Bloodied and caked with dirt and grease, David smiled weakly as he saw Marcus and Rachel peering down at him. He held his good arm aloft, reaching to Marcus, who grabbed him, pulling him through the hatch and propping him up against a console. Another explosion echoed from far behind the train, followed by an intense rocking of the locomotive. Rachel stood weakly to look out the window and spotted a plume of smoke and dust in the distance. He just destroyed the tracks behind us. Sitting down next to David, she looked at him and Marcus, her face pale from shock and exhaustion. We're trapped. Clutching his injured arm, David leaned his head back against the console and closed his eyes. <sighs> so much for that plan. It was a good one, though, except for when Doe found us. How did he find us anyway? Marcus kept his voice low. It's pretty strange that he just so happened to come across us now, isn't it? David pushed at the skin around the metal in his arm, wincing in pain as he considered pulling it out. I don't know. The only way he could have found us is if he intercepted a signal between us and the satellite. But I have safeguards for that on the computer. Whenever I'm connected, I have a reminder set to warn me to change frequencies just for this sort of thing. I wouldn't have thought Doe would be able to break into it, but I guess he did. Marcus was looking at the floor as David spoke, and his eyes widened. Without lifting his head, he swallowed hard and tried to keep his voice calm as he spoke. Uh, reminders? Like warnings on the computer? David nodded, grimacing as he pulled lightly on the shrapnel embedded in his arm. Yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty hard to miss. That's why I don't understand how I could have let this happen. Ah, damn, this hurts. Rachel examined David's wound, though there wasn't much she could do about it without access to their supplies. Thankfully, they had unloaded most of their gear from the APC and put it on the train, but it was several cars back, with no easy way to reach it without being spotted by the helicopter. As she and David talked about the best way to get the metal out of his arm, Marcus's face contorted as he remembered when he was on David's computer in the back of the APC. There were the satellite images, which were easy to download, but then there was that alert or something that happened. Glancing up, Marcus saw that Rachel had taken her rifle off of her back and had laid it on the floor next to her, along with a spare magazine. He locked eyes with Sam for a moment and made a motion for him to stay still. Sam whined, but obeyed as Marcus grabbed the rifle, 
turning to jump out of the front of the train. David and Rachel didn't notice his movement until it was too late, and he was sprinting forward from the locomotive. What the hell, Marcus? What are you doing? David shouted at him, but Marcus didn't turn around as he shouted back. Ending this! Once he reached the edge of the destroyed section of tracks, Marcus stopped and turned around. He held the rifle aloft over his head with one hand and the spare magazine with the other. A few seconds passed before the helicopter began moving toward him as Doe finally noticed him. With slow, exaggerated movements, Marcus laid the rifle and the spare magazine down on the ground in front of him, then raised his empty hands back over his head. Hoping that Doe had a way of hearing him, he took a deep breath and shouted. Chapter 2 9.45 a.m., April 21st, 2038 Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims Let me see if I understand you correctly. Commander Pavel Krylov leaned back in his chair. A slightly incredulous expression graced his face, though he was fighting hard to try to believe what the woman across from him had just described. Your country developed a nanotech-based weapon that can think for itself. One of its first actions was to virtually destroy the world with nuclear weapons. It then proceeded to turn many of the survivors into some sort of abominations, though there are still some who haven't been turned or outright killed by nanorobots due to some sort of DNA... Uh, what was it? Whitelisting. No, oh, yes, due to some sort of uh, DNA whitelisting. Furthermore, one of the chief scientists who worked on this project is with another group on the other side of your country with some sort of weapon that you hope will destroy these nanorobots. However, in case that weapon fails, you want me to take my sheep to the coast and use our nuclear weapons against the nanorobots. Would you say that's a reasonably accurate summary of what you described to me, Miss Sims? Nancy sat quietly for a moment before nodding slowly. That's about the gist of it, yes. Commander Krylov smiled briefly and looked down at his notebook. Halfway through Nancy's story, he had pulled it out to start jotting down pieces of information she had given to him. Picking up a cup of coffee sitting on a nearby table, he took a long sip, flipping through his notes. Nancy watched on in silence, chewing on her lip as she waited to hear Krylov's verdict. With a sigh, he closed his notebook and set his coffee down before pushing a button on an intercom built into the table next to him. Send in the cousins. Looking back at Nancy, Krylov sighed again. <sighs> if it were just your word for all of this, I'd have you and your companion thrown off of the ship without a second thought. Krylov paused and nodded slowly, running his tongue over his teeth. <sighs> but, well, you can hear for yourself. Commander Krylov and Nancy sat together in silence for a few moments until a sharp knocking came at the steel door. Enter! Krylov swiveled his head to look at the two men who walked through the doorway. Hats in hand, they gave the commander a nervous salute and took their seats in a pair of chairs that Krylov gestured toward. Miss Sims, this is Andrei Lipov and Sergei Uzov. I want you to describe these uh, swarms you spoke of to them. If you would speak slowly, I would appreciate it, since their English proficiency is uh, somewhat limited. Nancy nodded and took a sip of water before starting. I'm, uh, I'm pleased to meet you, Andre and Sergei. I'm not really sure where to begin, though. Nancy looked at Krylov for some assistance. Just to tell them what the swarms look like, what their behavior was, and anything else that comes to mind about them. Well... Nancy took in a deep breath. They're silver in color, normally anyway, though my friends have seen them in blue as well. They make this sort of uh, a buzzing sound, like a swarm of bees, but angrier. I first saw them right after... Miss Sims, if you could just stick to the details on these swarms for now and exclude the other details, uh, that would be preferable. Nancy glanced between Commander Krylov, Andre, and Sergei, realizing what the look on Krylov's face was about. His men don't know what happened. Oh, dear God, they don't even know their world is gone. With a gulp, Nancy continued, I, uh, 
I first saw them at a farm when they were just going by, seemingly hovering in the air above the ground as, as, as they went. They moved quickly, too, but they weren't aggressive towards me. Later on, though, we started to see and hear about more aggression from the swarms, and we found a lot of human remains from their work, too. Over the course of her brief description of the swarms, Andre and Sergei's faces had gone pale. They murmured something under their breath as they crossed themselves, sitting in rapt attention to Nancy. Finally, when she finished, Krylov spoke up. Is what Miss Sims has just described to you an accurate description of what to take the landing party? Quick, nervous nods were Andre and Sergei's only responses to Krylov's question. Sighing deeply, the commander waved at them, dismissing them from the room. They were both up in a flash, racing for the door and slamming it shut before another word could be spoken. Commander, what happened to those men? Holding his cup of coffee, Krylov tilted his head as he watched Nancy holding his tongue for a moment before responding. You know, Miss Sims, this entire situation is quite extraordinary, and, frankly, I'm still not sure what to make of it. Two Americans on my ship telling me that the world ended and that they need my nuclear weapons to wipe out an infestation caused by a rogue computer. Krylov sipped the coffee, curling his lip at the lukewarm beverage. He set it to the side and sighed again. <sighs> there are protocols for such an encounter as this, you know. Uh, technically, I am supposed to take you back to Moscow for an interrogation before we negotiate your release with Washington. Uh, but, Commander, you... Nancy started to protest, but Krylov raised his hand to silence her. Calm down, Miss Sims. As I said before, you and your companion are fortunate that we had such a uh, terrible encounter with these things you described, and that there were two survivors to corroborate your story. Commander? Nancy leaned forward, pleading with Krylov. Please, uh, tell me what happened. What do you know about these things? Krylov shook his head. Uh, nothing, I'm afraid, and certainly far less than you do. We were on patrol when we detected massive disturbances on the surface. Uh, we lost all communications, and the late commander decided to send out two landing parties, uh, one to an outpost in our country and one to a small village along the strait in yours. Uh, those two men you just saw were the only survivors of the landing party in your country. Our commander was part of it, and from what we heard on the radio and have been able to extract from Andre and Sergei, Everyone else was killed by those swarms. What you say are uh, nanorobots. Krylov turned his notebook over in his palm, musing about the events of the last few weeks. Uh, then, of course, we detected something on the surface. It had to have been the same things. Uh, they didn't follow us into the water for some reason. I've no idea why, though. Several minutes of silence followed after Krylov finished speaking, as both Nancy and he thought over the revelations shared by one another. So, Commander, where do we go from here? Chapter 3 924 AM, April 21st, 2038 Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry You win, Doe! I surrender! Hovering just a few dozen feet from him, the helicopter's rotor wash was blindingly powerful. Marcus turned his head slightly and kept his eyes closed as he waited for a response. Several seconds passed, and Marcus had nearly convinced himself that the next noise to come from the chopper would be the sound of a missile. So certain was he of his inevitable death that the crackle of a speaker made his heart skip a beat before it resumed its rapid pounding. Kick it away, then get down on your knees. The voice was precise and calculated, and Marcus knew that the lack of emotion was not just because it was coming through a speaker. The man behind the voice showed no emotions, and even now he was the epitome of detachment. Marcus did as he was told, kicking the rifle in front of him several feet away. The cockpit of the helicopter was darkened and impossible to see into, but Marcus knew that the man behind it was watching every movement with a hawk's eye, looking for any signs of treachery. Where are the others? Marcus had counted on this question coming next, 
and already had a response planned. Assuming that Doe already knew exactly how many of them there were and who they were, Marcus spoke carefully, doing his best not to contradict anything that Doe might have seen or heard. Rachel was in the armored car, and David's somewhere. I'm not sure where, but his leg's under the train. After several seconds passed in silence, Marcus fought the urge to look away, keeping his gaze trained on the helicopter. Finally, Doe's voice came again. Get down on your knees and put your hands behind your head. If you move, I will kill you. You'd be better off killing me now, you fool. Marcus lowered his head, interlacing his hands behind it as he dropped at both knees. The whine of the helicopter's rotors lessened as it descended to the ground, finally touching down. Marcus raised his head slightly and watched as a side door on the helicopter popped open. With the rotor still spinning, a man exited the side door. Keeping his head low, he walked forward toward Marcus, pistol in hand. Dressed in his ever-present suit and tie, Marcus's first sight of Mr. Doe was somewhat threatening, if not slightly amusing. Though there was no questioning the fact that Doe was not a man to be trifled with, seeing a man wearing a suit during the apocalypse wasn't something Marcus thought he'd ever witness. After he cleared the rotors, Mr. Doe straightened his back and raised his arm, keeping his pistol trained on Marcus. An all-black Walther, the cold steel matched the darkness of Doe's suit and tie to perfection, giving an appearance that wasn't just a coincidence. Intimidation was part of Mr. Doe's arsenal of weapons, but it was one that Marcus was far too tired to bother with caring about. Bruised, beaten, and run down, Marcus was stretched to his limit. His physical condition, combined with feelings of shame and guilt over having lost control earlier and having led Doe straight to them, Marcus's mind was no longer capable of feeling intimidation. Your name is Marcus, correct? Mr. Doe stopped a few feet in front of Marcus. He held the gun with an iron grip, his arm never wavering as it kept the barrel aimed directly at Marcus's left eye. That's right, Marcus Warden. Marcus blinked his eyes as he looked up at Mr. Doe, trying to wash away the dirt and dust that was still collecting there from the helicopter's downwash. Do you mind turning that damned thing off? Mr. Doe's eyes were cold and nearly black, and his expression didn't change at all while both he and Marcus were speaking. I'm afraid not, Mr. Warden. Tell me again, where are the others? Marcus started to remove his right hand from behind his head to point toward the APC, but stopped as Mr. Doe's index finger smoothly moved toward the trigger. Ah, shit, Marcus thought. Uh, this isn't going to be as easy as I thought. He stretched his back, moving it left to right in exaggerated circles. The cold steel and wood grain pressed up against the small of his back and turned warm, making every second more uncomfortable than the last. Having secreted the pistol beneath his shirt and pants before exiting the train, Marcus felt bad leaving Rachel and David defenseless, but one pistol wouldn't be enough to stop Mr. Doe. It won't be enough if I fail here anyway. I already told you, Doe. Rachel was in the APC. David's probably dead by now based on him, you know, missing a leg. You don't seem very broken up about their deaths, Mr. Warden. Marcus shrugged as best as he could, given that his arms were raised above his head. I barely survived the end of the world. Then I got to deal with some sort of hell creatures. Then I got to drive all up and down the eastern seaboard, and you just tried to kill me. I really don't give a fuck about them, you, or anyone else. Marcus breathed heavily at the end of his rant, his chest rising and sinking quickly. Oh, was that too much? Doe was eyeing him closely, not saying a word. Shit, it was too much. Marcus tensed his muscles, preparing to throw himself to the side and grab his gun. It was a fool's plan, but he was about to completely run out of options. Well then, Mr. Warden. Doe's arm dropped a half inch, the only sign of his lessened aggression. 
If they're dead and you clearly will know nothing about what they knew, then your usefulness is at an end. Flames exploded from the end of Mr. Doe's pistol, along with a sharp crack that rose above the sound of the helicopter blades. Fire burned through Marcus's shoulder and he fell forward, unable to stop himself from slamming his face into the dirt. He rolled as his body's momentum continued forward, screaming in pain as his injured shoulder was scraped and bent against the ground, making the pain nearly unbearable. You son of a bitch! Marcus yelled, spit flying from his mouth. Just kill me! Doe held the gun to Marcus's head. Now just a foot away, he was crouched down, staring directly into Marcus's eyes. I suppose I owe you that much. Tell me something, though, before I do. Marcus said nothing as he gritted his teeth and breathed heavily, fighting the blood loss and pain in his shoulder. Which one of you was foolish enough to lead me to you? Chapter 4 10.02 a.m. April 21st, 2038 Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims Another knock on the door followed Nancy's question, preventing Krylov from answering. A young man ducked in and quickly saluted the commander before leaning over and whispering in his ear. Krylov's face remained neutral, and he nodded at the man. Taking his coffee cup, he stood up and gestured for Nancy to do the same. Uh, please, excuse me for a few moments, Miss Sims. I need to tend to some urgent business. We'll resume our conversation once I return. Until then, if you'd like to visit your companion, I've been informed that he's conscious. The phone-in will show you to the medical bay. Krylov stepped past the crewman who had spoken to him and hurried down the hall and out of sight. Grigoria Fonin beckoned for Nancy to follow him and spoke in a thick accent, stumbling over his words. Please, if you follow me. Commander Krylov, to his credit, had nearly perfect mastery of English, and when he had spoken with Nancy, his accent was far less noticeable than any of the others on the sub. Uh, please, uh, watch head. Fonin pointed to the low doorway as they stepped into the hall. Turning left, he walked quickly and Nancy hurried to stay with him, distracted by the numerous sights and sounds around her. After taking on the two Americans, Commander Krylov had decided to forego any pretense of stealth. The skeleton crew had quickly returned the Archangelisk to full power, and though most of the submarine was devoid of activity, Lights, fans, and electronic devices of various shapes and sizes were all powered up for use. The walk from the room where Nancy and Krylov were speaking to the medical bay took several minutes. When she and Afonin arrived, he opened the door and stepped inside, allowing her to enter. Knock to leave. He spoke quickly, then closed the door behind her. Turning from the sealed hatch to the room interior, Nancy's eyes adjusted to the dim lighting, and she made out the shape of a body resting on a slightly inclined bed. She ran to the side of the bed and grabbed the hand of the person lying down, knowing who it was before seeing his face. Leonard! Oh, thank God you're alive! Leonard's eyes were closed, but he opened them at the sound of Nancy's voice. His face was bruised from falling to the ground when he was shot, and he was pale, but he smiled regardless happy to see Nancy once again. A light blanket was pulled up to his chest, and as Nancy looked down the length of the bed, she could see that the outline of his right leg stopped at the knee. Nervously, she reached for the blanket to pull it up and see the extent of the damage for herself, but Leonard's hand stopped her. He grasped her wrist weakly, trembling, and spoke softly, his voice cracking. Uh, please don't. I'm... I'm not ready. Nancy nodded and sat down on a stool next to Leonard. Taking his hand in hers, she held him tightly, staring at him in silence. Leonard's breathing was ragged, though his heartbeat was strong, and Nancy could sense that he was fighting both the loss of blood and whatever drugs had been injected into his body to help dull the pain. I spoke to the commander of the sub, Commander Krylov, and told him what had happened. Leonard blinked his eyes slowly a few times, then gave up fighting the urge to close them. 
<sighs> did, uh, did he believe you? Nancy shrugged. I'm, I'm not sure. He brought in a couple of other people who apparently encountered the swarms. Before we could keep talking, he had to leave, though he said he'd be back to finish our conversation later. Leonard didn't reply for a moment, and Nancy looked at him closely, wondering if he had fallen asleep. After a deep breath, he opened his eyes again and looked at her intently. <sighs> Do what you have to, Nancy. This sub is our last chance if Marcus and Rachel fail. Do whatever it takes to convince him of the truth. Truth shouldn't need convincing. A voice from behind Nancy startled her, and she jumped up, turning around to see where it came from. After all, it's the truth. Commander Krylov stood in the doorway to the medical bay with another man behind him. They walked in and pulled up a pair of stools next to Nancy before sitting down. Nancy sat back down slowly, still keeping Leonard's hand held tightly. Miss Sims informed me that your name is uh, Mr. McComb, correct? Leonard blinked lazily, masking the speed at which his eyes flicked between Nancy, Krylov, and the other men seated next to the commander. Leonard McComb, professional sanitation engineer, survivor of the apocalypse, and in desperate need of whiskey and a peg leg. Krylov laughed heartily at Leonard's gallow humor. <laughs> it's good to see you in high spirits. Our doctor was worried you weren't going to pull through, but you've proved both his skill and your determination to leave. Still grinning, Krylov took a small laptop computer from the man seated next to him and opened it, revealing the screen. On it was a set of open files, one of which was strangely familiar to Nancy, though she had trouble placing it at first. Do you recognize this information? Krylov asked, holding the laptop closer for both Nancy and Leonard to view. Nancy looked at Leonard, trying to remember where she had seen it, when a memory returned to her, and she suddenly realized what it was. Where did you get that? Leonard coughed and spoke before Krylov could answer. <coughs> I'll hand it to you, Krylov. Your men are quite thorough in their searches. Nancy turned back to Leonard, her eyes wide as he continued explaining the source of the data to Nancy. I grabbed the data stick from Rachel back at the armory before things went to hell. I figured it would come in handy at some point if we ever needed proof of what's been happening. Mr. McComb is right, Miss Sims. After his surgery, we found this data stick hidden in his belongings. After decrypting it, we were able to analyze the data in short order. Krylov paused and looked at Nancy and Leonard for several seconds. Well? Nancy said impatiently, tired of Krylov's delays. What's the point? The point is that it confirms our story. Leonard answered in Krylov's stead, who nodded solemnly in agreement. Correct again, Mr. McComb. What you shared with me, Miss Sims, was frightening, and viewing this data just made it a thousand times worse. So you're going to help us? <clears throat> Protocol, Miss Sims, requires that I return to port immediately and deliver this high-value information to our intelligence service. Krylov looked at the floor, sighing softly to himself. <sighs> However, given that there is no intelligence service, a port, or anything else left to speak of, I find myself forced into an awkward and uh, unforeseen position. Commander! Leonard said, What do we have to do to convince you to help? Krylov stood, closed the laptop computer, and placed it under his arm. He took a deep breath, replaced the hat on his head, and straightened his back, adopting a more formal posture. Mr. McComb, Ms. Sims, the Archangelisk and her crew stand ready to aid you in the destruction of this pestilence. Chapter 5 9.30 a.m., April 21st, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. Movement from behind Mr. Doe caught Marcus's eye. Before he could stop himself, he glanced at it, though Mr. Doe didn't appear to have noticed, thanks to the sweat, tears, and dirt coating Marcus's entire face. 
Marcus felt his heart jump as he made out the blurry form of Rachel, who was slowly walking up behind Mr. Doe. Her footsteps masked by the sound of the helicopter, Rachel was armed with only a shovel, though even a momentary distraction was all Marcus would need to finish out his plan how he had intended. Hey! Rachel's voice was weak and strained. Doe! Mr. Doe turned quickly, whipping the pistol around to face the new voice behind him. Rachel was just a few feet away, though, and lashed out with the shovel. The metal end collided with Mr. Doe's left arm, knocking him off balance, though he still retained the pistol in his right hand. Unable to keep a grip on the shovel in her weakened state, it flew out of Rachel's hands, clattering to the ground far out of reach. A cold sneer, the first and last sign of emotion in Mr. Doe, came as he leveled his gun at Rachel. As he opened his mouth to speak at her, a shot rang out. Looking down at his hand, he immediately questioned whether he had inadvertently fired his weapon or not. His finger was not on the trigger, though, and the lances of pain in his back and chest verified that the shot did not come from his gun. Three more shots rang out in rapid succession, and Rachel dropped to the ground as two of the rounds passed through Mr. Doe's body, tumbling end over end out the other side. The final round passed through his heart, lodging in his ribcage, and sent him toppling to the ground. He fell flat on his face like Marcus had done, but instead of trying to move or roll with the impact, he stayed where he had fallen. Behind where Mr. Doe had been standing, Marcus was on his side, his gun still pointed at the body in front of him. His arm was shaking violently, and his breathing was labored as the red stain on his shoulder slowly spread down his chest. As Mr. Doe succumbed to his wounds, his body gave a small shudder. In that same instant, the whine of the helicopter grew louder as it began to lift off from the ground on its own. Presumably controlled by an autopilot system linked to a dead man's switch on Mr. Doe's person, the helicopter rocketed away, though a distant explosion was heard a moment later, accompanied by a plume of smoke far in the distance. Rachel and Marcus stared at each other over the body of Mr. Doe, neither of them speaking as they each caught their breath and tried to recover from what had just occurred. The sound of footsteps came from behind Rachel, who turned to see David slowly walking up on them, holding a piece of torn cloth against his arm. He stopped over Mr. Doe's body and examined it before nudging the corpse with his foot. Satisfied that Mr. Doe was finally dead, he leaned down and removed the pistol from Mr. Doe's death grip before sitting down next to Rachel and Marcus. Huh. David snorted as he looked at Mr. Doe's body. <laughs> that, uh, that was sort of anticlimactic. Marcus started to chuckle, holding his shoulder through the pain. <laughs> For you, maybe? Rachel stood up and hobbled over to Marcus. She knelt down next to him and examined his shoulder. It looks fairly clean. It passed right through, so you should be okay. We just need to clean it up and bandage it before an infection sets in. David got up before Rachel and headed back to the train. I'll be back with the medical kit in a minute. Rachel nodded her thanks and watched him walk off, waiting until he was halfway back to the train before speaking to Marcus. It was you, wasn't it? Marcus looked Rachel in the eye, still feeling no small amount of shame over what had happened. I, I didn't know, Rachel. I was just looking at the computer and, and something popped up. I can't even remember what it said at this point. Rachel nodded slowly and patted his arm gently as she sat down next to him to wait for David to return. I know you didn't know, Marcus. For the time being, let's, uh, let's keep it between you and me. David's already strained enough as it is about your, well, whatever it was that happened before. He doesn't need to know about this. It won't do him any good. Marcus nodded and leaned his head back against the ground. The sunlight overhead was warm on his face, though the distant black clouds rolling in signaled that it wouldn't last for long. <sighs> I can't believe this guy's dead. I mean, really, I thought it'd take more than this to kill him. Rachel sighed and stared at Mr. Doe's body. His suit was wrinkled, torn, and marred with dirt, and a red stain on the ground was slowly spreading as his blood flowed along the path of least resistance. I think it's a rather fitting end, personally. After all he did, and all I'm sure he was still trying to do, 
This will be his final resting place. Ah, sorry it took so long. This was all I could find. David held up a clear plastic case filled with bandages, gauze, basic surgical tools, and a small variety of medications. With a chunk of metal still embedded in his arm, he moved gingerly, not wanting to accidentally trip and drive the shrapnel further in. Rachel took the case from him and opened it, removing a pair of gloves, a small bottle of iodine, and several bandages and a roll of gauze. She motioned for David to sit next to her and then cleaned the area around the shrapnel, instructing him to keep his arm still despite the pain. After liberally dousing it with iodine, she gripped the shrapnel with her gloved hand and gently began to pull it out. Rachel was by no means a medical professional, but her guess that the shrapnel hadn't penetrated far into David's arm was correct, and the metal was quickly out. Following that was more iodine and a quick wrapping of bandages to help minimize the bleeding. After tending to David, Rachel turned her attention to Marcus, though there wasn't much she could do for him except clean both sides of the wound, bandage him up, and put his arm in a makeshift sling. With all of their immediate injuries cared for, they all walked slowly back to the train and climbed inside. So, David said at last, what are we going to do now? Chapter 6, 11.48 a.m., April 21st, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. The energy on the command deck of the Argongolisk was electrifying. A hum was in the air, carried on the backs of the crew members who hurried back and forth as they prepared the ship for its most dangerous mission yet. Although the ship had an official top speed of 40 knots, Commander Krylov had ordered them to increase it by a minimum of 50% in an effort to get to the Gulf as quickly as possible. They could launch the missiles before reaching the Gulf if they had to, but they would not be in radio range of the area for a few more days. Without radio contact with Rachel, Marcus, and David, they would have no way of knowing precisely where to target the missiles, assuming they would have to use them at all. How can you be certain that your companions are still alive? Commander Krylov and Nancy were standing around a chart table in a corner of the command deck, poring over a map laid out in front of them. Seated next to them with a pair of crutches leaning up against the wall, Leonard raised himself up as much as he could in his chair to get a view of the map as he responded to Krylov's question. Uh, the last radio contact we had with them was before we hit Anchorage, uh, but we got cut off, presumably because of the storms. The storms? Krylov looked puzzled. Oh, yes, Nancy answered. These massive superstorms, haven't you seen them? Krylov shook his head slowly. No, we haven't seen anything of the kind, but we haven't been on the surface much as of late. Once we detected those nanorobots on our scanners, I decided it would be wiser to stay submerged. Well, whatever they are, they're huge. They take days to pass by, and they're covering huge spans of surface area, with fairly short breaks in between them. Krylov sighed and looked back at the map, running his index finger along a path that had been drawn and redrawn several times already. <sighs> then we'll just have to make our move, and hope that we can reach them once we get closer to the coast. A shudder came from somewhere deep in the bowels of the submarine, and Krylov stood straight, looking across the command deck at the face of a nervous crewman. He shouted at the crewman in Russian, and a quick response came in turn. It had pleased Krylov, apparently, because his demeanor relaxed, and he leaned forward on the table once again. The engines are now running at 115 percent. We'll be at 125 within the hour. Uh, can this old thing handle that? Leonard looked mildly concerned as he asked the question, due in no small part to the ominous low-frequency vibrations that were coursing through the vessel. The Archangelisk may be old, Krylov said, with a slight note of warning in his voice, but she'll get us there. Right now we need to focus on what's going to happen once we breach the canal and reach the gulf. Redesigned six years earlier, the Panama Canal had received a complete upgrade for the modern age. Twice as wide as it had previously been, the canal was nearly completely automated, and its pumps operated off of a combination of geothermal and solar energy. The only human input required to pass through was to activate a control station, though the task was trivial compared to the larger goal. 
Once through the canal, the Archangelisk would have to travel as far as her crew could push her to reach radio range with the area that Leonard and Nancy presumed Rachel, Marcus, and David would be. Without direct communication with them, the crew on the sub would have no way of knowing if, much less where, they should be firing their missiles. Leonard sat back in his chair and rubbed his eyes. Just get us in radio range of Marcus and Rachel, Commander, and we'll be able to tell you exactly where to put the missile. One of the command crew rushed to Krylov, a computer in hand, and placed it on the table. Sir, he spoke, in English no less, we were able to reach the satellite. We're getting live imagery now. Krylov tilted the screen of the laptop so that Nancy and Leonard could see. Images scrolled slowly through the screen, showing roiling storms over the western section of the USA. Wait a second. That's the satellite that Rachel and David were accessing. Nancy couldn't help letting the slightest bit of an accusatory tone slip. How did you get this? Krylov held up the data stick they had taken from Leonard and placed it on the table next to the laptop. Whoever put these together included access instructions for the satellite. It was designed that way, Miss Sims. The person who made this wanted whoever found it to have full access to every resource left. Krylov pressed a button on the laptop, and an image on the screen froze. And it's a good thing, too. A massive storm was sweeping in toward the coast, directly toward the Archangelisk's position. Looking across the bridge, Krylov shouted at the crewmen, raising his voice above the groans of the ship. It's time to submerge, gentlemen. Take us to 500. Shouts of affirmation came back, and the submarine began to tilt forward, racing downward at a steep enough angle that Nancy and Leonard both clung to the table with white knuckles. Krylov smiled at them, remembering what his first voyage on a sub had been like, and wondering what was going through the heads of the two American civilians who had found their way onto his vessel. Chapter 7, 5.58 p.m., April 21st, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. After talking for a few minutes about what they were going to do next, Rachel, Marcus, and David all fell asleep on the floor of the locomotive, their bodies succumbing to the effects of both their wounds and exhaustion. With the train tracks both ahead and behind the train destroyed, they had to quickly face up to the fact that they weren't going to be going anywhere. The destruction of the APC eliminated any hope of continuing on with it as well, and the likelihood of finding any other vehicles nearby that would be in working condition was slim at best. The first to wake up, Marcus quietly exited the train with Sam, walking slowly down the length of the train in the last few minutes of light they had. Night was nearly upon them, along with the edge of another set of storm clouds, and Marcus wanted to be certain that they hadn't missed anything. Flashlight in hand, he scanned the interior of the train cars, the doors of which were still rolled open from when the creatures inside had been trying to attack them. Most of the contents of the boxcars were unrecognizable to Marcus, except for the few cars directly behind the locomotives. In addition to holding Bertha, the front few boxcars also held a variety of workmen's tools, thick metal rails, wooden ties, spikes, and, in the fourth car, a large amount of gravel for smoothing out uneven surfaces. While Marcus had seen the contents of a few of the boxcars previously, he had been under enormous stress while doing so, and this was his first chance to check them out in a relatively calm environment. Clenching his teeth, he pulled himself into the second boxcar, trying to keep his shoulder as still as possible. Marcus played the flashlight over the interior of the darkened boxcar as Sam sniffed around his feet, growling at two dead creatures that were hanging out of the open door on the opposite side. Thunder rumbled in the distance, causing a shiver to run down Marcus's spine as the eerie atmosphere of the train began to affect him. Shaking the feeling off, he continued looking through the supplies, nurturing the seed of a plan that he had been forming since shortly after he had shot Mr. Doe in the back. Moving on to the next train car, he found that it was filled with more rails and ties, and between all of the supplies he had seen, there looked to be enough to lay down a half mile or more of track with little or no difficulty. From Marcus's estimation, the amount of track that had been destroyed in front of them by the missile was no more than 30 feet in length. It'll never work, he thought. 
but stranger things than this have succeeded so far. Walking back to the locomotive with Sam behind him, Marcus heard Rachel and David's voices before he saw them. As he rounded the corner to the front of the train, he saw the two of them standing near the destroyed section of rail, gesturing between it and the train behind them. Oh, come on, David. It can't be that hard. Are you serious? One of those ties is several hundred pounds on its own, and none of us are in the best shape either. The pair turned and looked at Marcus upon hearing the sound of gravel crunching underfoot. Smiling, he nodded toward the damaged track and spoke to Rachel. So you had the same idea, eh? David threw his hands into the air and walked back toward the train in frustration. Oh, you're both insane! Marcus watched David walk back to the locomotive and climb back inside before turning back to Rachel. What do you figure our chances here are? Based on our track record, I'd say we've got a pretty good shot. It's not like we have any other choice, though. Going on foot is a no-go, and finding a vehicle that's still operational that could hold Bertha is a fool's errand. So is trying to lay down 30 feet of railroad track when none of us have any idea how to do it. Rachel gave Marcus a half-smile and walked a few feet forward to the edge of where the track had been damaged. She wobbled slightly as she walked, and Marcus could see that she was still fighting through a large amount of pain. The shallow crater in front of her was several inches deep, down to the bottom layer of gravel that the railroad ties rested in. The major damage hadn't been to the ground, though, but to the ties and rails themselves. Pieces of the wooden ties were scattered around and in the crater, and several short sections of rail were missing as well. At both ends of the crater, where the rails were intact, there were a few feet of mangled, twisted steel loosely joined to the intact sections of rail by screw spikes. Come on now, it won't be that bad. Rachel patted Marcus's shoulder as she circled around him, walking the perimeter of the crater. It's not like we have to make it perfect. If we can fill this hole in, get a couple of ties to put down in the middle, and you know, nail down a few lengths of rail on each side, we should be okay. Marcus gestured to the long trail of cars behind him. Uh, somehow I doubt that half-assing a railroad track is going to get that thing across. Well, Rachel mused, what if we disconnected everything but the locomotives and the boxcar holding Bertha? Marcus kicked a large piece of gravel into the shallow crater, nodding as he considered Rachel's suggestion. I guess that would be easier, but won't the AI be expecting a full train to arrive? We'll burn that bridge once we come to it. For now, let's just see if we can do the impossible. Again. Chapter 8, 4.18 p.m., April 21st, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. For what felt like the hundredth time in a day, Nancy was once again overwhelmed by the magnitude of the vessel she was on. Having been given nearly free reign to go wherever she wanted on the sub, she had taken to wandering the corridors while Leonard rested. Exploring the vast interior of the submarine was a strange experience for Nancy, who had never dreamed that a craft as large as the Archangelisk could have existed, let alone be capable of traveling at such incredible speeds underwater. After exploring the ship for a few hours, Nancy finally found her way back to the dining room, where half of the small crew, including Commander Krylov, were gathered for a meal. Nancy walked slowly through the dining room until she caught Krylov's eye. He quickly waved her over, and she sat down next to him. A moment later, a plate of steaming food was deposited in front of her, along with a drink, napkin, and utensils. While the food was less than appetizing, she dug into it with gusto, having only had a few sips of water and military rations since arriving on the sub. How is Mr. McComb doing, Miss Seams? Nancy wiped some crumbs from the corner of her mouth and cleared her throat. <coughs> <clears throat> um, he was sleeping when I checked in on him last. I was going to go bring him some food. I don't think he's had much at all to eat. Krylov waved his hand dismissingly at her. No, no, no. He, he's being well looked after. The doctor is ensuring he's getting everything he needs. What about yourself? Was your exploration of the Archangelisk illuminating? Nancy nodded and laughed slightly. <laughs> it was nothing short of astonishing, Commander. 
It's like a city under the water. Uh, there aren't that many people, though. It looks like hundreds could fit in here. One hundred and sixty is the recommended compliment, uh, but she can hold far more, it's true, Krylov said. Nancy had finished eating, and Krylov stood up, motioning for her to follow him. They walked together out of the dining room down the hallway as Krylov continued to talk. Of course, when we left port, we already had a small crew, but losing two landing parties to those things up there cut us down to, well, what you see now. Oh, of course, when we left port, we already had a small crew, but losing two landing parties to those things up there cut us down to, well, what you see now. Krylov's heavy sigh weighed on Nancy, and she looked at him closely noticing the dark circles under his eyes and worry lines etched into his forehead. Have you ever taken command of a submarine before? <laughs> I'm afraid not, Krylov snorted. I wasn't going to be up for a promotion for quite a long time. A losing Commander Alexiev has been uh, difficult on all of us. This nano-robot business, though, and the whole end-of-the-world situation, that's going to be even harder to break to the crew. So they really don't know about it? Not all of them, no. A select few who I trust to be discreet have been informed. Uh, they're the ones who worked on decrypting the data stick and who accessed the satellite, among other things. Oh, the rest of the men, uh, they don't need to know yet. Knowing that their country has been obliterated would do little to invigorate them for the journey ahead, and we'll need every man's full attention to see this through to the end successfully. Nancy was quiet for a moment as she digested what Krylov had told her. When she spoke again, her voice was softer. You said the country's been obliterated. Do you know that because... Yes. As the satellite was passing over, I examined the imagery quite closely. We wouldn't be on route to your country if mine wasn't all but wiped off the face of the earth. Krylov's tone had a sting near the end, putting Nancy on the defensive. Commander, you realize that we were hurt just as much as you, right? I've seen more death and destruction than I could have ever imagined, just in the few places we've been. You're not the only one who's suffered losses. No, Miss Sims, we aren't. But we also aren't the ones who started this disaster. Krylov's eyes and voice started to fill with anger, though as he looked at Nancy, it quickly died out. He sighed again and stopped leaning against the wall in the empty corridor. Oh, you have my apologies. You are no more responsible for this than I am. Nancy placed her hand on Krylov's shoulder, smiling grimly at him. There's no need for apologies, Commander. None of us expected to be in this situation. I, for one, am glad that we found you, and I know Leonard is as well. If Marcus and Rachel fail, then you and your crew are the last hope for all of us. Krylov closed his eyes momentarily and nodded solemnly before pushing off of the wall and continuing his walk. Nancy stayed next to him as they wound their way to the medical ward where Leonard was sleeping. If you'll excuse me, Miss Sims, I need to tend to my duties. Please don't hesitate to call for someone if you or Mr. McComb need anything. Chapter 9, 218 p.m., April 23rd, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. Three strong individuals with experience, determination, and a healthy dose of gumption could easily have replaced a 30 feet of railroad track in far less than a day. Three inexperienced, injured, and exhausted individuals struggling against all odds, though, took quite a bit longer. After consuming a healthy dose of painkillers that did little to diminish their comfort, Marcus, Rachel, and David set to work, committing to the only course of action open to them. The first few hours of the repair started with an argument between Rachel and David that lasted well into the afternoon. As Marcus slowly pushed load after load of gravel from the boxcars to the crater in a wheelbarrow he had found in a pile of other tools, he listened to Rachel trying to convince David that repairing the track was their only shot at getting out of their current predicament. David argued ferociously, citing their injuries, their lack of knowledge on the subject, and listing off as many different reasons why it wouldn't work as he could think of. 
Each argument was shot down by Rachel until, finally, Marcus ended the whole conversation by sticking his head in the doorway of the locomotive and shouting loudly, Hey, assholes! I got the hole filled in. Do you two want to come help, or would you rather dick around some more while I finish it all up myself? Initially, David wore an angered expression, at least until he glanced past Marcus to see a pile of gravel filling the shallow crater where Mr. Doe had destroyed the track. This, combined with the fact that Marcus's arm was still in a sling, broke David's resistance, and his anger fell, replaced with equal parts shame and acceptance. For her part, Rachel was apologetic, having completely lost track of time as she had argued nonstop with David. Marcus waved them away, rolling his eyes as he slowly pushed a final load of gravel to its destination. Rachel and David joined him, and, together, the three evaluated Marcus's work in the light of the electrical storm overhead. Over the course of the next day and a half, Rachel and David threw their backs into the work alongside Marcus. Remaining uncharacteristically quiet, David said nothing negative about Marcus the entire time, having gained a healthy dose of respect for the man that he had shown incredible disdain towards just a few days prior. The end of the second day of work brought renewed hope to the trio as they sat around a small fire just outside the lead locomotive, rewarding themselves for their hard work with a night of rest. Marcus stroked Sam's back as the dog laid sprawled out in front of the fire, dozing with an expression of ecstasy on his face. How much more do you figure we have to go before it's done? David's question was the most he had spoken since the end of his argument with Rachel. Looking at Marcus briefly, Rachel cleared her throat and took a sip from her bottle of water. Ahem, <clears throat> um, uh, I think we've done all we can for laying out the ties. But that was a hell of a job, by the way. We should all be proud of that. Marcus nodded and smiled in agreement as she continued. Uh, now that the damaged ends of track are gone, we have to decide how to put down more of it. The way I see it, since we don't have nearly enough ties out there, uh, we'll want to use the longer sections of track uh, over the shorter ones. Uh, the disadvantage, Marcus interrupted, is that they're much heavier and harder to handle than the shorter pieces. Exactly. So that's what we have to decide. I think think the longer sections will offer us more stability when we, you know, actually try to get across them, but it's going to take a while to put them in. If we use the shorter sections without having more ties, though, then I think that has a much greater likelihood of falling apart when it comes time to test it out. Rachel looked at David, whose gaze was transfixed on the flickering fire. What do you think, David? David blinked several times and took a sharp, quick breath as he looked up at her. Um, uh, sorry, what? Are you all right, David? Marcus put his hand out on David's shoulder, feeling the man pull away ever so slightly at the touch. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Just uh, distracted, that's all. Rachel tilted her head and furrowed her brow. What's going on? Right now, we have no way of contacting Leonard and Nancy, assuming they're still alive and made it to the sub. Uh, the only satellite radio uplink that I know of was in the APC, and that's long since gone. Doesn't the train have a radio of some sort? Marcus resumed stroking Sam's fur, keeping an eye on David as he did so. I assume so, but that's just a standard high-power transmitter. The range on that will be limited to a few hundred miles if we're extremely lucky and can boost the power, too. Rachel closed her eyes, imagining how far such a transmission range would get them. Damn, that's a decent distance, but not very far. Especially when you're trying to coordinate a nuclear launch. Well, Marcus said, trying his best to be cheerful. It shouldn't come to that, right? Bertha's going to make the need for more nukes something to not even worry about. One can only hope so. The dread and uncertainty that permeated David's words was lost on neither Marcus nor Rachel. As the group fell silent, Marcus lay back on the ground and closed his eyes. As he fell quickly to sleep, a thought tickled the back of his mind, making him feel even more nervous. If they couldn't reach Leonard and Nancy to tell them to launch the missiles, then they would also be unable to reach them to keep the missiles from launching.
Chapter 10, 1.22 p.m., April 23, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. Nancy had not slept soundly for the last two nights in the medical ward. Despite the extra blankets and pillows provided to her by Commander Krylov, every time she closed her eyes, she couldn't help imagining the waters just outside the hull pushing inward with a frightening amount of force. When she was able to sleep, it wasn't soundly, and she found herself waking at the slightest noises. While the normal disturbances were the creak of the hull, or a crewman walking down the corridor, or the doctor periodically coming to check up on Leonard, the latest agitation came from the sound of rubber tapping upon metal. Nancy opened one eye, searching the room to find the source of the noise when she saw Leonard's empty bed. Springing out of her cot, she looked frantically around the room to see where Leonard had gone. Whoa there! What's wrong? Leaning up against a wall, Leonard had crutches under his arms as he balanced on one leg. He hobbled back towards her, moving slowly as he was still growing accustomed to this new way of getting around. You shouldn't be up! Nancy rushed to his side and put her arm around him, but he shrugged her off, giving her a smile as she watched him walk around the room. It's okay, Nancy. I'm just getting used to these damn things. Are you all right? You jumped up pretty quickly there. Nancy sank back down on the cot and held her head as she was overcome with a wave of dizziness. Leonard sat down next to her and leaned his crutches against the wall. They slipped almost as soon as he let them go, clattering to the floor and out of reach. Leonard sighed and shook his head, laughing softly to himself. He patted his right leg gently, smiling at Nancy as she looked at him in concern. Well, this sure has turned out to be one interesting trip we've taken. I have to say, though, that I didn't expect to lose a leg along the way. Nancy started to smile, but stopped, feeling bad about it the second the corners of her mouth started to turn upward. Leonard took her hand and grasped it tightly. Don't be afraid to laugh, even in the face of all of this. Nancy tried to force a smile as she stood up. You really shouldn't be up and around right now. If you were in a hospital, they'd make you... I'm not in a hospital, am I? Besides, I'm not going to be much use to you all if I'm lying around with my foot in the air. I'll be fine, I promise. Leonard pushed himself up on his good leg and stood at the edge of the bed, one hand on the upper bunk as he watched Nancy closely. Tears welled in her eyes and ran down her cheeks as she felt overcome with sorrow for Leonard and the position they were in. Leonard held out his arms and she hugged him tightly, trying to fight the steady tide of emotion. A few moments passed in silence before she pulled away, only to have Leonard hold her shoulders and look her closely in the eye. We're almost done with this, Nancy. Leonard's voice was an island of calm stability. Just hang on a bit longer. The door to the medical ward slammed open and two crewmen rushed in, out of breath and with red faces. Nancy quickly wiped the tears from her eyes and collected the crutches from the floor, giving them to Leonard, who tucked them under his arms. After taking a deep breath, the first of the two crewmen tried to explain something to Leonard and Nancy, though a combination of poor language skills and having run nearly the full length of the ship made him difficult to understand. No, Commander! Uh, you! You come! Hurry! The two crewmen ducked back out into the hallway and resumed their run, their footsteps echoing down the corridor until they were heard no more. Nancy and Leonard looked at each other, and Leonard shrugged and began to hop forward on his crutches. Nancy put out a hand to stop him, but he shook his head and kept going forward, moving faster with each step he took. It sounds like they want both of us. Let's get moving. Though Leonard had to slow down as he and Nancy passed through each bulkhead, he virtually flew down the corridors, swinging his leg to get as much speed and momentum from the crutches as possible. Just as his arms began to burn from the exercise, they arrived at the command deck. Commander Krylov was seated in a chair in the center of the room, studying a sheet of paper while the rest of the crew worked dutifully at their stations. The atmosphere on the command deck was different than it had been over the last few days, even more electric and alive. Nancy and Leonard could sense anticipation building in the crew for some unknown event. Commander Krylov? Some of your crew came to the medical ward and, and said you wanted to see us? Krylov straightened in his chair and swiveled around at the sound of Nancy's voice. 
Meseems, uh, Mr. Macomb, what on earth are you doing out of bed? Did they not carry you here? Krylov rose and hurried to Leonard's side, helping Nancy ease the injured man into a nearby seat. Ah, thanks for that, Leonard said hoarsely. Out of breath from their mad dash to the command deck, he gasped loudly for a moment, feeling the blood pound through his heart and injured leg. Krylov started to call the doctor over, but Leonard refused, holding his hand up and shaking his head. No, I'm fine, I'm fine. What did you want to see us about? Krylov kept a nervous eye on Leonard as he addressed the pair, somewhat worried about whether Leonard might collapse to the floor. I'm, I'm terribly sorry that the request for your presence was delivered in a, such an apparently urgent manner. I just wanted to show you two some new satellite imagery we obtained, uh, so that she and you could give us your opinions of it, Mr. Macomb. Krylov picked up a laptop and held it out for Nancy, who took it and sat down next to Leonard. The two of them looked at the satellite imagery on the screen, unsure of what they were seeing at first. What are we looking at? This is imagery from 45 minutes ago at the canal, where we'll be crossing in a day or so. Zoom in on the lower half and uh, tell me what you see clustered on and around the bridge. Leonard tapped a few keys and the image changed, magnifying the location Krylov specified. A bridge was visible, stretching high over the canal. Four lanes wide, it was not empty or filled with vehicles, as Leonard and Nancy were expecting, but instead it was filled with bodies. Thousands of creatures packed together as they streamed across the bridge. Creatures were spread out across every square inch of visible land on both ends of the bridge, and from a series of images taken a few moments apart, it was clear that they were moving rapidly northward as they disregarded every obstacle in their path. Chapter 11 11.17 11, a.m., April 24th, 2038 Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry One, two, three, lift! Rachel, Marcus, and David all grunted as they strained to lift the thick steel track on top of one of the wooden ties that had been laid down in the gravel. With Rachel at one end of the beam and Marcus and David at the other, they worked to slide and push the track onto the edge of the tie before stopping. Frequent breaks had become a requisite part of their work, considering that each of them was still dealing with the injuries they had sustained, but the work was moving along smoothly, though not quite as quickly as they had hoped. Nice job, guys. Let's get this one hammered in. Rachel smiled at David and Marcus, who were leaning against each other, groaning from the efforts of their exertion. Each of them only had the full use of one of their arms, so they fell in naturally to helping one another, working to support and brace each other as they moved the heavy equipment on the tracks. Hefting a long-handled hammer into the air, Rachel motioned toward a pile of spikes on the gravel. Who wants their fingers pinched? With a grimace, Marcus leaned down and held one of the spikes vertically over a hole in the rail, flush with the wooden tie, keeping it at arm's length and turning his head away. With a flourish, Rachel raised the hammer above her head and brought it down on the spike. Splintering the wood as it traveled forward, the spike dug a full inch into the wooden tie before stopping. Marcus pulled his hand away and stood up as Rachel brought the hammer down again, delivering several more blows to the spike before finally stopping. She let the head of the hammer fall to the gravel near her feet and drew her arm across her forehead, looking at the dark cloud cover above. <laughs> Just a few more to go and we'll be ready to test it out. As each length of replacement track was pulled onto the ties, Rachel continued to attach the two together with railroad spikes. Compared to a professional job, the work was sloppy and subpar, but it was enough that even David's attitude began to improve. The normal passage of time, marked by the sun, was non-existent thanks to the storms, and by the time Marcus glanced at his watch, it was nearly midnight. He, Rachel, and David were all exhausted as they walked the length of the track, pointing out the small and large flaws and strengths in the work they had performed. While the replacement rail wouldn't hold up to repetitive travel, the three agreed that, if their luck held, it might just allow the locomotives and a few of the train cars to pass before giving way under the stress. Marcus and David collapsed on the ground near the locomotive. Their heads hung to their chests and sweat dripped from their faces, 
falling to the dirt with the tiniest of splashes. Rachel stood over them for a moment as she surveyed the rail before she sat down next to them, taking a proffered bottle of water from Marcus. The three sat quietly for nearly an hour as they rested, watching Sam wander around the newly constructed rail as he sniffed what seemed to be every piece of gravel and every inch of wood, iron, and steel. Finally, after they had recovered a bit from the day's work, Rachel pushed herself up into a standing position and looked back at the train just behind them. Well, what do you say, guys? Can we get the cars uncoupled and test this out tonight? Marcus's first instinct was to laugh, lie down, and go to sleep. With a sigh, though, he took Rachel's outstretched hand and stood up next to her, helping David up along the way. The three stood together for a moment, looking at the makeshift railroad and the massive train that they were hoping the rail would somehow support. Well, David said as he walked toward the locomotive, time to find out whether we're going to fail or not. The couplings holding the train cars together were simple to unlock, and together David and Marcus unlocked the one between the third and fourth train cars, leaving the locomotives and three box cars connected in the lead group. As they worked on the coupling, Rachel pored over the controls in the lead locomotive, trying to learn them well enough to start the lead engine up. Without warning, the locomotive engines came to life, causing David and Marcus to jump away from the train. They ran to the lead locomotive, which had already started inching forward, pulling themselves in through a side door. And were you going to warn us about that? Marcus shouted over the sound of the engines as Rachel worked the controls frantically. Sorry, a little busy here. Did you uncouple the cars? They're disconnected and we're ready. How far will we go, though? Just to the edge of the repaired track? Marcus, David, and Rachel all grabbed frantically for handholds as the train lurched forward. Rachel jabbed at several buttons, but it was no use. I think the train's in an automatic startup cycle. I don't know how to stop it. Unburdened by the hundreds of tons worth of boxcars it had been towing previously, the train accelerated quickly down the track, speeding toward the repaired section at a much faster pace than Rachel had planned. She had hoped to move the train slowly along the repaired area while David and Marcus walked on either side, checking to make sure the repairs would hold up under the train so that they might have a chance to fix any problems as they came up. The train had its own agenda, though, and the power of the locomotives all working in unison drove them forward inexorably with no chance of stopping. Chapter 12, 2.28 p.m., April 24th, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. As Leonard stepped through the bulkhead, Nancy kept her arm outstretched, preparing to catch him in case he tripped. While he had shown remarkable improvements over the last day, Nancy was still concerned about the fast pace Leonard was forcing upon himself after such a major operation. Refusing to listen to any of her arguments, though, Leonard insisted on being allowed to exercise vigorously mainly by walking for hours through the vast corridors of the Archangelisk. Since last seeing Commander Krylov, Nancy and Leonard had spoken little about the satellite imagery of the canal, though it was weighing heavily on both of their minds. When Leonard finally stopped to rest and eat, Nancy took the opportunity to discuss the situation with him over a bowl of uh, suspicious-looking stew. How far do you figure until we're there? Leonard looked up at the wall clock and shrugged. A uh, few hours, maybe. We should get an hour or two of sleep if we can beforehand. Krylov's probably going to want us up there with him while we go through the canal. Any ideas as to why they're all traveling north? Uh, there had to be hundreds of them. Oh, tens of thousands, and that's just what we could see. I'm guessing they're heading to the same place as the ones we saw on the way west, uh, starting at Samuel's compound. Nancy snorted at the mention of Samuel's name and nodded thoughtfully. Probably to the Nexus, then. Same place we're headed. I don't like that one bit. Dealing with the AI's one thing, but those creatures are going to make it even worse. Crumbs flew across the table as Leonard bit into a large cracker too aggressively. After swallowing, he lowered his voice, looking around to make sure no one was listening. Krylov seems to like you. He's listened to your opinions so far, anyway. Maybe you can convince him to deal out a bit of destruction on our way through the canal, so we can slow the creatures down a bit. 
It might not do all that much in the grand scheme of things, but who knows? Nancy nodded and then turned to look at the door opening at the other end of the room, past a few crewmen who were also partaking in the meal, as if on cue, Commander Krylov stepped through the bulkhead. Looking around, he spotted Nancy and Leonard and nodded to them before taking a dish and filling it with a small portion of stew and packaged crackers. Greeting the crewmen as he went, he walked toward Nancy and Leonard and sat down next to Leonard, giving him a clap on the back as he looked at his bandaged leg. Mr. McComb, how goes the exercise? Leonard smiled and shrugged. As well as it can, I guess. It hurts like hell, but your doctor's done a good job taking care of everything. Krylov dug a spoon into the stew, making a face as he put it in his mouth. Oh, he's doing a fair sight better than our cook, I'm afraid. Oh, poor bastard drew the short straw after the landing part of the incidents. Krylov picked up a cracker and opened the package, pushing the stew away in the process. As bad as it is, though, you'd both better get as much in you as you can stomach. We're coming up on the crossing in two hours, and I would appreciate your assistance upon the command deck, Miss Sims, and yours as well, Mr. McComb, if you can manage. Leonard slapped the thigh of his injured leg and smiled broadly. Nothing I can't handle, Commander. We were actually just discussing the canal before you arrived. The Commander raised an eyebrow as he took a small bite from the cracker. Though? Please enlighten me. I could use as much information going into this as I can get. Leonard looked at Nancy, and she took a deep breath before speaking. Uh, we haven't talked about it much, but we're in agreement that the creature's goal is to reach the Nexus. They're traveling in huge swarms, like the ones we saw when we were going from Washington to Alaska. Any particular reason why they'd be trying to reach this uh, Nexus that you can think of? We were just starting to discuss that when you arrived, Leonard interjected. It's likely that the AI is gearing up for the next step it's taking, uh, whatever that is. You know the theories that we were throwing around, but there's no solid evidence for any of them yet. What we do know, Nancy said, is that letting those creatures get to where they're going is anything but a good idea. Krylov's eyes narrowed as he glanced back and forth between Nancy and Leonard a slight smile gracing his face. I have the feeling you're about to ask me to do something, yes? Nancy reached out and patted Krylov's arm, smiling as she did so. Very observant, Commander. Leonard and I agree that any disruption in the creature's movements could be beneficial. Since we're passing through the canal anyway, we were hoping that there might be some way to prevent any more of them from crossing over. Krylov looked at the surface of the table for a long moment as he quietly stroked his chin. Hmm, I think we can manage that. He stood up, tossing the uneaten half of his cracker into his lukewarm stew. Follow me, and I'll show you a few options at our disposal. Chapter 13, 1109 p.m., April 24th, 2038. Rachel Walsh. Marcus Warden, David Landry. The sound of gravel being pulverized under the wheels of the locomotive was harsh over the sound of the engines themselves. David, Marcus, and Rachel all winced at the noise, but with nothing they could do about it, they held on and hoped for the best. Tucked in a corner and whining loudly, Sam cowered in fear at the sounds surrounding him. Marcus reached out a hand to comfort him, only to be thrown to the floor as the locomotive rocked from side to side. Metal ground upon metal as the wooden ties shifted under the weight of the train, causing the tracks to begin to fall out of alignment. With only a few ties placed, the amount of stress on the spikes and ties was enormous, and the entire repaired section was under threat of collapse. We have to stop! It's not going to hold! David screamed in Rachel's ear, fighting to be heard. It's not like we have a choice anymore! Just hold on! Rachel shouted back at David as she watched through the front of the train to see the repaired section coming to an end. We're nearly there! Another lurch rocked the train in the opposite direction, and the cold snap of steel chilled Marcus's spine. David and Rachel were thrown across the narrow confines of the locomotive, 
while Marcus barely managed to maintain his hold on a nearby seat as he sank to the floor to try and get to a safer position. As he watched out the window, the black clouds ahead began to tilt crazily to the left, before rocketing back to the right as the train lifted several inches up and then slammed back to the ground. Though the lead engine had gone through the repaired tracks without an issue, the stress caused by the subsequent engines and boxcars was too much for the meager assortment of wooden ties and spikes. The rails began to break off from the ties, sending the spikes rocketing through the air due to the sheer amount of pressure they were under and widening the width of the rails to the point where the rear cars were no longer in full contact with them. No longer constrained by the rails, the rear cars began to wobble causing the entire train to pitch back and forth and setting up a resonance that threatened to derail the entire set of cars. Frantically pawing through the controls, Rachel tried desperately to find something to slow the train down, but as she pushed and pulled on a series of buttons, switches, and small levers, one of them caused the train to jolt forward even faster. The engines went into overdrive as the throttle was pushed to its maximum, and the train struggled to find traction to pull the rear boxcars through the last few feet of the now nearly redestroyed section of repaired track. Although the increase in speed wasn't the result Rachel had hoped for, it was the one that ultimately resulted in success. Instead of stopping and hoping that the oscillation of the train would cease before the locomotives and boxcars were thrown off the tracks, the increase in speed broke the resonant frequency set up by the fishtailing boxcars causing them to straighten out as the back-and-forth motions of the train ceased. A final horrendous squeal of metal upon metal signaled the end of the repaired section of the track as the boxcar's wheels locked back into the rails with several satisfying thumps. Free of the abrupt panic brought on by the near-disastrous experience, Rachel remembered the emergency lever she had used previously to stop the train and placed her hand on it, preparing to pull it downward. Marcus's hand came down on Rachel's and pulled it off the lever as he pushed her to the side. No, we're clear. If we stop again, we'll have to go through all that startup nonsense again. Hearing Marcus's voice cleared the clouds in Rachel's mind, and she stepped back and sank to the floor, her back against the wall of the locomotive. Instead of the sound of scraping metal or spikes being torn from wooden ties, the only sounds were the engines of the locomotives and the clicking of train wheels on the tracks as it continued to pick up speed. The steadily increasing clicks were oddly soothing to Rachel, who found herself timing her breathing to them as she calmed down and tried to recover. Sam poked his head out from his hiding place and crawled up to Rachel, nuzzling his head in her lap and whining softly as he looked for comfort from their ordeal. I hope we didn't forget anything, because we're definitely not going back that way. David was leaning halfway out of a window as he looked back at the formerly repaired section of track that was now in ruins. The wooden ties were askew, with one of them having sunk far enough into the gravel that the rails connected to it had physically broken under the weight of the train as it passed over, making it impossible for anything to cross over the area again. Marcus and Rachel instinctively looked around them, verifying that they had indeed loaded all of their supplies onto the train, and thankful once again that nothing of importance had been lost in the APC's explosion. Chapter 14, 6.36 p.m., April 24, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. So, what do you think? Commander Krylov strode down the center of the brightly lit chamber, lifting his arms and gesturing to either side. The immense room filled the forward portion of the Archangelisk, running from the bottom to the top of the ship and extending out to both sides. Rows of large cylinders stood upright to the left and right of Nancy and Leonard as they followed Krylov, gazing around in awe. Radiation symbols were affixed to the tubes, along with long and cryptic metal signs filled with Cyrillic script. One-third of the tubes were several feet in diameter, while the rest were of smaller sizes all the way down to just two feet. As Krylov continued to lead them forward, Leonard noticed that the orientation and styling of the cylinders changed abruptly. Instead of being featureless and standing upright, the tubes at the front of the chamber were laid out horizontally in large stacks along the outer walls. Uh, torpedo tubes, I assume? 
Leonard nodded in the direction of the horizontal tubes, and Krylov stopped to see what he was referring to. Ah, yes, indeed. For both uh, forward and aft launching. Uh, good against targets in the water, though I'm afraid they won't do much onto the creatures on the surface. Uh, what about the nukes? I think you're forgetting something. Nancy spoke from behind Leonard as she peeked through a small window in the side of one of the torpedo tubes, examining the weapon inside. The nanobots feed off radiation. We'll destroy the creatures, but feed them at the same time. Ah, damn. How can I forget that? Leonard muttered, putting his hand to his forehead. Nancy is correct, Mr. McComb. Uh, from my study of the data you provided, if it comes down to us being responsible for destroying the nanobots and their nexus, we'll only have one shot at destroying enough of them to cripple them before they can start rebuilding themselves. We can only use the nuclear devices on the nexus if we hope to maintain the element of surprise. Leonard leaned up against one of the torpedo tubes, taking his weight off of his good leg and the crutches. Well, I would assume you've got something non-nuclear that you can use out of the water, right? Krylov's blank stare and his hesitation at responding to Leonard's question gave Nancy and Leonard the only answer they needed. <laughs> well, shit, Krylov. How are you fixed for spit? A puzzled look passed over Krylov's face before he ignored the colloquialism and continued speaking. Unfortunately, Mr. McComb, you are correct. Our only surface-to-surface -surface weapons are nuclear, as was our loadout when we left port. Walking to a set of locked containers in a corner, Krylov extracted a key from his pocket and opened one of them, pulling out a large gray object and holding it aloft. We do, however, have this. Krylov threw the object toward Leonard, who caught it and turned it in his hands, examining the writing. Warnings were emblazoned in not only Russian, but in six other languages, including English. Warning, high explosives. Handle with caution. A Leonard looked up at Krylov, a thin smile crossing his face. Nicely done. How are we going to plant it without getting overrun by the creatures, though? That, Mr. McComb, will be simple. If you're ready, please follow me again. Krylov walked back down through the chamber the way they came, leaving Nancy and Leonard standing alone. Leonard threw the explosive back in the crate where Krylov had retrieved it, before pulling his crutches back under his arms. Nancy walked next to him as they hurried to catch up to Krylov, who was already at the doorway leading into the room. I think you offended him, Nancy whispered in Leonard's ear. Ah, you'll get over it. Besides, he could do to be stirred up a bit when we get there. The walk to the next attraction was shorter than the first. A brief walk up a flight of stairs led them to a dimly lit area near the top of the submarine, an area that seemed oddly familiar to both Nancy and Leonard. Krylov stopped near a flight of stairs that went upwards into a closed hatch, then he pointed at the floor. I believe you left something of yours here, Mr. McComb. The dark metal of the stairs and floor around them was discolored. As Nancy's and Leonard's eyes adjusted to the lighting, they both realized why the stairwell felt familiar. You're going to send your men up on deck to place the explosives by hand? The disbelief was plain to hear in Leonard's voice as he ignored Krylov's poor joke about the dried blood that still coated the stairs. Nancy started to respond to Krylov's remark, not liking the tone in which he made it, but Leonard stopped her, shaking his head slightly as he didn't want to make any sort of fuss about it. Of course, Mr. McComb, uh, the canal's width is such that the men should be able to plant explosives at both sides of the bridge with ease before we submerge to go underneath. If they work quickly and quietly enough, I assume they should be able to do it without uh, drawing the creature's attention, yes? I, uh, <laughs> I, I guess it's possible. Leonard was starting to second-guess the idea of trying to destroy the bridge, wondering if it was worth the risk, when Krylov clapped his hands together and smiled broadly. Well then, it's settled. He glanced at his watch, raising an eyebrow as he looked back at Leonard and Nancy. You'd both be wise to get some rest. We'll be arriving shortly, and I'll need you close by when we do. I'll send the crewman to retrieve you then. Krylov turned and walked quickly away leaving Nancy and Leonard to stand alone together in the dimly lit hallway. Is it 
just me? Nancy said. Or does Krylov seem a bit, uh, off compared to when we first met him? Leonard replied cryptically as he watched Krylov disappear around a turn. Things aren't always as they seem. Nancy sighed and turned around, trying to remember how to get back. A sign nearby with a small red cross on it had an arrow pointing in the opposite direction from where Krylov had gone. They followed the arrow dutifully, slowly making their way back to the medical ward. Chapter 15 11.52 p.m., April 24th, 2038 Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry Hell yes! Marcus's outburst was accompanied by a short jump and a quick pump of his arm in the air. Stretching his arm out, he grabbed Rachel and David, pulling them in tightly for a hug. Overcome with a sudden feeling of happiness and excitement, Marcus's smile was contagious, and Rachel and David quickly found themselves joining in with the impromptu celebration. I still can't believe that worked. David craned his head out the window again. Though they had traveled too far to still be able to see the damaged section of track, he was still marveling over the fact that their repairs had held up long enough to allow them to get by. Marcus slapped David on the back and grinned from ear to ear. <laughs> Have some faith in us, David. Pulling off the impossible is what we're meant to do. Apparently so. Rachel sat slowly down on the floor and smiled, shaking her head in disbelief. The tension caused by the long ordeal had finally broken, snapping like a rubber band and leaving her overcome with a sense of relief. Despite the fact that they were still nowhere near where they needed to be, they had, against all odds, managed to both recover from Doe's attack and deal a retaliatory blow that had taken him out of the picture. This realization led to another, more sobering one that quickly erased her smile. Noticing her sudden change in mood, Marcus and David sat down next to her. Hey, what's up? Marcus asked playfully, still smiling. Wish we had left him alive or something? Of course not. Rachel's glare was subtle, but behind it stretched more rage and fire than Marcus had seen before, instantly making him regret the joke. But with him out of the way, all we've got left is the AI to contend with. Uh, sorry, but isn't that a good thing? David broke in, looking at Rachel in confusion. Oh, sure, it, it's great. But compared to fighting the AI, dealing with that megalomaniac almost sounds like a walk in the park. It wasn't, but, well, you know what I mean. Still confused, David stood up and dug into his bag, pulling out a dust-covered bag of chips. Eh, better one than two he said, stuffing a handful of chips into his mouth. Besides, we've got a trump card with Bertha. When we reach the Nexus, all we'll have to do is fire her up, and the nanobots should be gone just like that. <sighs> I hope you're right. Rachel sighed heavily and stood up, stretching her arms and legs as she rose. Okay, that's enough doom and gloom for now. Marcus jumped to his feet. We'll have plenty of time for that later. For now, we need to set up a watch pattern. I'm feeling alert enough, so I'll go first. David, you can go next, then Rachel. Standing there at the front of the locomotive, one arm bound in a sling with bandages taped across his shoulder, Marcus looked like he had been to hell and back. His attitude, on the other hand, was that of a boisterous three-year-old once again, happy and full of energy. Rachel smiled at him, glad to see that he was beginning to return to his old self. After being worried about him and how he and David were behaving toward each other, it was good to see a positive change in the midst of everything that was going on. As Rachel stretched out near the back of the locomotive with Sam curled up next to her, she couldn't help but think about Marcus's question. I wish we had left him alive or something? Having the thought of Doe to deal with had kept her marginally distracted from the larger picture. With that distraction now gone and left by the side of the tracks to rot, she had no other choice but to face the AI head-on, including the numerous implications that came with it. Doing so meant dredging up thoughts and feelings that she hadn't considered for many days. Rachel closed her eyes, but instead of darkness, the image of her daughter flashed by, followed by her husband and her home. Cities that she had passed through, the remnants of bodies, 
burned out cars and collapsed buildings all came trickling back to the forefront of her thoughts, though they didn't come alone. A slow, steady buildup of guilt accompanied them, along with a profound sense of emptiness. A rustle from David several feet in front of her suddenly made her wonder, Does he feel the same thing? If David felt a similar measure of guilt for what had happened, he didn't show it. This has been Final Dawn, Episode 11. Written by Mike Kraus. Narrated by Mike Kraus. Final Dawn, Episode 12. Written by Mike Kraus. Narrated by Mike Kraus. Chapter 1. 7.02 a.m., April 25, 2038. Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. The clear skies that had allowed the Archongelisk to obtain imagery of the canal persisted through the morning. Commander Krylov rotated the periscope slowly as the Archongelisk sailed the last few miles down the coast past Veracruz on its way into the first section of the canal. The soft tap of rubber on the metal floor made Krylov turn around, and he smiled as Nancy and Leonard approached him. It seems, Mr. McComb, so good of you to be here. There was no trace of the dark, sarcastic humor Krylov had shown earlier in the darkened hallway. Nancy and Leonard had gotten no sleep, having spent the last few hours discussing Krylov's strategy to take out the bridge the creatures were using to cross over the canal. Commander! Leonard nodded and sat down in a seat next to the periscope. Krylov stepped back and motioned for Nancy to step forward. Please, take a look, Miss Sims. Place your arms on the handles and use them to turn left and right. Nancy pressed her forehead against the padded surface above the eyepiece, well worn from years of service. The bright light of the rising sun made her squint as her eyes struggled to adjust. As the outside world came into focus, Nancy began to see the coastline take shape, with beaches, trees, and a few scattered houses near a large runway in the distance. As Nancy slowly rotated the periscope, her hand brushed against a button on the side of one of the handles, causing the magnification of the scope to change. Everything in her view suddenly leapt forward, appearing larger than it had before and startling her in the process. To someone who hadn't spent weeks traveling cross-country and witnessing destruction on a scale never before seen by mankind, the few shattered buildings and scorched fields in the distance might have appeared to be the result of a fire or an earthquake. Nancy knew differently, though, recognizing the telltale patterns of destruction that told of bombs that had fallen close by. Commander Krylov? Nancy stepped away from the periscope, rubbing her eyes. It looks like at least one nuke was dropped nearby. Are you sure the canal's clear? Krylov pointed at a nearby computer screen and nodded. Everything we looked at indicated that it was. The area was hit hard, but the canal was out of the danger zone for most of the damage from what we can tell. Nancy looked at Leonard, who nodded slowly. Let's hope you're right, Commander. Leonard jumped in next before Krylov had a chance to reply. Uh, Mr. Krylov, he said, deliberately avoiding the use of Krylov's position as a test of sorts. Uh, the Panama Canal isn't exactly short. The imagery we saw was only a fraction of it. Aren't there other bridges that run across? If Krylov was bothered by Leonard's use of the term Mr. instead of Commander, he didn't show it. Oh, but of course, Mr. McComb. Krylov motioned to the same computer screen again as he pushed a few keys, pulling up a wider satellite view of the area they were entering. There are three main bridges through the area, one at the start, one near the middle at the automated locks, and then another near the end. Now, these bridges appear to operate as both pedestrian, uh, train, and vehicular ones, which makes our job much easier. Leonard whistled softly as he stood up, leaning forward on his crutches to examine the image up close. That's a lot of concrete and steel to take out without getting spotted. Are you sure we can do it? Krylov nodded. We don't have a choice, Mr. McComb, unless you can think of another option. Leonard shook his head and sat back down, idly rubbing around the stump of his leg. Not really another option, so much as wondering how we'll pull it off. 
especially in broad daylight when these things will be streaming across the bridges like cockroaches during spring cleaning. Commander Krylov pointed at the screen again, tapping the locations of the first and second bridges. From the last pass of scans we were able to obtain, it looks like these two bridges get the least amount of traffic. Most of the creatures seem to be congregated around the central one. For the first and last bridges, we shouldn't have any trouble getting the explosives set. For the middle one, though, you may be right. But it's a risk that you and me seems made clear that we need to take to try and delay these things as long as possible. Now, once all sets of explosives have been set and we're clear of the final bridge, we'll blow them all at once to ensure that we're nowhere near when it happens. It's an imperfect plan to be sure, though I see no other option. All right, Nancy said, looking to Leonard for his silent confirmation. How long until the first explosives are planted? Krylov looked at his watch. We have approximately fifteen minutes until we reach the first bridge when we'll surface and uh, plant the first set of explosives. Mind if we uh, go up and watch? Leonard stood up and balanced on his crutches, demonstrating that while he might have been knocked down, he was anything but out. We'll stay out of their way. Plus, we might be of some use. Krylov hesitated, nearly denying Leonard's request before relenting. Ah, uh, very well. Don't leave the stairwell, though. If we have to close the hatch in the hurry, you two cannot be anywhere close to it. Leonard turned and started hurrying toward the exit, calling over his shoulder as he departed with Nancy. No problem. Ten minutes later, Leonard and Nancy stood near four men in the blood-stained stairwell. The men looked nervous, more with themselves and the task they were about to perform than with the two strangers standing nearby. Nancy kept her arm around Leonard to help him balance as they waited for the hatch to open. How much longer? Nancy whispered to Leonard, who shrugged in response. A soft, flashing amber light answered Nancy's question, as did a loud mechanical rumble from the direction of the top of the wide stairwell. Light burst through cracks in the hatch as it rolled open, flooding the compartment with fresh air, the smell of the ocean, and the sound of rushing water. The Archongolisk had barely surfaced as it was passing under the first bridge on its way to the locks as the helmsman fought to balance stealth and speed. The depth of the canal was less of a worry, since there was more than enough room for the Archongolisk to remain fully submerged and make its way through. Radios strapped to the crewmen's chests crackled and a terse order was issued. They immediately ran up the stairs, exiting onto the exterior of the Archongolisk. Two of the men ran for the port side, while the other two headed to the edge of the starboard. They dropped to their knees as a shudder ran through the ship, causing Leonard to tip forward, nearly losing his balance. The ship came to a near stop and began to surface faster, bringing them high on the water. When the submarine finally finished moving, the men extracted sets of tubes from bags carried on their backs and began aiming them at the bridge supports high above their heads. Small black shapes flew from the tubes and landed on the steel of the bridge with rhythmic thumps as the magnetic sheaths wrapped around the plastic explosives kept both the explosives and their detonators attached to the bridge. Even as high as the Archongolisk was in the water, launching the explosives at the high points of the bridge was risky, and more than one failed to attach because it simply didn't gain enough altitude. The combination rail, vehicular, and pedestrian bridges were all of the bascule drawbridge variety, designed specifically to ensure that ships of all heights passing through the canal could get through. A high arch on the first drawbridge meant that the explosives couldn't be evenly distributed but instead had to be clustered around both ends. The total time the four crewmen took to affix the explosives to the drawbridge was under two minutes, after which they hurried back down the stairwell, as thousands of creatures continued to stream over the structure high overhead. One of them spoke softly into his radio, and the hatch began to close as the submarine sank back into the water, moving forward to the next target. Chapter 2 5.07 a.m., April 25th, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. Rachel! Marcus's voice was low, but he still managed to hiss at her as he spoke, communicating a frightening level of urgency and panic. Wake up! We've got problems! 
Rolling over and pushing herself to her knees, Rachel crawled forward, joining Marcus and David, who were each crouched behind a control panel, peeking above it to watch out the side of the train. Sam lifted his head to look at Rachel, and she shook her head at him, whispering for him to stay still. What's going on, guys? Rachel slid in between David and Marcus, who both pointed through the window. After meandering through the woods for a while, the tracks converged with a highway, running parallel to it for several miles. Out on the highway, illuminated both by the glimmer of the rising sun and lightning from the storms, Rachel saw the reason why David and Marcus were both staying hidden. No more than fifty feet away, thousands of creatures were moving together down the road heading south. Changed individuals, both old and young, made up the group that was larger than Rachel could have imagined. The creatures paid no attention to the train as it passed by them, whipping down the tracks at top speed, just as it had when it was under the control of the creatures previously. Marcus turned around and sat down on the floor of the locomotive, taking a deep breath and exhaling slowly. <gasps> oh, damn, that's a lot of them. These migrations seem to be getting much more common, Rachel whispered. I guess it's time for them to all congregate at the Nexus. Marcus peeked back up at the window, watching how quickly they were traveling compared to the creatures. Well, that's no problem. We'll get there way before the creatures do, going at this speed. True, but who's to say that the AI is going to wait for every creature to reach the Nexus before launching its next step? Uh, what about creatures in the rest of the world? I'm not sure they'd be able to make it here, let alone in any reasonable time frame. That? David turned around as well, trying to think of a good reply. That's a very good point. What about those creatures? Separated as they are from the Nexus, they won't be able to get here. So what's going to happen to them? Couldn't there be other places where they're building these Nexuses? Marcus's question was met with a quick shake of David's head. Oh, definitely not. I would have seen them on the satellite scans. Whatever they're doing, they decided on this particular location. Luckily for us. I'd hate to be stuck trying to get across the Atlantic. So what happens to these things when the Nexus is gone? Marcus looked at Rachel, repeating David's question. Your guesses are as good as mine. They might self-destruct, try to reform in swarms, or who knows what else. It doesn't really matter, though. Not now, anyway. We just have to destroy the AI before it does whatever next-level bullshit it's trying to do. We can worry about mopping up the survivors afterward. The answer Rachel gave was unsatisfying to the three of them, but with nothing better, it was the only one they had. Getting back on their knees, the group resumed their watch of the creatures, occasionally pointing out a particularly disfigured or odd-looking one as they tried to make light of the admittedly frightening situation. Though the creatures had no idea that Rachel, Marcus, and David were on the train, if they found out, they could easily derail it and ensure that the three wouldn't make it to the coast. The tracks continued along next to the road for several more minutes before branching away, back into the woods and fields as they had before. With the creatures long out of sight, the trio all breathed a collective sigh of relief and sat back down on the floor of the locomotive. Too filled with adrenaline, Rachel and David had no more interest in sleeping and instead busied themselves with organizing their supplies. David started to set up his computer and electronics that he had taken from the APC before it was destroyed, while Marcus and Rachel took stock of their food and water and examined the controls of the train in detail. Marcus glanced over at David sitting on the floor, hunched over his computer as he was examining satellite imagery. Hey, David, where do you think we are? Hmm? David turned and looked at Marcus, distracted by what he was doing. Our location. Any ideas? Oh, uh, sorry. These aren't live images. There's too much cloud cover for that. David sighed and closed his eyes, rubbing the bridge of his nose as he tried to figure out where they were. Oh, somewhere in the Carolinas, I'd guess. I'm not exactly sure where this particular track goes, though. Rachel leaned over David's shoulder, taking a look at his computer. That's something we need to figure out soon. If this train was on its way to the Gulf, as we assumed, there could be a track changeover that we need to take to get there. David nodded. Uh, two steps ahead of you there. 
I'm looking through some of this older imagery to try and figure out what track we're on, then I should be able to tell you exactly how we'll get there. Marcus leaned back against the wall, looking out at the sharp shadows cast from the trees by the flashing lightning. I wonder how Leonard and Nancy are getting on. It'd be nice to at least know that they're alive. There was no response from either Rachel or David as they all thought about Leonard, Nancy, and the submarine, hoping that, somehow, a miracle was being pulled out of a hat. The only sounds in the locomotive for several minutes were the engine, Sam's gentle snoring, and the tap of David's fingers on his laptop keys. Locked in a battle with the computer, he worked tirelessly until, finally, he spoke. What the hell? Rachel looked over at him lazily, then caught sight of what was on the screen. Hey, you connected with the satellite! David nodded slowly as he stared at the screen, a curious expression on his face. Yes, just temporarily. It's down again, but... But this, this can't be right. The satellite log shows that there was a login from the Pacific Ocean. Not too long ago, either. He looked up at Rachel and Marcus, turning the screen more so that Rachel could see the data herself. How on earth can you know that someone in the Pacific was looking at the satellite? Marcus raised his eyebrow as he asked the question. The satellite records an image of the location of every access attempt for security, plus a whole host of other information, too. If I had to guess, Rachel said, interrupting David as a smile slowly built on her face, then I'd say that Leonard and Nancy are not only alive, but on their way to us as we speak. She jabbed her finger at the screen, pointing to a collection of letters that Marcus didn't recognize. That's not one of our machines, and it's certainly not anything I've seen from a U.S. government computer. Rachel's smile was infectious, and Marcus and David quickly found themselves grinning along with her, overjoyed at the knowledge that Leonard and Nancy were most likely alive, well, and bringing some much-needed backup to the fight. Chapter 3, 11.39 a.m., April 25th, 2038 Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims. In the haze of smoke and confusion, Leonard wasn't quite sure where things had gone wrong. Thirty seconds earlier, he had been standing at the bottom of the stairwell next to Nancy, watching as the four crewmen launched explosives onto the second bridge, while another two crewmen ascended a ladder on the wall of the lock, climbing toward a nearby control room. Thousands of creatures were pouring across the bridge above the Archangelisk, but despite the massive size of the vessel and the noise made by the crewmen on her deck, the creatures on the bridge were paying them no mind. Out of nowhere, though, several events unfolded at once that radically changed the situation. The roar of one of the creatures cut quite clearly through the sound of them walking and running across the bridge, which in turn caused hundreds of the creatures surrounding it to stop walking and look for the source of what had made it cry out. One of the four crewmen on the bridge, frightened by the creatures overhead, prematurely detonated the explosives with an emergency detonator, causing a chain reaction with the rest of the explosives. However, since an uneven amount of explosives had been placed, it did not collapse with the precision that Krylov had planned to happen when they had long since passed the locks. Twisted shards of metal, both large and small, filled the air, churning with huge plumes of smoke and flames. Bits of the bridge began to rain down onto the Archangelisk, and Nancy pulled Leonard back, nearly toppling him over as they ran several feet down the corridor to escape from the debris crashing in through the open hatch. Hundreds of the creatures on the bridge were killed instantly at both ends where the explosives were laid, and the survivors howled in rage, focusing their attention on the destruction to find its cause. Of the four crewmen on deck when the explosions went off, Three were killed almost immediately by pieces of the bridge swinging and falling downward, scraping along the hull of the Archangelisk as they went. The fourth was able to dive through the hatch, barely escaping a massive piece of the bridge that hung in the air, swinging back and forth before finally crashing down, sending a shudder through the entire vessel. Alarm klaxons began to howl throughout the ship, and Krylov shouted into the radio, trying to figure out what had happened. With the bridge in tatters, and much of those tatters now on top of and in the water around and below the submarine, there was still the matter of passing through the locks to deal with. 
The filling and draining sequences were fully automated, yet they required someone in the control room in a tower overlooking the central bridge to start them up. The two crewmen assigned to this task were very nearly shaken off of the ladder leading up the side of the lock to the control room, but they managed to hang on through the turmoil. Looking back, they were both in shock at seeing the carnage below them. In addition to the bridge having been half-destroyed and the creatures injured and enraged, their escape route back through the Archangelisk's hatch was now cut off by the massive pieces of steel that lay twisted on the deck, blocking all entry and exit. Creatures were leaping from the bridge onto the submarine's deck far below, some of them falling still as they broke limbs, while others managed to stay intact and began tearing at the debris that covered the open hatch. Move! The crewman lowest on the ladder shouted at his companion, who was staring at the mayhem with his mouth hanging open. Startled, he looked down and then up before resuming his climb. With another thirty feet to go before reaching the control room, both men hurried as quickly as they could until they reached a metal hatch. The lead man pushed against it with his shoulder, and it popped open with a clang. Both men pulled themselves into the control room, the lead man going straight for the controls with a radio in his hand, while the other pulled a submachine gun from a bag strapped to his back before taking up a guard position near the main door to the control room. On the Archangelisk, the situation had gone from bad to worse. The sound of creatures landing on the hull above them spurred Leonard and Nancy to race down the corridor, limited only by the speed at which Leonard could throw himself forward with his crutches. The creatures tore at the metal debris covering the open hatch, effortlessly removing enough of it in the space of a minute to allow themselves easy entry down the stairwell and into the submarine itself. Letting Leonard get ahead of her to jump through a bulkhead doorway, Nancy turned and saw a dozen creatures racing towards her, the red alarm lights reflecting in their silver eye sockets. Move your ass! Leonard reached out for Nancy, tugging her roughly through the doorway before raising his hand and firing several shots from a pistol that had somehow materialized there. Nancy held her hands over her ears as the sounds echoed off the corridor walls, making every shot sound like a miniature explosion. Three creatures fell to the floor in the corridor before Leonard pushed against the open hatch door, swinging it shut to block the creatures from continuing through. Seeing Leonard's struggle, Nancy crawled forward and pushed as well, giving the door enough of a shove to close just before the creature slammed into it. Leonard quickly twisted the wheel on the door, locking it tightly before he jammed one of his crutches into it, keeping the creatures from unlocking it. We need to get moving to the command deck before those things get there. Leonard moved his remaining crutch to the right side and balanced on it while motioning for Nancy to move to his left. He placed his left arm around her shoulder for support and started hopping forward, moving as quickly as he could. Behind them, the creatures shattered the thick glass on the door, howling madly as they threw themselves against it, trying to no avail to break through. After they had turned a corner and closed another hatch, Leonard stopped and sank to the floor, pulling a handheld radio from his pocket and thumbing the button. Krylov, this is Macomb. The creatures are on board. You need to seal up as many hatches as you can and get us the hell underwater. Now! On the command deck, Commander Krylov's face turned white as Leonard's voice came over the speakers. Turning to his dive officer, he shouted, resisting the urge to knock the man from his chair and perform the operation himself. Dive, dammit! Dive! Get us as low as possible! He then turned to the rest of the skeleton crew, desperately wishing that he wasn't running out of men so quickly. Harm yourselves and begin to seal the bulkheads leading to the surface exits. If you see anything not human, shoot it! The men he was addressing scrambled to obey, running through multiple exits from the command deck to obtain weapons and proceed through the ship. Back in the control room overlooking the lock, the lead crewman looked over the controls, quickly finding the one required to begin the filling process. Connected to diesel generators below ground and solar panels strung along both sides of the lock, the control room and the lock itself were still fully operational and needed only the touch of a single button to operate. Commander, we're in position! Static filled the radio for several seconds, then Krylov's voice came through, barely audible over the sound of alarms in the background. Start it now! Hurry! Below them, the massive vessel began to sink into the water. 
air bubbles rose to the surface from the open hatch, churning the water and disorienting the creatures around the ship as they continued to try and make their way in. The two men in the control room watched the ship sink for a few seconds as they resigned themselves to their fate before activating the console and starting the automated filling process that would allow the Argongolisk to pass through the locks. Nancy and Leonard had stopped to catch their breath again, lost in some section of the ship that Nancy didn't recognize from her earlier explorations. She was doing her best to get them to the command deck, but had so far been unsuccessful. Gunfire and distant voices, both human and not, had echoed through the corridors, making them uncertain as to the current situation involving the creatures. <laughs> Leonard? Leonard was sitting on the corridor floor opposite Nancy, thumbing the radio button to no avail. He looked up at her, breathing heavily from his exertion, wincing at the stabs of pain that would occasionally lance through his leg. How <sighs> what? Where did you get that? Nancy pointed at the radio. And the gun, too. Where did you get them? Leonard smiled as he massaged his knee. Krylov needs to pay a bit more attention when he lets strangers into his weapons rooms. I snagged the gun and the radio on our way out, just in case we needed them at some point. A loud clang echoed through the corridor, sounding closer than any of the other noises had been. I wish I would have grabbed more than one pistol, though. Leonard pushed himself up with Nancy's help and they continued on their way, moving as quickly and as quietly as they could. Since sitting down and getting back up again, the noise level had gone down, and there was only an occasional burst of gunfire, followed by a howl or scream. All of the wall signs were marked in Russian with arrows pointing in various directions, and no clear indication of where the command deck was. As they continued to move forward, though, the sound of gunfire gradually grew louder to the point where the sporadic bursts were coming from behind a doorway in the next corridor down. Leonard and Nancy stopped and leaned against the wall, trying to decide if they would be safer retreating or hoping that whoever was shooting wasn't being overwhelmed by the creatures. Chapter 4 12.28 p.m. April 25th, 2038 Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims Keep it up! They're nearly all dead! Commander Krylov was kneeling behind his chair, looking down the sights of a rifle that he kept pointed at the one door that was left open to the command deck. Behind him, the rest of what remained of the Argongolisk's crew stood in various positions, all brandishing weapons ranging from Makarovs to AK-74s. Every few seconds, a creature would dart past the open door, testing the crew's defenses and reactions, trying to gain entry to the room and kill the last of the people on board. A shot rang out from behind Krylov, who shouted at the man without bothering to turn his head. Do not engage unless you have a sure shot! Ammunition was beginning to run low, and Krylov wasn't certain how many creatures were left on board. In the moments since the bridge had collapsed over the Archangelisk, Krylov had been shocked at how many creatures had gained entry to the submarine, as well as how quickly they had swept through the ship, trying to kill anyone who stood in their way. His men had performed bravely, manually closing off hatches and activating emergency bulkhead seals that prevented the Argongolisk from completely flooding, though the vessel's response was sluggish due to the amount of water she had taken on. More of the flooded areas would have been sealed off if not for the creatures, though, which nearly overwhelmed the small crew. Quickly honing in on the retreating crew, the creatures had congregated around the command deck, which Krylov had the foresight to seal off leaving one entrance intentionally open to try and keep the creatures busy with so that they wouldn't go on a rampage through the rest of the ship. Seven creatures had died to hails of gunfire, and one of the crew on the command deck had been injured so far after he got too close to one of the beasts that hadn't been properly finished off. Another creature ran past the open door, hooking its hand around the frame and swinging in, staying low to the ground to avoid being shot. Krylov tracked the creature with his rifle and fired several short bursts, sending all but two rounds directly into the creature's side and chest. It collapsed to the floor, sliding several inches before coming to rest in front of a petrified crewman who it had been trying to reach, adding another body to the seven already lying just inside the door to the command deck. Behind Krylov, the groan of a hatch lock being disengaged made him turn, 
A figure was visible through the small window in the door, though he couldn't make out if it was human or one of the disfigured creatures. Another burst of gunfire came from one of the crewmen, and a howl came from the corridor as another creature darted by slowly enough to take a few bullets in the side. The hatch on the opposite side of the room began to open, and Krylov tightened his grip on his rifle as he prepared for an assault by the creatures from two directions. Don't shoot! Nancy stepped through the door with Leonard right behind her, leaning on her for support as he hopped over the threshold and began to pull the door closed behind him. Krylov lowered his rifle and looked at Nancy and Leonard with a stunned expression, shocked that they had survived long enough to make it to the command deck. Leonard! Nancy! Krylov's formal way of addressing the two had disappeared as his accent had grown stronger from the stress he was under. He glanced at Leonard's hand and belt where he carried the empty pistol and the radio that he had taken from the equipment locker. Looking back at Leonard for a long moment, he weighed the option of giving the man another weapon. Can you shoot? Krylov picked up a rifle from the floor and threw it at Leonard, who caught it with one hand. He dropped down on his one knee and swung the upper half of his other leg around, sitting on a step near the back of the room with his rifle placed firmly against his shoulder. I can manage. Krylov nodded, relieved, then looked at Nancy. She held out her hands expectantly, and Krylov threw her a rifle as well, raising an eyebrow in surprise. She caught his look and shrugged as she slid the bolt back and chambered around. Women don't shoot in your country, Commander? The oddity of Nancy's statement caught Krylov off guard, and he laughed involuntarily as he turned around and resumed his watch on the door. Try as he might, he couldn't stop himself from laughing, and was soon joined by Nancy, Leonard, and a few nearby crewmen who had heard what she said as well. The laughter spreading on the command deck in the midst of the battle was infectious, and Krylov soon found himself wiping tears from his eyes as he struggled to keep focused on the open door. When the last of the creatures assaulted the room, throwing themselves through the open door in a desperate attempt to kill the people inside, they were not met with fear, but with laughter, focusing the attention of each person with a laser-like precision. The attention was accompanied by a hailstorm of bullets that tore through metal and flesh alike, destroying the creature's attempt in a few short seconds. The juxtaposition of conflicting emotions sat strongly with Leonard in particular, who was the first one to stand up and make his way toward the creature's bodies, hobbling along on his crutch. Krylov stood up and joined Leonard, then Nancy, who took Leonard's arm and placed it on her shoulder. The three stood with the crew behind them, staring at the mangled bodies of the creatures on the floor as their laughter gradually died out. Krylov cleared his throat and turned to his crew, smiling grimly at them. I think that's the last of them. Get us a head count started, then get us moving again. Once we're clear of this damned canal, we'll surface and take stock of the damage. The crew moved slowly at first, stepping gingerly over the creatures strewn across the floor, until Krylov yelled, clearing the last of the happy mood from the air. Get your asses moving, now! Everyone, including Leonard and Nancy, jumped at Krylov's order, and the crew broke into sprints hurrying to their stations and down the hall to find missing crew and prepare to get the submarine moving again. Leonard held out his rifle to Krylov, who looked at it and shook his head, pushing it away. Keep it, Mr. McComb. You might need it again. Leonard and Nancy looked at each other and began moving toward a pair of vacant chairs. Krylov spoke again, raising his voice so that the crew left on the command deck could hear him. Excellent work, by the way. And not just you two, everyone. Now, let's get out of here, shall we? Chapter 5 12.42 p.m., April 25th, 2038 Andrei Lipov, Sergei Uzov Panama Canal, Main Lock Control Room If we get back to that ship, I'm never getting off again. Andre snorted at Sergei's comment as they watched the dark form of the Archangelisk move slowly forward through the open gates of the lock. The ship was submerged, but they could still see it as it passed through the water, clearing the lock gate and escaping the carnage that had surrounded it. After the unexpected destruction of the bridge, Andre and Sergei had watched it nervously as the lock filled with water, hoping that no critical systems had been damaged by the explosions. Though the process took several minutes to complete, it eventually finished, 
and the lock's water level was equalized with the river ahead of the ship. Andre and Sergei had heard of the complete redesign of the canal, like most of the world, though they had never seen it in person. Neither had they imagined that the process of operating the single lock system would be so easy, making the multiple locks used previously look complicated compared to the current process. Instead of refitting and reworking the existing locks, canal, and artificial lake, the new system actually involved a completely separate canal placed just a quarter of a mile from the old one. The twisting path of the old canal was discarded for a direct one, drawing a straight line through the land. Surprisingly, this was more cost-effective than attempting to enlarge and modernize the old canal, which is what most people had assumed would happen before the final engineering plans were made public. Automated in ways that the old canal was not, the new construction consisted of two massive locks, each capable of holding super tankers whose size dwarfed that of the Archongolisk. In between the locks was a canal wide enough for ten of the super tankers to fit side by side, a distance calculated to be both cost effective and most efficient, given a study of the current ocean traffic at the time and planning at least 75 years into the future. The two locks were closer to the center of the canal than the ends, and once a ship or group of ships entered one, the control room operator would activate the lock by simply pressing a single button. The lock would close, fill with water to equalize the height with that of the interior canal, then it would open, allowing the vessels inside to proceed through the canal. At the same time, the lock at the opposite end was closed and equalized as well, through a completely automatic process that required no operator assistance. Because of the timing of the opening and closing of the locks, vessels larger than individual or family-sized craft had to register their passage at least two hours in advance to be guaranteed a slot on the schedule. If, for some reason, a vessel encountered engine or other troubles while traversing the distance between the locks, there was enough room for it to remain for some time for repairs without it interfering with the passage of other ships. Though the project was initially seen by many as a vast waste of resources, the benefits it provided were recognized within the first three months of its service. Super tankers previously relegated to sailing around the southern tip of South America were able to pass through the canal for the first time, shaving weeks off of their travel schedules and enabling more goods to be transported across the world faster than was possible with the old canal. So, what now? Andre was looking down the ladder at the canal where they had come from, shaking his head. The only other exit from the control room was a winding staircase out the other side, which ended near a road leading to the bridge that, until a short time ago, had been swarming with creatures. Peeking out the door leading to the staircase, Andre could see that there were still creatures milling around the edge of the bridge, staring at their compatriots on the southern side of the canal who could no longer go north from their current location. Sergei stood and watched the creatures with Andre, his finger rubbing nervously on the trigger guard of his rifle. We wait them out. What other choice do we have? Andre's shoulders slumped, and he rested his head against the wall of the control room, sweat pouring down his face and neck. Then I guess we won't make it back, will we? The older of the two cousins, Sergei looked at Andre in pity, wishing that he could somehow save them. Going through their equipment inventory in his mind, his eyes started to dart back and forth as the seed of an idea began to blossom. He pulled his pack off of his back and knelt down in front of it, rifling through the contents until he found what he was looking for. Sergei pulled a set of three grenades out and held them up for Andre, who took them, holding them at arm's length. What are you thinking? Sergei ignored Andre's question and pulled out his radio tuning it to the frequency that the Archongolisk was listening on and depressed the microphone button. Archongolisk, this is Usov. Come in, Commander. A burst of static came back, and Sergei quickly turned the speaker volume down. Andre glanced down the staircase to see if the creatures had heard the noise, but if they did, they showed no signs of caring one way or the other. Archongolisk, come in! Sergei hissed trying to keep his voice low and the panic from rising in his throat. Respond, damn it! Another burst of static was cut off, replaced by the sound of a hand fumbling with a microphone before a voice came through. Krylov here. How the hell are you still alive, Usov? 
Sergei grinned and responded, his eyes locked with Andre's as he spoke. Commander, Lipov and myself both made it. We're stuck in the control room, but uh, we may have a way out. Do you have a way to get us back on board if we can make it to the second lock? Shit, Krylov thought quickly, estimating how much time it would take for them to reach the second lock and how much he could spare before they had to pass through it and place explosives on the third bridge. Doing so meant that they would have to open the second hatch to the deck of the submarine, assuming the port section wasn't flooded like the starboard, and that they didn't have any more unwelcome guests on board to contend with. Sheet, sheet, sheet! Krylov had the presence of mind to keep further repetitions of the word to himself as he juggled the logistics in his mind, finally coming to a decision. You have thirty minutes to get yourselves in the water past the second lock's far gates. After that, we have to get to the last bridge and then get the hell to open water to assess our damage. Andre and Sergei's faces both paled as they looked out the window of the control room, seeing the second lock far in the distance. Even without having to deal with the creatures, running from the first lock to the second would scarcely be possible, though as their only choice left, they had no other options. We'll be there. Who's off out? Chapter 6 12.59 p.m. April 25th, 2038 Andrei Lipov, Sergei Usov Keep your head down and go! Hurry! Sergei whispered at his younger cousin, urging Andrei to get down the stairwell as quickly as possible. After speaking with Commander Krylov on the Archangelisk, the pair had waited in the control room for a few moments, watching as the creatures below started to disperse. At the slow rate at which they were going, it was going to be hours before they were fully gone, though, and Sergei and Andre didn't have the luxury of waiting around for that length of time. Rifles at the ready, Andre and Sergei descended the stairs rapidly, cringing with each footstep that echoed off of the aluminum structure. The creatures on the ground still seemed uninterested in the pair, so they continued moving quickly until they reached a gate at the end of the stairs. Closed with a padlock and a loose chain, it was quickly opened with a pair of bolt cutters pulled from Sergei's pack, and Andre swung it open slowly, keeping his gun trained on a collection of creatures wandering north, away from them. The gate at the bottom of the stairs exited onto a narrow path next to the road that went over the bridge that used to extend over the canal. Separated from the road by a flimsy chain-link fence, there was nowhere... <laughs>
can see a pair of parallel lines extending out from the facility and banking to the left, stopping at a road. Okay, see this? It's an old service tunnel that starts on the next level down and runs to the street just outside. Taking the handheld from David, Rachel zoomed out and tapped on a small icon. David, this tunnel was decommissioned years ago. It says so right here. David shook his head as he took back the computer, broadening the zoom level and navigating to the area in the building where they were standing. I know it says that, but I have it on good source that the tunnel's not decommissioned. It was turned into some kind of evacuation route for a few of the top brass that like to come through here. If they were ever here and an attack occurred, it would be a fast way out. In fact, this tunnel was linked to a few others running under the city. So, theoretically, if we had a way to get past the security, we could get out of here completely underground, assuming we had a need to. For now, though, we just need to get down one floor and then find the door to the tunnel and get it open so we can get out of here. Rachel took back the handheld, staring in silence at Bertha's chamber that was centered on the screen. She was too exhausted with being underground and wanted nothing more than to make a run for the surface, but without a way to get Bertha through the collapsed areas, there was no point. Uh, how do you know the exit of this tunnel hasn't collapsed too? Marcus looked at the screen as he spoke, sensing this was Rachel's next inevitable question. David spoke patiently, explaining his reasoning with the attitude of someone who had spent a long time trying to devise the perfect method for getting out of the building even while he was still trapped in his office. There's no way to be sure, of course. There are no cameras in the tunnel and no official information on the type of reinforcement it had. However, if it was truly turned into an emergency escape route, as I believe, I have to think that it would have been sufficiently reinforced to stand up to a localized bombardment. There's still one problem. Rachel looked up from the screen, testing David's plan with one final query. How do you propose moving this thing down a flight of stairs and through an underground tunnel? We can't exactly do it by hand. David grinned sheepishly and motioned for Rachel and Marcus to follow him. A short walk down the corridor led to a large set of double doors that David swung open, revealing a supply closet. Inside the closet sat a massive dolly with large oversized rubber wheels and handles for both pushing and pulling whatever load was sitting on its large frame. Rachel slapped David's arm as she saw the contraption, grinning as she playfully tore into him for making them move Bertha out into the hall by hand. <laughs> you asshole! Why the hell didn't you tell us about this earlier? David shrugged and pointed at the wheels. Uh, no sense in risking Doe finding out we have a way to transport Bertha any sooner than necessary, especially since it wouldn't have fit into the room anyway. Rachel clapped her arms around David in a hug, elated by his revelation. Marcus grinned along with them, feeling no small sense of relief about the fact that they were one step closer to getting Bertha out of the complex. A nagging feeling in the back of his head warned him to use caution, though, since the strange woman was still around. She didn't seem to pose any threat to the group, but Marcus knew full well that situations in this new world were completely fluid, and anything that could happen likely would. Chapter 15 1057 AM, April 13th, 2038 Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims Despite Leonard's intense driving, he and Nancy were still several miles out from Bismarck when the storm clouds enveloped the sky above them, plunging the area into darkness. Switching the headlights on to illuminate their path, Leonard slowed the APC down, not wanting to collide with any of the cars that were growing more numerous as they got closer to the city. Being unable to see much of the city with the clouds overhead, Leonard and Nancy both decided that they needed to try for it anyway, hoping that there would be enough of it intact to salvage more supplies. Driving so slowly in the darkness, Leonard hoped that their pursuer had been thrown off their trail by the abrupt course correction, but only time would tell if this was true or not. Driving past freeway off-ramps, Leonard nearly missed the office buildings to either side of the road, slamming on the brakes to bring the APC to a halt just before they flew past the last exit into the city. He maneuvered the APC in a slow circle on the road, using its bright lights to examine the surroundings in hopes of finding any intact structures. After two complete circles, he stopped and pointed to the north. 
Well, looks like there's some destruction up there, but back to our left, it looks clear. I guess we should try for the south exit, eh? I guess so. Worst case, we'll just drive around till we find some places that weren't completely destroyed. I just hope there aren't any swarms of muties that are coming along with the storm. Leonard looked up at the lightning flashing overhead and quickly put the APC into motion, driving up a slight hill bordering the southern end of the highway. Nancy's reminder of the potential for there to be creatures moving under the cover of the storm spurred Leonard onward, and he soon had the APC moving down the tightly packed streets of the city. Unlike the relatively open atmosphere of the small Iowan town, the city had been densely populated and the buildings were teetering on the brink of collapse. The streets of the southern area of the city had been torn apart in the same circular patterns that Leonard and Nancy had come to expect, though their main problem turned out to be the sheer number of overturned vehicles blocking their path. Even with the APC's powerful engine helping to push them through, Leonard soon found that they were getting bogged down, with the armored vehicle threatening to become inexorably lodged amongst the debris. Backing up a few blocks, he and Nancy sat still, listening to the storm outside while they tried to decide what to do. Now well, it looks like it clears up just ahead, and we're getting into more commercial areas, so I'm sure we'll at least find some clothing stores. Maybe I should take the rifle and try to scavenge what I can on foot while you wait at the APC. Fat chance, Leonard! I'm not staying here unarmed, and you're not going off in the storm on your own. We stick together. End of discussion. Leonard sighed and put his head back on the seat, closing his eyes. Unless you have any better suggestions, I don't think we have much of a choice at this point. Someone's got to stay with the APC in case we need a quick getaway. And we don't have enough guns or bullets for both of us to defend ourselves against any creatures lurking around. Nancy refused to budge against Leonard's argument, and after a few minutes of back and forth, he relented. <sighs> Fine. Let's just get as close as we can, turn the APC around so we're pointed out of here, and see what we can scrounge up. But this is still a terrible idea, though. I hope you realize that. Nancy shrugged. I don't care. You're not going out there alone, and you're not leaving me here by myself. Ah, oh, fucking hell. Leonard pulled the APC around in a small parking lot and revved the engine, sending it flying backward along a street headlong into a stack of cars and building debris. Broken glass and bricks flew everywhere as the armored car plowed through the pile, getting closer to the section of the city that Leonard and Nancy wanted to explore. Before it became completely trapped, though, Leonard cut off the engine, ensuring that their vehicle would be as close to them as possible while they were away from it. Leonard hopped out of the driver's seat, followed by Nancy, though instead of closing the door all the way, he left it cracked a few inches for a faster ingress. Cradling the rifle in his arms, Leonard shivered involuntarily at the cold temperatures brought on both by their location and the storm ahead. It had been quite a while since they had stepped out of the car, and they had forgotten how much the heat inside had been buffering them from the worsening weather. Hurry! Nancy ran ahead of Leonard, taking the initiative, and he quickly followed, hoping that running and climbing through the collapsed buildings would heat his body enough so that he could hold the rifle without shaking. On the other side of a collapsed office building, Leonard and Nancy spotted their goal. Several blocks worth of stores were virtually untouched and contained every amenity offered in a large city. Clothing, food, sporting goods, and more were all before them, just a few moments from being in their grasp. Nancy was about to run down the opposite side of the debris pile when Leonard grabbed her shirt, forcing her into a small alcove and throwing her to the ground. He landed half on top of her and muffled her surprise shot with one hand while he held a finger to his mouth. Pointing at the direction they were about to go, Leonard slowly crawled to the side, letting Nancy raise her head to peek out. Ahead of them, starting at the bottom of the collapsed structure and extending as far as Nancy could see, was another swarm of creatures walking slowly through the city. At first, they only saw a few, but it quickly turned into a larger and larger group, soon numbering in the thousands. Showing no aggression to each other or to their surroundings, they moved at a walking pace, clearly in no hurry to pass through the city. Rolling back into cover, Nancy and Leonard leaned close, barely daring to whisper to each other for fear of alerting the creatures to their presence. 
What the hell are we supposed to do now? Leonard didn't answer, but crawled backward, looking in the direction of the APC to see if they could escape back to the vehicle. Unfortunately, they appeared to have arrived in the city at the worst possible moment, since there were similar numbers of creatures to the north. Leonard was grateful to see that they were leaving the APC alone, despite the fact that the door was open, but with their only shelter and sustenance fatally out of reach, he wasn't sure what they could do. Each passing moment seemed to bring the temperature down by a few more degrees, and Leonard began to wonder if their death would come not at the hands of the creatures, or Samuel, but from Mother Nature herself. Leonard nudged Nancy forward to go deeper into the rubble of the building, hoping that they could get out of the wind. Huddled together on the broken brick and concrete, Leonard and Nancy waited, listening to the shrieks of the wind and the footsteps of the thousands of creatures plodding by. Chapter 16, 1102 AM, April 13th, 2038. Rachel Walsh, Marcus Warden, David Landry. Standing in front of a massive reinforced steel door, Marcus leaned against Bertha, arching his back and groaning from the strain of moving the heavy device. Though it was just a move down one flight of stairs, doing so had required several hours worth of work to achieve, and they were all exhausted by the end of it. Normally, when heavy machinery had to be moved, a freight elevator was employed, but due to the lack of power in the building, there had been no way to reroute any of it to the elevator system. Thankfully, though, the dolly David brought to their attention was equipped to travel downstairs with its variable height wheel system that helped the trio get Bertha down without dropping it or hurting themselves too severely. With the device sitting in front of the tunnel doorway, the two most pressing questions were how to open the door and what to do with the strange woman still lying upstairs. Let's just leave her. She's clearly being sustained by the nanobots, and she might relay information back to Doe, so there's no point in bringing her along. Marcus and Rachel glanced at each other upon hearing David's proclamation, both of them unsure whether the other agreed with David or not. While that might be a valid point, David, if what you're saying is true, couldn't that leave us open to more danger if we leave her to her own devices? Rachel was careful to avoid agreeing or disagreeing with David, as she was still having doubts about the woman herself. Not waiting for David to answer, Marcus inserted himself into the conversation. Just so we're clear, we're talking about leaving a person here, alone, in the bowels of a collapsed building, just because we're scared of what the nanobots have done to her. Marcus, Rachel said, I'm surprised to hear you come to her defense, given your personal encounters with the muties. Marcus shook his head. No, she's not a mutie. She looks like one, but she hasn't been consumed by the nanobots. There's still a person in there, somewhere underneath the machines. Doesn't that count for anything? David looked at the computer in his pocket, shifting nervously from foot to foot. We really don't have a lot of time to stand here and argue. Let's not forget that we have to get Bertha to the coast as quickly as possible before the AI has an opportunity to learn that it needs to defend itself against us. We'll bring it to a vote. I say we leave the thing here. She's not human anymore, despite her lack of aggression. And she'll just be a liability to us. David looked at Rachel, his eyes lit by the pale glow of the EL light looped around her belt. Are you with me? Rachel hesitated in answering and glanced at Marcus again, who shook his head angrily. She looked at the ground and closed her eyes, preparing to speak when a noise behind her startled the three of them. Please, don't leave me. Rachel whirled around, instinctively bringing her rifle up, but lowering it immediately upon seeing that the voice belonged to the strange woman. She shuffled forward quietly, reaching her arms out to feel in front of her as she approached the group. Marcus felt Sam press in against his leg as the woman approached, the hairs on his neck raised, but still not growling. David tried to stutter a response, feeling mortified at being caught saying what he had, but before he could stammer out a complete sentence, Marcus stepped forward and took the woman's hand, watching as the blue glow of the nanobots retreated up her arm. Of course we're not going to leave you. Some of us are just frightened and unsure, but we won't leave you here. I promise. I guess that settles it then, 
Rachel stepped up next to Marcus and helped him guide the woman up close to the steel door, ignoring David's quiet grumbling from behind her. Just stay over here out of the way for a bit, please. We're trying to figure out how to get through this door. The woman cocked her head to the side and Marcus watched, fascinated. Her empty eye sockets traced the outline of the doorway exactly, and though Marcus knew she was blind, he couldn't help but wonder if she had some type of new sense gifted to her by the nanobots that had taken over her body. After a moment of looking over the door, the woman turned back toward Marcus and spoke. There appears to be a weakness on the right-hand side of this barrier, approximately four feet up from the ground and six inches out from it. A directed energy pulse of the correct frequency would exploit this weakness, most likely resulting in the removal of the barrier. Marcus, Rachel, David, and Sam all stepped back as the woman strode to the location that she spoke of, placing her hand on a small access panel next to the door. The panel was dark, devoid of the electricity needed to make it operate, until the woman's hand connected with it. A burst of white energy arced through the panel, quickly followed by the loud clanks of massive bolts being retracted into the door. Stepping back from the panel, the woman grasped the door and pulled on it, effortlessly swinging it open to reveal a dark tunnel beyond. While there was no need for words to express the astonishment on all their faces, Marcus couldn't help himself. Holy shit! How did you do that? The determined expression on the woman's face melted away upon hearing Marcus's query. How did I do what? Rachel took the woman by the arm and guided her back near the dolly holding Bertha. Never mind. It's fine. Just rest. Everything will be all right. Shaking her head in awe, Rachel whispered to David, concerned again about the possible implications of bringing the woman with them. You're still scanning for transmissions, right? David nodded, patting the handheld computer in his pocket as he whispered in response. And the second this thing picks up on anything, it'll alert us. For the record, though, I still think it's a terrible idea to take her with us. The instant she looks like she's a danger, we'll put her down. Rachel looked at Marcus and David, who both nodded in agreement. For now, though, we keep her with us and take care of her. Not just because she's an asset, but because as far as I'm concerned, she's still at least part human. Chapter 17 3 p.m., April 13th, 2038 Leonard McComb, Nancy Sims Shivering and aching, Leonard and Nancy struggled to stay awake. They had crawled as far into a narrow cranny in the collapsed building as they felt safe doing, and were lying on their sides, huddled together to try and keep as warm as possible. It was a losing battle, though, as the cold bricks and occasional crosswinds leached away heat through their thin clothing. Every fifteen minutes, like clockwork, Leonard crawled out into the open and peeked down at the streets below them, hoping each time that he would see nothing but emptiness again. Instead, all he saw were the endless forms of the creatures still making their way through the city. The behavior of the creatures was curious to Leonard. Instead of searching through buildings and rubble as he would have expected them to do, they acted like they were out for a stroll instead. They paid no attention to their surroundings except to clamber over obstacles, and they hadn't touched the APC, which Leonard could still see, just barely, thanks to the tiny bit of light filtering down through the clouds. Bright bursts of lightning provided most of the illumination, and Leonard had almost gotten used to it after enduring hours of the storm. Protected as they were, Leonard didn't expect that they would be struck by lightning or found by the creatures, but those were not Leonard and Nancy's primary enemies at the moment. With the winds as strong as they were and the lack of sunlight, Leonard estimated that the temperature was in the low 50s, with the wind chill taking off several degrees more. While he and Nancy had the advantage of pooling their limited warmth and were relatively well protected from the wind, if they didn't get moving soon, hypothermia could set in. Without so much as a piece of cardboard to insulate them against the cold of the collapsed building, Leonard fretted over their situation, hoping that the creatures would soon be done with their seemingly endless march. Leonard crawled back next to Nancy and shook his head, seeing the disappointment in her eyes. She sighed and muttered under her breath, barely loud enough for Leonard to hear. At least if Samuel is still around, he's probably freezing out here too. 
Oh, there's no way that asshole could get through this city with all the muties around, even if he wanted to. Leonard snorted, amused by Nancy's morbidly humorous outlook. On more than one occasion, he had considered making a run for the APC, thinking that if they could just get inside, they would be able to wait out the creatures in warmth and safety. Each time he had checked on the situation below, though, he was discouraged from even making an attempt on the APC by the quantity of creatures flooding the streets. Even at the village he hadn't seen so many creatures, and to see thousands of them all traveling together was enough to make him frightfully nervous. Clasping his hands together, Leonard started to put his head down on them to rest for a few moments when loud snarls from the street below caught his attention. The creatures hadn't made any aggressive movements or sounds so far, and he began to worry that he and Nancy had somehow been discovered. Crawling back to the edge of the alcove, Leonard peeked down the street and watched as several creatures broke from their slow walk and started to run. Thankfully, they weren't running toward the building, but away from it, focused on something in the distance. Leonard wasn't sure what they were chasing and initially thought it might be another survivor, but a few moments after hearing the first snarl, he realized what they were pursuing. Through the noise of thunder and heavy footsteps from the creatures, an engine noise suddenly drew closer. In a flash of lightning, Leonard saw a strange vehicle tear past the street, weaving in and out between the creatures and rubble. The driver was rain-soaked, and Leonard strained to get a look at him, but his vehicle vanished behind a building seconds after it had appeared. In the brief time that the vehicle was visible, Leonard saw that it was designed in a way that made it easier to drive through the crowded streets than the APC, but it still had to travel relatively slowly, especially in the dark conditions. Several creatures were pursuing the vehicle, not close enough that they were at risk of catching it, but close enough that the man had to maintain his speed or risk being overtaken. As Leonard continued to watch the creatures, he noticed that while there were many pursuing the vehicle, not enough were doing so to offer a clear path for him and Nancy to get back to the APC. Even though Leonard was certain he could take out the few that were currently blocking the path, the hundreds of other creatures within earshot would surely descend upon them faster than they could get into the vehicle. Nancy slowly crawled out next to Leonard and watched the running creatures, curious about the engine noise. What's going on? Leonard pointed in the direction the vehicle had disappeared in. Speak of the devil. Looks like our little friend managed to find his way here. He's being chased, though, so I don't think he'll give us any trouble. Rubbing her arms, Nancy looked around at the wave of creatures still marching along, discouraged by how long it had been since they had first appeared. Unless he finds a place to hide, like us, and waits the creatures out. That possibility hadn't occurred to Leonard, but he supposed that it could happen. Well then, I guess we'll just have to get our supplies and be gone before he comes out. Pointing east, in the direction that both the creatures and the man had headed, Leonard continued. We'll be out of the thick of these things first, though, since they're moving west to east. I think we'll be able to get a few things and then get out of here before he comes back. Nancy nodded slowly and crawled back into the alcove to take shelter from a sudden gust of wind. I'm so sick of being in these cities. Every time we go through one, it seems like we end up worse off than we would have been if we had just skipped the damned thing. Leonard sighed in agreement, exasperated with the constant challenges brought on by the cities they had visited. If we can get some coats, hats and gloves, and maybe a few more guns, we can just skip any future cities and head straight for Alaska. No more stops. What about refueling? Leonard crawled back next to Nancy keeping his head tilted to listen for the silence he hoped would arrive soon when the last creature walked past them down below. Well, I've been refueling in the cities just because we've been stopping there, but every semi that we pass is a potential fuel source. We've been seeing those all the time, so, you know, we should be good as long as we can keep finding them. Thinking ahead, Leonard didn't know what they would do once they crossed the border and started getting into the more isolated areas where other vehicles including tractor trailers, would become much rarer. The APC was built for long journeys and had a large fuel capacity, but not knowing the exact distance they'd have to travel, Leonard wasn't sure what they would do about that particular problem. Chapter 18 Somewhere in South Dakota 
Standing at a crossroads, the man scans the horizon for the sixth time, using a pair of binoculars to look from north to south as he tries to decide where the intruders would have gone. Traveling west as they were, he knows that they will eventually have to cross the Missouri River. The problem, though, is that there are so many crossings, he is unsure which one they would head to. Reaching into his pocket, he picks up a dented piece of lead, the remnant of the bullet that impacted on the APC, falling to the road in the shape of a pancake. The man sneers, wishing that he had used the armor-piercing rounds that he brought with him, but he pushes the negative thought from his mind. The Lord works in mysterious ways, he thinks. Settling on that is the reason why he has not yet stopped the intruders. The man walks to the south along the crossroads several hundred feet, looking at the ground as he goes. Finding nothing, he circles to the west and walks back to his vehicle, searching for any signs that a vehicle passed through the area. Finding nothing, he grows impatient and hurries to the north, quickly scanning back and forth along the ground for any signs of the intruders. What's this? The man bends down and looks at the road. A small patch of rubber is lying in the road, just a few dozen feet after a large pile of cars. Stepping back, the man envisions what happened. In a hurry to escape his vengeance, the intruders went off-road, forced to take their military vehicle into the grass before steering it back onto the highway. In their haste, they lost traction, and their tire slipped on the roadway, leaving the small patch of rubber in its wake. The man hurries into the grass at the side of the road and crouches down, peeling back the blades. Hidden under the taller, more springy grass lay patches of bruised and broken blades, along with patches of dirt thrown up by the armored vehicle's knobby tires. The man has seen enough, and he hurries back to his vehicle, starts the engine, and then races to the north along the highway. There's only one place they might be headed that has enough supplies to outfit them for wherever they're traveling. The man has a long drive ahead of him, but he is still in familiar country. Using a compass, he cuts through large swaths of land, leaving highways far behind, and joining up with new ones as he works to shave off as much time as possible. The man glances to the west, seeing a black cloud rolling across the horizon. Another test. Already? Have I not endured enough? No answer comes to the man. Hours later, in the afternoon, the man arrives at the city where he is certain he will find the intruders. For the first time since setting off from the village, though, he is not concerned solely with the intruders. Black clouds float overhead, with lightning chaining amongst them, setting off great thunderclaps that distract him from the road. Worse yet, the man sees another horde of demons, seemingly endless as they pour from the city, walking on an inexorable march to the east. The man feels fear grip his heart, but he fights against it, forcing it down as he drives through the army of creatures, swerving around them to try and find the intruders. Several times along the way to the city, he stopped, examining fresh evidence of the intruder's vehicle, confident that he was on the trail. Here in the city, though, surrounded by the demon cohorts of the intruders, the man isn't sure how he can track them down. The demons snap.